Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second Safaricom, the second day of the Safaricom Engineering Summit. My name is Mariam Bishar. I am your host, and I am so, so glad to have you with me. In case you were here yesterday, asante sana for coming back. It means we were a good time. If you're here for the first time, yesterday was an absolute ball. We had hackathons. We talked about the developer ecosystem in Africa. We figured out how to monetize tech skills. And today, our focus is all about how we can design software that is better for the customer that solves the customer facing problems that's what we're all about today but before we get anywhere virtual housekeeping rules guys use our hashtag safaricom decode on social media if you're watching on facebook youtube linkedin wherever use the hashtag safaricom decode when you want to get in touch with us drop me an emoji let me know how you're feeling let me know your expectations for the day and if you have any questions for whoever is on stage please do leave them in the comment section we'll find a way to get them to those who are on stage and hopefully have them answered answered for you. I want to thank you again for making the time to join us. This has been made possible, of course, by Safaricom and by our many sponsors who we are super grateful for. And we'll get to the action in just a minute. But I also have a game I want to play with you. I know some people were feeling a bit of FOMO yesterday because every guest that I had, I played a little fun interactive game with them. And I want to make it worth your while. I have airtime to give you all through the day. But if you want 500 bob at the end of the day, all you have to do is stick with me throughout the entire day. It's as simple as this. I'm going to play a game called Passport Stamp with you guys, okay? Like you're collecting passport stamps. If you're a traveler or you want to be a traveler, I know this one is for you. So during every section, whenever you see me on this camera, I'll give you one stamp, okay? And the stamp for the first section is the name Nikola Tesla. Google, but just remember that name, remember that name, Nikola Tesla, that's your very first stamp. And at the end of the day, I'll see who has collected stamps from every single time I came to talk to you. So that's your first stamp. If you collect all of them, I will give you 500 bob worth of airtime. That easy. I've also got more money to give during trivia games and also some fun activities to engage in. I've got great people I want to talk to, have fireside chats with, maybe go in the 360 booth and see how we look dancing or pretend to dance so please do keep us engaged let me know how you're feeling this morning I will begin the day by setting expectations for myself and for you and I've got Angela who is a self-learning um, student of the in the world of tech and I want to get to know what does she expect of the day what does she want what does she need from this summit who is she hoping to see uh, is there only anyone she's not hoping to see I don't know that's a little bit controversial but allow me to welcome Angela before we go on to the main stage hi Angie I'm okay. Is it cool if I call you Angie? Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, let me ask, what are, your, you know, what are your expectations? I know you were online yesterday and you were with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, please turn on the mic so we can hear you properly. So what are your expectations for today and how was yesterday for you as a whole? Yesterday was very, very, very informative for me. I absolutely learned a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it was also very interesting to see all the different um, people who have come up with so many brilliant things online. Um, today, I'm looking forward to networking. That's one of the main reasons I am here. I'm also looking forward to learning and having a good time. Yeah. Tell me why you decided to go the software engineering route and how that works when um, you choose to learn it yourself. 
Um, well, current, actually, I started out um, doing an undergraduate in marketing, mm -hmm. and then I decided to break into tech, because not really everyone, but it's, it is a very interesting thing, yeah. um, and I'm trying to break into tech. So I decided, why don't I try, first of all, doing the self-learning way? Mm -hmm. um, and then once I get a hang of it, if it's something that I'm completely interested in, then yeah. I can you know, invest in the money to actually go to university. Yeah. yeah, it's so interesting. I know you were online yesterday, so maybe you saw um, Samuel Kamotru who said, what we're lacking here, is enough talent to fill all the opportunities that are in the tech space so I think you've definitely positioned yourself right um, just very quickly let me know if there's anyone you'd want to see in there you said networking is there a specific person um, I'm hoping to see a lot of guys from Amazon because um, the guy from Amazon what is his name S Sella mm -hmm. I think that was his yes, name Wycliffe, yes yeah. yes Sella um, I'm hoping to meet with him interact with him um, from the presentation that he gave on cloud, it was brilliant mind. I would love to actually meet him in person and have a one-on-one yeah. you know, -on -one with him. I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to hand over to the guys inside so that our audience at home can also get a taste of what is happening in there. Like I said, we have a fun day filled with activities. We've got hackathons. We've got giveaways. We've got speakers that you want to listen to from all over the IT world. Um, some of the names that Angela wants to see. And of course, the, the people that you're curious at home. So I'll now hand over to our main host, Mbogo here to take us into the main event. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, hello. It's great to see everyone here today this morning. I should even say TGIF, right? You know, always looking forward to that Friday. For those who don't know me, my name is Mbogwan Jehia, um, Mbogwan Jehia on Twitter, Mbogwan Jehia on LinkedIn, and along with Mariam, who's outside and also facilitating with a, with a virtual audience, we will be your facilitators for day two of the Safaricom Engineering Summit. Day one was, was fabulous, day one was amazing, we had lots of great talks and keynotes. For me, some of the highlights were the live demos, where we got to see how some of the Safaricom teams within the engineering um, department get to do their thing, right? And seeing the sort of depth in which they go to to make sure that uh, services and solutions are, um, are, made, are made available for millions of, um, of, of consumers. We had insightful uh, challenges from, um, from, from Michael who said we should stop looking at Nairobi as the nucleus of innovation or anything, anything tech. That there's stuff happening across the counties and we need to be very intentful and very um, intentional about looking outside of maybe our, 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 our common towns to find innovation at its, um, at its nascent stages and, and, and surfacing that up. Just a bit of housekeeping, um, if you need to go to the bathroom, on your right, I see the signs are not lit up yet, but on your, on your right, um, go right outside the door, you'll see the signage for the, for the bathrooms, and in case of any emergency, the exits are to either, um, to, to, to either side. We are streaming live on Safaricom's official uh, handles, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and Facebook, and we're using the hashtag Safaricom Decode. I'd like to acknowledge some, some sponsors in the room. I see Alice Munio, director of Director Africa Miradi at Mozilla Foundation, Mozilla Corporation, and Celebwa Wycliffe, country lead um, Adele, and again, a host of other Safaricom C-level execs that we'll get to meet um, th throughout the day. Acknowledging also the online audience, yesterday, we had over 1,500 virtual attendees. If you combine that with the over 250 who attended physically, you could imagine the size of the live event if everyone, everyone made it. So kindly, um, if you're online, remember, even in this room, continue to engage on, um, um, on the hashtag Safaricom Decode and ask your questions there. We'll be picking uh, questions at random and, of course, incentivizing guys who, 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 engages, uh, who engages a lot more. I'd like to get us right into the first session. And the gentleman about to come to stage needs no introduction. I'm fortunate enough to call him a friend and a mentor. Uh, I actually call him Walimu. Dr. Bitangen Demo. Balozi now, ambassador, Kenyan ambassador to Belgium, needs no introduction, and I'd like to welcome him on stage to actually walk us through his, his thoughts on the impact of blockchain on economic growth. Mwalimu Balozi, Karibu, stage is yours.
The journey for what we are doing here today started some time back in 2006. By 2009, we had started to meet at a small place called IHUB to discuss how we can foster innovation. And the discussion then centered around how do we get government data to create the apps? How do we solve um, these kinds of problems in agriculture, in health? And uh, it was very difficult, but that culminated into pushing the government to release most of its data. We created Kenya Open Data, which was very easy now for developers to access and uh, create new applications. But what has characterized that period between then <clears throat> and now is that people did not uh, learn how to collaborate. So individuals would come, develop an app. Uh, one of the persons who have suffered most is me, uh, because many of them come to me and say, can you look at my app? What is it? What, how can I improve this and that? But uh, even with that kind of development, we have learned so much. We have learned, for example, that technology uh, can enable or can reduce inequality. If you see what mobile money has done, we have reduced inequality because we have many applications around the fintechs. We now understand that technology can impact agricultural productivity, but we have not uh, intensified uh, use of especially emerging technologies to create more good out of agriculture. We have seen what technology is doing in the health sector. We are also seeing what technology has done with respect to the education, democratizing it, and we are seeing more uh, being done by you young people developing applications in virtually every aspect of the economy. Now we need to begin to think differently. And I'm very happy that Safaricom has taken the leadership um, with Mozilla to bring new solutions going forward. Because in the area of agriculture, <clears throat> if I can say what Mboa was saying, that we need to dive deep and understand what blockchain is going to help us <clears throat> going forward. Um, some of you understand that uh, blockchain solutions are helping us to streamline the supply chain. We now begin to understand the value chain in our agricultural sector, but still we have a lot of problems that we need to intensify use of this technology that takes us to what we call Web 3.0. And this is the area that we need <clears throat> greater collaborations to develop bigger solutions that would solve big problems that we have in Africa. I always say that God is very great to Africa because he has given us many problems and the big problems that when you solve any of these big problems, you create a major solution and a major enterprise. And that entrepreneurship or enterprises emanate from problems when you solve them. Now that we can be able to use technology and self solve that, we must begin to see some of you getting into the space of AI, especially in the area of agriculture, so that we can be able to tell the farmers precisely uh, what fertilizer they need to use, what is the soil and alkalinity, all kinds of things, information that would lead to greater productivity in the agricultural sector. This is where we need to play now uh, because food has become a major problem, a major problem globally. This year alone, we may not afford a chapati for Christmas. Why? Because of the crisis in the Ukraine and Russia, 
which supplies Africa almost 80% of the wheat production. And most of you consume wheat. So we must begin to play in that space so that Africa could be feeding the entire world simply because Africa has 60% of the global uh, Arab land. We have that opportunity, we have the land, we have the brains like you. We need now to develop solutions, create supply chains that are more sustainable, leveraging emerging technologies and becoming, taking Africa from where we are to a new space for Africa. Um, we need more companies like Safaricom to begin to invest in this space because we are able to create what is called the demographic dividend. We have younger people than any other continent. We have, these younger people have got great education. We must exploit that and create a demographic dividend not only to serve Africa, but to serve the entire world. Actually, you have begun to see many of, the, of our young people not just working here, but working outside of Africa. That is how we can change. There are also emerging opportunities which would get into the solutions that you build, especially in building Africa's supply chains. Um, some of you know that DRC Congo joined East African community. We need to understand the implication of that and begin also to develop our own Silk Road across the continent of Africa. This is the time that we have the opportunity to open up Africa across Africa, something that has never been done, and perhaps our leaders in the EAC would see it fit to create infrastructure which would go from Mombasa to Point Noi in the Atlantic coast. That would change the mathematics. It would change the supplies from West Africa. For example, uh, some of you know, we have a nascent uh, chocolate industry developing here, but we have to fly uh, the materials from Ivory Coast to Kenya. And that would change the whole mathematics. Who would provide those solutions? Those of us who are seated here or those who are listening um, to see the future of Africa change and also create greater prosperity for Africa. There are other efforts that we are making. For example, we've been discussing with many uh, groups, uh, many universities. In fact, yesterday I was talking to my vice chancellor that there are some courses that we must introduce so that we build capacity among the young people uh, here. Um, MasterCard has been kind to give us resources to create greater capacity. And you are going to see from September that many of you would get the opportunity to undertake data science and artificial intelligence at graduate level and paid for by this organization in partnership with companies like Safaricom. We must develop that capacity because that's how we can change Africa. The area of data science, which also links, you know, the, the matching tech from IoT to blockchain to data analytics, they are all uh, related, even AI. Uh, it's actually an advanced data analytics I think you begin to see some adverts asking some of you to begin to undertake those courses. But the reason why I'm speaking here today is that we must change. We must change from what we've been doing before. This is a new phase beginning. I think my friend uh, Mbogwa will tell you that we are going to 2.0 Kenya um, Kenya ICT development or apps development. This 2.0 means we must collaborate and stop this minimalism of working alone at home and develop, to develop an app and think you can become 
uh, Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg worked with multiple people to create. I was fortunate to visit when Facebook was so small at Stanford. Uh, the, it was an army that was developing Facebook. I have not seen that kind of collaboration. That collaboration only works if we begin to trust one another. Um, if we cannot trust one another, there is no way we can develop uh, big applications or bigger solutions like I've talked about Facebook. And that is my prayer today. Um, because I was not told how long to speak, is it one hour or two hours? Or I can end my speech here with a prayer that we live here beginning to trust one another to build bigger solutions um, that will solve Africa problems going forward. So thank you so much for listening to me. Asante Molimu, yeah. if, you could, if you could just stay on stage. I think, um, I, I like the fact that you said technology reduces inequalities. And you know we are at the Safaricom Engineering Summit. Yes. And one of the biggest pain points uh, in the rec recent past has been people who are in remote, in remote work, especially software engineers and software developers. Uh, you work for a company out in San Francisco, India, UK, and they pay you. And how do they normally pay you? Via? Um, I... Via a platform that starts with P. Yeah. And what's been happening recently is that, you know, someone says, I just got paid. Um, it's a few thousand dollars, but then the money's frozen. frozen yeah. I think because you're looking at, at the era of, you know, how, how blockchain can impact the, the economy, mm -hmm. I think there's almost a straight line there to say, how can we then develop our own solutions based off the blockchain that can allow our thousands of brilliant software engineers, not only from Kenya, but from across Africa, to actually right. then be able to kukula mm -hmm. as opposed to getting paid na inembe imefanya nini, imekwama. You know, imekwama, yeah. here, if, you're, if your impressor doesn't go through or something's wrong, you can walk to a Safaricom shop and get sorted. But when it's a platform that is out there, you're almost left in the dark because who do you call? Nana kona number of fees ya... Ya ile ngini. Ya ile ngini. Do they have a contact person here? Nothing. They don't. So I think that, that is one of the things I picked from your, uh, from, from, from your talk. Thank you. But maybe a direct question is, you're on the blockchain task force. And you know, that one is looking at the policy issues. We know, we know people confuse blockchain for crypto, like they, mm -hmm. they say equals. And mm -hmm. it's not the same thing. Yeah. But as your task force deals with the, with the policy issues, what other cogs can be turning? You mentioned one, education, and said you're speaking to the VCs, saying that lazima, lazima tufunze vijana now, whether it is the uh, data science, AI, mm -hmm. uh, solidity to do the, the smart contracts. What other wheels can be turning in, um, in, in, within this space? Actually, I mentioned uh, a little bit and said that um, uh, if you begin to talk about Web 1.0, Web 2.0, Web 3.0, Web 2.0 was mostly uh, interactive. A few companies amassed our data. They are using that data to make a lot of money. And now people are fighting back and saying, we must stop this. And that is moving to uh, the blockchain era where um, we can have... Um, those who need our data to talk to us and uh, even include us in, in terms of us being beneficiaries of, of our data. We must understand those dynamics such that we don't have a few companies out there controlling that and enabling us to interact with this bigger company. Of course, um, these giant companies that have amassed data from us are fighting back because that is their revenue model. Mm -hmm. But going forward, it's going to change because um, of the distributed ledgers. Would we have our own ledgers for our own Africa here? And we are saying, talk to us first. Yes. What, is, what is going to happen? We must begin to think on how we move to this space and what we need to do. And it's blockchain. The solution is going to be around uh, blockchain. Um, of course, we must begin also to educate government. The regulators must be enabling because what is happening is that it is inevitable that we are going to have the central 
the central bank digital currencies, uh, meaning that we must begin, at least Kenya, we are lucky that we have had digital because currencies and yes. software shifting into that space. Uh, take the government initiatives very seriously around digital literacy, because if we do that and go ahead, we'll probably be helping the entire Africa, because everybody, even those in the US, those in other countries, they come to Kenya to look at what are the experiences we have had with widespread digital, um, digital payments. Fantastic. So there is a space that we need to lead and begin to provide the leadership. Excellent. And, um, and also picking from one of the things that um, Balozi said about us developing in our own silos, yeah. I think one of the things we have is what I call creative capital. I'll come and call um, Mualimu here and say, I have this idea. I cannot compensate you for it now. Like you're saying, how was Facebook built? It's people came and sat and said, I have this brilliant thing. Let's come together and build it out and create that, um, you know, that unified value. So I'd like to call on stage before uh, Balozi leaves, John Jogona to appreciate uh, Balozi. And I think... Thank you. Uh, you know, when I meet Prof, there are so many hats he wears. Uh, <laughs> professor sits on our board, and I think I've had the honor of, of interacting with him. And I can tell you it's very challenging when you have someone as smart as this in tech. I've worked in other companies where on the board there was no tech person, and you would wow the board. But it's very difficult to wow the board of Safaricom uh, with Prof. So thank you so much for the challenges, the opportunities. As you go overseas, uh, we are gifting you with a nice, let me get it out of here, Safaricom Decode hoodie. Oh. We believe you are, you are our Safaricom Software Engineering Community Ambassador. Thank so you. So as you go to Europe yeah. and the home of the EU, yeah. wear this proudly and as you represent our engineering community. Thank you. As well as some other gifts. Asante yes, sana. Just this one or this? There is more things in here. Okay. <laughs> this is the one I wanted to showcase. <laughs> I know it gets a bit cold out there. Yeah. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, Balozi, you can take your seat. Thank and George, you. I guess you could just go straight there because um, you're, you're coming up next with your, with your live demo. I think one of the, some, some of the challenges that um, we can actually, not challenges, opportunities, now that I think of, when looking at the position of Safaricom and now that you're talking about blockchain. Yeah. You know, one of the things you guys have been doing is, um, of course, getting us to make sure that, you know, now my, my, if, I, if I didn't have my ID on your database, mm. that I now have it yeah. because of, of course, the regulations. Yeah. But I'm thinking about it, when you're looking at smart identity and the ability for me to port my identity, mm. I actually don't think, no, the person who knows more about me than anyone else is who. It's probably the telco. Yeah. So imagine a situation where now, as you are exploring with um, you know, the Safaricom engineering community, yeah. or the software community at large, is to see how maybe Safaricom could be a pioneer in that and say, look, we're actually using blockchain in Bogo. I'm giving you the ability to move with your identity and use it to verify many other services that may be a cost that uh, is much uh, Actually, that's interesting. I don't know if Liz and Tim will talk about it. Okay. Uh, the, the engineering community at Safaricom has built a digital identity. So okay. we are fast doing it because we have customers who are in consumer, enterprise, and financial services. And most people use their phone number as the unique identifier. Correct. But you know, like when you use your email address, you're able to log in onto, uh, use your Google or Facebook to log into Instagram. Correct. And all that. So we want the Safaricom digital identity to be used to log in fast on any Safaricom products. But I like your challenge. And I'll be talking to Liz, can we start collaborating with local devs? Correct. Because guys always want to use, because you're right, we have the phone number, we have the name, we have the ID. Why, why go through the pain of integrating to IPRS to, all, to ask Safaricom is this Mbogwa's number? Yeah. Let's give you the local dev, the API for digital identity, and then we just run that. And then layer that, put that on a blockchain. Fantastic. And then it becomes super secure. Yeah. I think another one before you take the stage with your live demo, yeah. I think one of the other pain points I've realized is with, um, with SMEs, we end up building solutions to address issues that shouldn't be there. And let me use the case of the supply chain that Daktaria talk, had, had spoken about. Um, you, you either do something for government, right? 
and you're on the, you, you supplied, you participated in the tender, and then it's time to get paid. Mm. Especially where SMEs are aggregated. Mm. The aggregator, Sazgina na lipua, but anakupatia stories at pesa ijaingia. I see an opportunity for smart financial services to be built, smart contracts. Yes. That as soon as I have delivered this speaker mm. to Sari Center, can the network then say, we need to verify, we need mm. someone to verify that this thing has actually been delivered. And independent people, someone mm. just gets it and they say, it's like gig work. Mm. I come and verify that it's invoice number this, invoice number this. And as soon as, say, three, five people verify, pesa inafanya nini? Pesa inatoka. Because some of the financing solutions that we end up building or, or the, the financial institutions end up fronting are actually mitigating a situation that should never have existed. Yes. So now this is what excites me about the yeah. potential for blockchain when looking at, at economic development. Food for thought for everyone. George, stage is yours. Thank you. So I, 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 I do work with a team of devs. I know a lot of conversation has been generated on whether we will have a live demo. I can assure you there will be a live demo. So in Safaricom, you heard yesterday the introduction of the various. Uh, please come on stage, guys. Are we doing it off stage or on stage? On stage, please come. So uh, we talked about the different communities, and I also had to register. And the community I registered in is cloud computing. So inevitably, we'll be doing a demo uh, from the cloud computing uh, community on how we actually deploy code onto cloud, uh, EC2 on AWS, which is uh, who are one of our sponsors. So AWS team will get to showcase a bit of your technology. Uh, but we do work with, with other cloud, cloud partners. But before that, uh, I'll have the team just talk a bit. Uh, they'll do the presentation. And then I just get to do the demo. In most other times, I usually do the presentation, then the devs do the demo. So we have a bit of reverse roles. I know Celebwa, you are waiting to take a picture when my code fails. But I can guarantee you yesterday, uh, we debugged and the biggest issue only we had was braces, which I accidentally commented and the code kept crashing. But today I trust <laughs> everything is well. All right, over to you, over to you. introduce yourselves, what you do. And then just, we only have two slides, then we go to the demo. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Noah Macau. I'm a DevSecOps engineer with Safaricom. And uh, with me is... Uh... Morning, everyone. My name is Rono Kipkoech. I'm the technical product owner for Cloud Enablement Team at Safaricom. Yeah. Okay, so today with uh, George, we are going to show you how we do automated deployment of uh, resources into AWS. Uh, with this, we are using uh, infrastructure as code. So basically, we are moving everything from uh, the console, the click ops, the traditional click ops that we used to have, whereby log into AWS, click in here and there, and then be able to build your resources. Uh, the thing with it, uh, just go to the next slide. Uh, down? Yes, yeah. So basically, infrastructure as code is uh, getting more popularity in the essence that it is easy to implement and it builds a clean infrastructure, which is uh, with the uh, declarative programming. Uh, with this, it means that uh, anything that we build is uh, also reusable. The code that we write is reusable. Anybody can still pick it up, put on their values, and then be able to use it. Uh, for us, we chose to go with uh, Terraform. Uh, Terraform being a tool that is uh, open source uh, to start with and uh, very, a tool that is also cloud agonistic. Uh, this means that uh, we can use it to create our resources on cloud and also on-prem. So it makes it easy for us to be able to uh, manage both on-prem and on-cloud resources. Uh, it also automates, it's an automated uh, infrastructure management tool. Uh, helps us also uh, manage our environments using the Terraform workspace. So that means I can have the same, uh, the same code and uh, deploy it on our dev environment and still change the values and deploy it on the production environment. So that means whatever I have on the dev environment and whatever I have on the production are all the same. Uh, it also helps us with the, with the use of uh, HashiCorp Vault, uh, helps us with secret management, and then reduces the development cost for us. Because now that means uh, having the time around, uh, the time taken for us to build the resources, 
uh, during, using the reusable cord becomes shorter and also we minimize any errors that we are getting there. So Rono will take us through the next slide where we see the flow on how we do it. Okay, thank you. No. So I'll just take you through a sample of actually how we implement our pipelines in Safaricom and especially how we do the now the Terraform pipelines. So for infrastructure as code, if you'll see the pipeline, it's similar to what we have as also our development pipelines. So we are thinking it around where we have uniformity across everything. And for all our pipelines, we actually ensure that all <coughs> checks and compliance are actually confirmed right for or are validated right on the pipelines. So for the pipeline, we start with our codes. That is our scripts, which we write with our IDs. Can be VS code or any that you prefer. That is sublime text or anything. And then now we push it to our Git repository. Here at Safaricom, we have GitLab as our <coughs> main Git repository, where we have our enterprise GitLab version, which we host on AWS also. After that, we go to Jenkins. Jenkins is our primary CI tool, which we use for both our applications, application pipelines, and also we use for now infra pipelines. Then now uh, we run the Jenkins, <coughs> the Terraform commands, which is now for the initialization. We validate, we plan, we apply, and in need, we can also do destroy. For Chekhov, that is for the security scan. We also have infra cost to check on the cost that will actually be, we will have on production. Then after that, we just provision the infra on any, which could be now AWS or if it's on VMware, we can actually do it also on premise. Yeah. I'd invite you now, George. Good. I think yesterday when uh, Komuchu was on stage, uh, a lot of people were very excited because uh, they were saying finally uh, somebody is coding in a dev summit. So I think when we looked at the program this morning, we said between prof and the next speaker, we'll make sure that uh, we follow. So Kamuchu, you are still teaching us. And uh, in the usual agile format, uh, we did learn and brought a bit of coding. Uh, so the code's on HCL. It's already been done. I think I'll just be executing the Git commands. Uh, the positive thing, as, as I was talking yesterday, I think somewhere around uh, line 118 is where we ended up having a problem. 116, 116, 118. <laughs> uh, but everything's good. We've just uh, tried to, I see Mark at the back. Uh, Mark, we've not compromised your subnets. Uh, we created it all afresh, but I can't show uh, the entire uh, piece of code. So I think we'll just... So essentially what we're doing here is, is creating an EC2 environment uh, on AWS, uh, purely using code. Uh, no need to go to any screen uh, to, uh, to prepare it or portal to do anything else. Uh, once I complete the commits, Coding in front of developers is pressure. So it will take about one minute for us to see uh, the instance uh, coming up. So I think in the interim, uh, probably I'll just have Rono and Noah uh, just talk through the steps. So this is the automation that's there. Essentially, you'd probably have to go through a lot of these steps They'll just take you through everything, including the security scan that we do, uh, so that make sure that it does comply with our baseline standards. For you as a developer, you don't need to worry about all of this. The moment, because of the DevSecOps automation that they've done, all of this has been fully created, prepared, and it's ready to, to, to be consumed. Many times we'd have situations where devs are saying, we've done so much work with our end users to build the code, but then we're having challenges uh, with getting it deployed. So you see, we're already at the first stage, now we're at stage three. So I'll just have uh, Noah, you or Rono, want to take them through. 
so you have seen the pipeline has started after George pushed the code to GitLab. So what it does, the first stage is to check out or uh, check out from the source code, not code management system, log into that. Uh, stage number two, Terraform has a, sorry, Jenkins has a plugin called Terraform. So Terraform, it calls that plugin, then it cleans the workspace. Uh, as you can see, there are other stages that had been run before, so it cleans the workspace. Uh, from there, it clones our repo now from uh, what George has pushed, bring it in here. Then uh, runs the Terraform command in it to initiate Terraform. Validates that our code is up to par. It does not have any Starnax errors and such. Uh, then from there, it does a plan. The plan shows us what we are going to build. Uh, if we are building 10 resources and all that, it shows us that. So there's a joke that goes around. You need to run Terraform plan on everything or else, at the end of it, you will find uh, 665 resources destroyed, one added and you had all those. So to avoid that, we do the Terraform plan. After that, we have a tool called InfraCost, which is also an open source tool. It does for us a cost estimation per month of the resources that we are going to add. So we do not have any surprises at the end of the month with the bill. We already know how much it will cost us. From there, it runs a security scan. The security scan is also run by an open source tool called Chekhov. Uh, this one is more inclined on the infrastructure and as code tools. So it will check to make sure that we have compliance to everything that is uh, out there or anything that we are building does not have any security loopholes. And if they are there, alert us, we close them. Uh, then after it finishes that, actually that is the longest stage of them all. As you can see from the past, we have one that took a minute and 10 seconds. So after it is done with that, the Terraform apply is now the building of the resource. It will just log in into AWS, build for us the EC2, and then we are good. It's the shortest of them all. So Rono will take us through now the next uh, bit of the AWS uh, session. So I think before Rono, uh, the positive thing is we should be able, uh, once we've seen the, us uh, get the refresh going, we should see our new instance. Uh, it's the one that you see now it's running. Click on the instance ID. I think one of the exciting things, and I'll just get Rono to talk about it, uh, is really what he's uh, insisted on us having tagging. Uh, so you see the new environment we've created, uh, created by yours truly, uh, done on Decode, uh, with you seeing. So we do have this environment, and it is usable. So it didn't crash, it worked. Uh, but maybe, Ronald, you can just talk about the tagging, and then I'll take them through storage, then we'll be done with our demo. Okay, thank you, George. So, yeah, one of the major things that we emphasize at Safaricom is actually to have tagging for all our resources. So we don't compromise on actually tagging, and this is mainly because we are a very dynamic team, we are a large team, and if someone was to create something and then tomorrow it's no longer with us, then we won't know actually if there's any issue with that project that who actually created it, who is managing this service and what is happening. So that is why the first thing we say is we, have, we should have tagging as the base minimum. And to do that, we have implemented service control policies on our AWS organizations to ensure that people actually tag. And if you do not tag, actually, you will not be able to create your NC2 instances. So we encourage the use of Terraform or CloudFormation, but Terraform mainly, because now that gives us that ability to do it on the fly. We are able to create the templates, which we can give the people now to actually do it on their own. And even if they do it on their own, they are able to comply with what we need. So tagging also is important for costs because we are now able to know each project, how much does it consume, such that we can compare, this is what you provide, this is what you consume at AWS, this is how it costs us, and then this is the return it give, brings back. So that is now why tagging is important. Then you'll also be noticing that we created the various things, so the storage, there's the status checks, networking, and with Terraform we are able now to actually have those as best class or best uh, the best effort where we are able now to be opinionated and say this is the best you can do this is the <coughs> this is how you should create a storage this is how you should create for how you should monitor and as such okay so i think everybody says that uh, rono is the tag is it master or if you don't tag you are not in the space so uh, it also applies to the cio as well so 
I just touch a bit on, on, on storage. It is important, I think, what you talked about, infra cost. I think many times as devs, when you are consuming these resources, and we saw it at Safaricom, uh, the overall cost is kind of pushing up to Liz and Mark and myself, but you just have guys playing around. Uh, perhaps, uh, and you devs, you know you do this a lot. You'll give yourself the most resources possible, but you're not, you're not conscious about cost. Uh, so I like the infra cost piece because we can tell who exactly did what and how much are they spending. And so if you need to charge back like an organization like ours, uh, that's now a group and we're working with various uh, organizations, we're also able to do a charge back and show them how much uh, your devs actually consuming of the cloud environment. I'll just go a bit and double click on the, the storage part. So similar to it, also the storage uh, also has its own tagging. Uh, so you can see all the details. Uh, we also make sure that the monitoring uh, is also in place and you can see the size uh, that, we, that we have there. The availability zone on AWS uh, where we are operating from. This, uh, as I said, it was created here. You can see the exact time. Uh, it was while we were doing this demo. And you just see, uh, so far, I'm not, we're not pushing any workloads. Maybe some of the devs earlier, we can give you the environment to work on it. Uh, but we would then be able to, uh, to look at uh, the various uh, operational parameters. And then from a status check, everything is okay. It's enabled. Uh, the volume is well. And uh, this environment is actually uh, ready to use. So I think I'll end the demo there, uh, Mbogwa. I think uh, we are very efficient on our time. And uh, please give a clap to the cloud community team. I think Pro Prof said that it's important that engineers don't work in silos. And I think when we work together, we do things better. Asante San, I think uh, th that was a great demo. But infrastructure as code, you know, some of the feedback we got yesterday is uh, if, if you have 1,500 people in attendance virtually, there's a high chance that there's a broad uh, a broad spread in terms of skill sets and understanding. So kuna software engineers, kuna um, aspiring software engineers, and there also may be other people who want to get the knowledge so that if you're having a conversation with a software engineer, you don't sound dumb or you don't feel dumb. Yeah. Um, so could you just walk us through that process of, let's assume, I mean, you're, 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 you're deploying an update, but now maybe Kualuga, you know, distill it a bit further. Yeah. Just walk us through that step of saying there's, there's a button on, on the Safaricom app that needs to be turned to red from green. <laughs> it should take you a minute. Yeah. So if you could walk us through what that process is like and more importantly, even how many people facilitate that sort of, um, you know, that sort of activity. Because you've, you've come on stage with a team. Yeah. Um, clearly, it's not a one-person thing. Yeah. So just help people get that context and understanding. Good. So for Safari Com app, we have a squad. And yesterday I saw the devs, I don't know if they're still here today. The front end devs were here and probably the rest of the squad. So the squad has the front end, back end. I will also have a DevSecOps or, or infra person. So the challenge will come. What, to... is, what is DevSecOps? By oh, good, good. <laughs> you know, there was, there was a time where we had the developers on one side building things, mm -hmm. and then you had the operational teams on one side. And I would, always, I would commonly have a saying that you don't build it and run, run away. We, you build it and run it. And DevSecOps is that. You're, you're actually building, it was first DevOps. Mm -hmm. So you're actually building a capability, but you're also responsible for its availability, its uptime, and for running it. So you make sure as you develop, the quality is good. If you do have a bug, and one of the KPIs that we have on DevOps Agile is actually availability. We look at the mean time to restore. So if you've built something and it, the moment it has a problem, mm -hmm. debugging and fixing is taking too long, you're actually not doing well on your KPIs. So SEC was not there for the longest time. So Dev and Ops came together pretty quickly. Uh, so we slid SEC in the middle, security, Mm -hmm. So that also the code is built well with security built in. So you're not coming after the fact to have a security guy review. Then you're waiting another week. And then you go back to another, what we call a sprint in Agile, to rebuild and fix security. So if we now have the, develop, the, the DevOps team, the SEC team, 
all together working in one agile squad, we, it now becomes faster for us to do releases. Oh, fantastic. I think um, round of applause for George and his team. In the, in the, in the, and as, as a get off stage, I think in the context of community, we must make sure that that, po that point of inclusivity also means that how we, how we speak and how we communicate to Nelewana, right? So that even if it's going to be a software engineer having a conversation with someone else who's interested in that particular community, in as much as they may not have studied into it, at least they feel at home and they feel that they can, they can participate. Um, for those joining us online or even in the room, remember the hashtag is Safaricom Decode. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on what can we do different um, based on uh, Daktari's, based on Baloz's um, keynote earlier. What other things do you think we can do different with blockchain to drive economic advancement? Okay, and I'll be, I'll be taking some of those thoughts. Um, and also in, 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 in the room, I'll be taking some of those thoughts later. And of course, incentivizing with, uh, with a bit of talk time, right? So moving, moving quickly to the, to the next session. When you think about technology and you think about the future, sometimes, you know, it's said that the best way to, to see the future is to actually create it. And I'd like to welcome Alice Munya, Director, Africa Miradi at Mozilla Corporation to talk us through her slide of tech 2025. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, they don't make hoodies for small people like me, um, so, but it's actually quite warm, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alice Munua uh, with Mozilla Corporation. Uh, for those who don't know, Mozilla is owned uh, by a nonprofit, the Mozilla Foundation. I work for the corporation that is the product making, money making side, but we are a mission based organization and uh, we are a global and vibrant community with a mission to promote openness, innovation and opportunity on the web. We are globally known for our popular web browser Firefox, so I want to know how many of you use Firefox? I'm removing my glasses so I can... Okay, how many of you use Chrome? Okay, I want all of those who use Chrome to delete it immediately. How many of you use Brave? Oh, good, it's only a few of you. What, <laughs> what about Safari? Oh, yeah. I would love to see Firefox actually becoming the dominant browser in this region for so many various reasons. To begin with, we just launched, just before I came, we launched a translate function on the browser. And so far, the translation is mainly as usual languages in the Western world, in Europe and in North America. So I really truly believe the internet is not yet for us and that's why it's really great to have all of you young people, especially developers in this room, to begin to take what we have, both from Mozilla and from AWS and everybody else, and to begin to make them our own. Because one of the things that Mozilla keeps asking and the reason why we're in this region and the reason why the Africa program is called the Africa Innovation Mbradi, Mradi means program in Kiswahili, for those of you who did, do not understand proper Kiswahili, Tanzania and Kiswahili, uh, it's, it's program. Uh, it's because we are really, really serious about checking the internet, looking at the web and making it our own. We keep asking what is the internet, what is the African internet and we still don't have an answer. Because why, when you look at even Mozilla products at the moment, for example we just launched Pocket two weeks ago, it's, a, you know, it's an app that helps content curators bring together content. We launched it for the first time in Kenya. The reason why, because a lot of the curated content were catering for, to people who live in Silicon Valley, who are white and male. Sorry, my friend, uh, <laughs> you're the only white and male here. Uh, but my colleagues, most of them are in Sa San Francisco and they're white and male. Uh, and that's the problem I think I saw yesterday, a lot of male speakers and very few women speakers. So I'd love to see more women actually take on uh, this, 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 this sector. So there are very few at the moment I can see, and I think there were only two that spoke yesterday. So Mozilla is also very curious to see what the problem is with that, and I believe, I think the problem starts with how we present STEM from a very early age. So we are globally known for our Firefox browser. I hope by the end of this, all of you will have moved to the Firefox browser. 
Our mission is to ensure that the internet is a global resource and that should be open and accessible to all. And so we know that uh, we have quite a number of us on the internet, but there are still billions and millions of people. I think we heard from Michael yesterday about the four forgotten billions or millions that are still largely part of this, uh, of this continent. Uh, we believe we build products that put people back in control of their uh, connected lives and advocate for public policies that improve the health of the internet by creative and creating and promoting interoperable open standards. We are very well known for open source and open standards that enable innovation, that's what we're here today, advance the web as a platform that is open and accessible to all and um, help you all look at it, innovate, make money from it as well. When, when Mozilla was started in 1998, the, group, the growth of the web uh, was defining where computing was going, and Mozilla focused on the web standards and building a browser. Today, however, we see that computing and the digital society that we live in is defined by, by vast troves of data, sophisticated, sophisticated algorithms, and omnipresent sensors and devices. This is the era of artificial intelligence, so AI. So asking questions today such as, does the way this technology work promote human agency? Am I in control of what happens with my data? Is asking how, is literally asking how do we build an open and free web in the next 20 years? So the current era of computing and the way it shapes the consumer internet technology has high tech, really high stakes. So AI is increasingly powering smartphones, social networks, social devices, you know, uh, online stores, cars, homes, uh, and, and almost any other type of electronic device. So given this level of power and per pervasiveness of these technologies, the question then should be, does AI help and support and empower, or does it exploit and exclude? And will we have a huge impact on the direction that our societies, especially, are heading with in the coming decades? So one area that Mozilla has chosen as a focus uh, regarding artificial intelligence is voice technology. And I think you heard from my colleagues yesterday, uh, as it plays a really crucial role as an emerging and powerful user interface, especially for devices that don't have a screen, and as a method to increase accessibility of services and information. At Mozilla, we are really concerned with the availability and accessibility of these voice, voice technologies, especially to people who speak languages um, underrepresented, for example, Kiswahili and you know, our local languages here in Kenya. Um, and most of them are underrepresented by current commercial solutions or applications that don't have the financial means to afford what's on the market. The risk is that populations with under-resourced languages are left behind and not able to benefit from voice technologies, especially uh, um, specifically on the potential of AI generally meeting the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. This would set up yet another digital divide. It, it's already set, set up another digital divide. Another aspect of Mozilla that is, we're working is building open source tools such as Deep Speech, um, and, uh, which is Deep Speech to Text uh, uh, Engine and Mozilla text-to-speech engines as, op as well as open data sets, that is common voice. Um, so, what, so what we see is a change coming, and the question then is, is just the time frame and what's actually required to make it happen, what do we really need? You know, all of these new technologies, both blockchain, peer-to-peer -peer protocols, you know, can take a while to get here because we know it's not just about technology and business, mod, business model, model and revenues, it's also about social understanding and consciousness. And what we learned with the web is you need, to, you need those use cases and the tools that make it easy for people before it really takes off. And I think m -Pesa is a really great example of that. I'm hoping you know, Common Voice and Pocket and other products become really great examples of that. And we all know that technology does not solve human nature. And so what we're experiencing on the internet now is all human nature, the good, the bad, the ugly, you name it. It is human nature. And there are some things that, about the open web that we cherish and want to revive, those that have underlying values, I would say, you know, like transparency, of course, but also the ability for more people to participate uh, uh, more, and, and more opportunity for more people, more level playing fields uh, to create, 
because these are all the things uh, that the open web signifies, and we need those. So what we need is a system that is more accountable in it, because even going to a new system won't solve human nature, as we know. And even though it is, it is right now, it seems to be like blockchain can be a sort of magically solve many th of these issues once that becomes mainstream. Um, but we'll, have, we'll find that there are some other new kinds of problems, you know, uh, centralization, you know, and, central, and the decentralization of economic power and the ability to continue to develop assets in new areas like, you know, data, and those tendencies will remain. So I think to move backwards towards exploring decentralization, you know, will give us a new opportunity, just as the open web, you know, um, cannot be an open web uh, alone. So we need to have that sense of accountability and responsibility that goes along with openness. So, and I think where the early open web and open internet, uh, that is where the early web, the early, early web and the open internet really got lost. The technology and the systems developed at such high speed that, you know, move fast and break things, but with no accountability about the mechanisms in terms of the social impact they were having. So, um, you know, we all know, you know, um, that, and we all understood that we had some shared purposes, but accountability mechanisms didn't grow. And so it's, it's with this that I would really like to congratulate, you know, uh, Safaricom's journey there for starting, you know, uh, for this transition to a tech company, you know, with the motto, simple, transparent, and honest. And, you know, to, you know, to acknowledge as well that Mozilla has been through, through this transition as well. And, you know, it's taken a while and maybe we are at perhaps 75% done. Um, but there's a lot, it means a lot to run a business and how to run a business in a way that you can be proud of at the same time, making sure that you're being, you know, simple, transparent and, and honest to, to your users. So, um, you know, one, of, one area that I think uh, Safaricom and I think Mozilla and others are going to be having to struggle with is the area of a data economy. And I think, you know, George, you and I and, and, and your team be talking about, you know, how do we, how do we take on the, the issue of data uh, and make it more em empowering than extractive? Um, and how do we manage that, you know, power balance uh, in terms of how we use in, in your data. You know, and the current paradigm of data governance has on one end the commodification of data uh, at its heart, but not really the user benefit and public good. And I think that is one thing that we all need to, to really you know, you know, like think about and perhaps you know, ask our developers to start thinking about a really respectful way of collecting data that powers a lot of our innovation, but at the same time is respectful and not extractive. So we have to make sure that the interests of the communities are sufficiently protected. Um, and I know that, you know, at the moment, few companies hold the data-driven economy. But as we all come into it, uh, I think the idea of effective protection and, you know, meaningful uh, individual control must be on the cornerstone of uh, data-focused, you know, uh, work that we do, including uh, legislation. So um, in that informed use, so we eventually get informed users, empowered users, uh, strong security, and you know, uh, limited data protection that is also powering a lot of our innovation going forward. I thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, thank you for having invited uh, uh, Mozilla to be part of this. Um, our desk case is demonstrating some of our products, hubs, and uh, Pocket, uh, we launched uh, Hubs um, and Common Voice, we launched Pocket just a few weeks ago. And I welcome you all to, you know, to have a look, pass by, and hopefully we'll be able to hold what, a couple of uh, collaborative hackathons soon so we can play around with our open source products. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. In indulge me for a second. I mean, you know, we say that the gateway to the internet is often time the humble browser. You know, most people don't even know the origins of that. And I think it's fantastic that Mozilla is now merging that with voice. And I think the combination of that, and remember yesterday we said, um, especially with, um, with, the, with the challenge that's happening, that there are over 200 million Swahili speakers across a region that covers around 14, 14 countries. So if you combine those two, I think it forms something very powerful and connected to the conversation from the earlier speakers, looking at Web3, how we consume um, information, I mean this pocket, how we consume um, other services. I think we're starting to see a very nice, you know, the, the recipe book is now open for really innovative solutions. But before you leave stage, um, let's talk about the issue of ethics. 
And you know, where does the buck stop? There are all these solutions that are being created all over. Most are AI based. Um, where does the buck stop? And who should be the chaperone of that? How do we handle that ethics conversation? Yeah, yeah the ex ethics conversation is a really complicated one because I think we have to play a really delicate balance in terms of those of us, I mean, in terms of you know, business models uh, that, are, you know, uh, that depend on the internet, and at the same time, you know, respecting you know, uh, individual rights. Mm -hmm. uh, we already have a data protection you know, uh, legislation here that clearly calls for like, meaningful consent before you access people's data. At the same time, you know, some of us, for example, Mozilla really touts a lot of our products have, you know, um, have privacy. Uh, by default. For example, our web browser doesn't follow you, doesn't collect information. I'm, I'm really serious about this. Uh, you know, for Mozilla, for example, the, the, you know, the, the model, the business model of collecting data to, to uh, power our innovation, that's not our model at the moment. Our model is first create products that are meaningful, uh, that empower the, 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 the individual to take control of their own, uh, uh, their own you know, uh, online experience, and so pocket being one and the other. But at the same time, working with low, 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 low agency policy makers, you know, I've been a policy maker myself. I served on the CCK for, for 10 years on the board. Uh, and one of the things I really admire about the regulatory authority in Kenya, uh, from when I was with, with them, you can tell my age, six, you know, over six years, over 10 years ago, um, we launched uh, M-Pesa without really having any regula regulations there. We simply just said, let's launch, let, let's, let's launch it. And then if there are any uh, laws that are being broken, we'll come and say, hey, you know, let's sit down and have that conversation between the financial regulator and the communication regulator. And I believe that is how, you know, uh, that is what has allowed us to have this kind of conversation. But not leaving ethics aside, you have to yeah. always ask yourself, I'm developing this product. What impact is it going to be having on people beyond just making money out of it? Uh, you know, uh, there's an example of a lot of fintechs that mine people's data that is simply unnecessary. Like, why do you really need uh, my DNA or my eye, e iris uh, scan or earlobe to get a Huduma number? <laughs> you don't need that. That's excessive data. Yeah. And why would, you want, why would you want to collect all that data from nearly 50 million Kenyans and put it in one centralized database? That already is a honeypot uh, for anybody who wants to steal that data. Can you imagine if I got access to data of 50 million Kenyans with all of that, what I could do with that? You know, so that's when ethics come in, comes in. You know, we just don't build AI products without thinking about the impact that's going to have. Uh, because we rush, we are always rushing with a technology solution before thinking about, about what really is the problem. Yeah. You know, so we are always coming in with, our, especially technology companies are all guilty of that. You have a problem looking for a solution, not the other way around. You're not asking the question, what is the problem? What, what is the gap? What is this product supporting or what gap is it? You know, what is the business, what is the business model that is going to be respectful rather than uh, extractive? Thank you for those insights, Alice. And as you step off stage, you know, she, um, we're talking about the issue of ethics and I think it still remains complicated because of the issue of bias. We are software engineers and we carry biases whether or not we appreciate that fact. So we must be cognizant as we develop all these uh, tools and solutions that we try balance that so that we can create a more um, inclusive, more sustainable uh, society. And I, I'll pose the question again, and I ask, where does the buck stop? And before any piece of technology that we build as uh, a software engineering community, before it gets commercialized, or before it gets weaponized, right, there must be someone calling the shots. And at the end of the day, it's all about leadership. And I'd like to call on stage Salabwa Wycliffe, country leader Dell Technologies, to speak to us about the next generation of tech leaders. And hopefully you can think about the questions to ask concerning that particular point. Karibu Wycliffe. Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning again. Thank you very much, Safaricom, for giving me this opportunity to sit here and uh, uh, talk to you guys about uh, the next generation tech leadership. My name, as you heard, is Wycliffe Selebwa. I'm the country leader for Dell in Kenya. 
based out of Nairobi, and Dell is actually domiciled in Nairobi for the East African office. Uh, talking of uh, leadership in tech, I think uh, from a larger background of my life, I have been in tech, whether it was in the motor industry, whether it is in IT, whether it is in hardware, software, networking, and anything else going to the cloud, it's all been technology. So to the best of my knowledge, and I think I should share this with you, is that what will form the next tech leadership depends on a couple of things. I will start by telling you something about Nokia. Nokia was acquired by Microsoft in 2016. When the CEO of Nokia, at the last speech, when he was announcing the takeover by Microsoft, that is Stephen Elop, he said two things. He said, we didn't do nothing wrong, but we lost it all the same. And his entire management, plus himself, broke down in tears. Why did they break down in tears? It is because a company that was formed in 1865, having survived a full century and having gone through so much innovation, did not have the agility or strength to survive the coming tides of competition. They did not change towards the market trends, and they did not adapt new styles of leadership that would have transformed the organization into the next generation corporate leader. That is why Nokia suddenly vanished. But all of you, most of us who are probably my age, remember very well that was our first love, Nokia 3310. Nokia 3310. We sang about it, we danced about it, and we did everything around Nokia 3310. So having said that, I will take you through what we consider to be the strides within the tech space at the moment, as we see it, and then I will take you through what leadership is from an MIT standpoint. For those of you who know MIT, MIT is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the world's leader in technology in, as far as education is concerned. So what are we seeing are the trends in the technology industry right now and in the tech leadership space? What are we seeing currently? What we are seeing is there's a huge demand of tech savvy resources. Tech savvy resources meaning that these are resources that have heavily invested in technology whether from a training perspective, whether from a development perspective, or whether from an intuition perspective. They have heavily invested in technology. And there's a huge demand right now across all the calibers of workforces that we see within the work environment. Secondly, there's a scarcity. Huge demand, scarcity. We have very few people who are highly skilled to enter the tech leadership space. There are very few. I can count probably in this room with both my hands, I don't think I'll get to 10 or 20. And that is the situation globally. That is what is ailing the global economy. Very few people are coming into this space and are being able to fill up the capacity requirements within this space. And what does that do when there's a scarcity and the demand is huge? Of course, it creates a very high price gap. High price gap in terms of remuneration, high price gap in terms of your retention bonuses, and the price of a highly skilled technology person becomes almost inhibiting to most of the corporations across the globe. What does that do then? We go back to the same thing, high mobility across all the industry segments within the market. People are mobile. As long as you've got the skill sets that are required in tech leadership, you're mobile you can almost say that you will be in a job, your lifespan, your lifespan in that job will be six months, eight months, 10 months, and the millennials nowadays actually say 12 months is my max. 12 months is my max because I've got the skill set that makes me very highly mobile. And with this mobility, of course, it brings the challenges that come back to biters within the industry, within the tech leadership space. 
That has been said so many times through so many studies at MIT, and it's been realized that unless we do something about it as tech leaders, then we are going to let the industry down. And the good thing is that when I look at this generation that is sitting here, I see leaders. I see leaders. I don't see developers. I don't see software engineers. I see leaders. A leader is somebody who will move out of their comfort zone and lead the masses. A leader is somebody who will give direction and guidance to the other people, whether they are in that field or not. And that is what we are looking at when we are looking at you guys, the generation that is sitting here before us. MIT goes ahead and says, what are the four or five things that we require to see in a leader in the coming generations? And they break it down to four buckets. One, a leader within the tech space must be able to acquire broad, broad knowledge. And apart from acquiring the broad knowledge, you must be able to intensely collaborate. Every speaker that's come here since yesterday, Paul spoke about it, Morris spoke about it, Professor Bitange talked about it, and my friend Mudoni has just talked about it the same way. We must be able to collaborate. You must be able to upskill up and upgrade yourself. And then apart from just the upscaling and upgrading, you must be able to collaborate with all the other players that you're working with within that environment. Well, that means that you need to move out of the comfort of ambiguity and be able to make quick decisions. That is what tech leadership is all about. Secondly, you must look beyond productivity and start moving into creativity. People are moving from the mindset of how many hours am I putting in a day? How many visitors am I getting if I'm a salesperson? Or how many visit calls am I making to the customer if I'm a salesperson? It doesn't matter how many you're making. It doesn't matter how many hours you're putting in in a day. What matters is how creative are you spending that time to make the outcome matter? Because at the end of the day, it's the outcome that matters. It's the results that you're going to drive that are going to matter to your customer and to yourself. And that is exactly what MIT thinks needs to be the next generation after you've acquired all the knowledge and you've collaborated with everybody else that is within your space. Thirdly, you need to be a guardian of awesome power. Awesome power. We've just come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. For the last two years, a lot of us were helter-skelter, running around like headless chicken, didn't know what to do next, didn't know what to adapt to next. Businesses didn't know how business continuity was going to be programmed into the operations for the next 12, 14, 16, 18 months. They didn't know, they had no clue, they had no visibility. And for a leader in the tech space, you must have the ability to have that awesome power that will enable you sit down and look at the changes that are required within the direction of the organization to make sure that you're adapting to the volatile times that you're going through. A lot of companies went into the COVID-19 pandemic. Very few of them emerged winners. A lot of them shut doors. A lot of them closed shop completely, and a lot of them laid off a lot of their resources and employees. And that is because the leadership did not envision such a drastic change in the way people operate, in the way people work, and in the way the direction of the market was pulling. Then finally, you must be a truly champion inclusive person as a tech leader. What do you mean by truly champion inclusive person? You must be alert to the unconscious bias that you carry whenever you're in a multicultural, diverse environment. We work in multicultural, diverse environments, and if you're not alive to the fact that you're working in a diverse culture, a diverse space, then you get lost into the segment of non-inclusion. 
you start looking at other people as not being part of the same organization or being part of your team and you start excluding them from whatever you're doing whether it's in decision making whether it's in running programs or projects or whether it is moving ahead in terms of the organization so looking at those buckets MIT clearly spells it out for you and I see a lot of that already having been talked about by my previous speakers we've talked about it left, right, and center, and I believe that all of you, as you come from your college degrees and go to the workplace, you will have the ability to inculcate all these desirables into your work ethic so that you become the next leaders in tech. Then finally, I was told I have seven minutes, so I will be, I'll be very fast on this. Finally, what's Dell doing? What's the Dell approach in as far as the tech leadership space is concerned? We have invested almost on an annual basis 5 to 10 percent of our annual income into research and development. Research and development going all the way into producing ergonomically engineered mobility solutions that make you work from anywhere, anytime, any place, under whatever condition that you are in. This we are doing with our Workspace ONE collaborating tools, we are doing with our mobility solutions, and this came actually to the forefront at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, when everybody was forced to work remotely from where they were and everybody was looking for a solution that they could sit on top of the mountain and work comfortably, they could sit on the bed of the sea and work comfortably, and they could actually run on the truck and still work comfortably. Those solutions are within the Dell Technology Mobility Solutions portfolio. We've invested a lot in AI. I hope there are no farmers here, because AI in farming is something else. So we've invested a lot in AI, we've invested a lot in ML, machine learning, we are investing a lot in software-defined networking, which is embedded in major solutions that we're bringing to market. And this is the Dell's capability within the markets that we operate in. Secondly, security. Security has become a concern to everybody. We are, we are told by the cybersecurity organizations that every seven seconds there is, there is a cyber attack attempt. And this has happened even in Kenya here with organizations that we know very well. And we are investing as Dell in security big time. We run a program under the American Sheltered Hub Organization, which is actually an American financial institutions organization that brings about the baseline of what a good cybersecurity solution should be. And in this docket, only Dell has managed to be pre-qualified as the only vendor with a solution that can actually be your last line of defense in the event of any ransomware. What we do is we take you, clone you, put you in a vault, and in the event there's a disaster and the original you disappears from the surface of the earth, we shall bring you back from that vault in your individual, in your original state. That is what our cyber rescue solution does. Then finally, we are investing heavily in very highly scalable and resilient infrastructure. George can testify to that. He can talk to that. I think when he mentioned that I was waiting for his demo to crash, I was very comfortable because I know what infrastructure he's running on. I didn't have to worry about it at all. I didn't worry at all completely. So George, uh, when it comes to that, I have nothing to worry about. And uh, finally, we also run multi-cloud agility or environments to do with cloud, whether you're talking about a hybrid cloud, whether you're talking about a, pri a private cloud, and we assist our customers on their multi-cloud journeys. That is what Dell does in a nutshell. Coming down to the local level, what do we as Dell do? I will touch on three things. There's the digital solar hubs that we just initiated about three months ago, starting with Makueni County. 
Dell has provisioned a digital solar hub for 16 divisions within Makueni County, which are fully serviced, fully equipped, and fully supported by Dell. We are partnering with Kamara, who is our educational partner within Africa, to deliver this so that we can assist the governments in Africa bridge the cyber, the, the digital divide. Why did we start with Makueni County, for example? Somebody would ask that. Because Makueni County has a governor that is IT savvy. And he has embraced IT technology in as far as delivering service to his people is concerned. So these solar hubs will not only serve the county government, but they are serving all the schools within Makueni County where the students need to go and learn about computers, where they need to become digital savvy, and where they need to get the next skills that are going to take them into the workplace in a comfort zone. Secondly, we as Dell have built together with several universities across Africa institutes that actually go into research and development. We've talked about software engineering, we're talking about data analytics, we're talking about data science. We are partnering with a lot of universities globally to make sure that we are churning out the next generation leaders who are going to take up the space in the workplace for these roles. And you can actually go down into the Dell website and go into trainings and you will find all the trainings available there. Some of them are actually even done with virtual labs. And you can enroll at any time and continue with your trainings from there and you certify from there. Then finally at a local level, we are looking together with other partners including Safaricom at seeing how we can assist major communities within our country get to the level where they can make sure that their people are IT savvy. And we are doing that by supporting a lot of infrastructure, a lot of solutions that are going into the counties to make sure that people within those counties are actually getting some level of education and some level of comfort around IT and technology. Okay? I will end my presentation with what MIT, with one of the co-founders of Future Workplace, Dan Schwabel, commented, and he said, the baby boomers, those at least who are not retiring, have the benefit of experience. The Generation X workers have patiently waited because their turn is coming, and they feel they should move into leadership positions by virtue of their, way, of their working their way up. But companies are desperately in need of technology skills, the flexibility and adaptability of millennials, and that's pushing many of them into leadership roles, which can be very, very disruptive. We are seeing it already with the millennials, even in our local environment here. We are already seeing it. They are causing a lot of dis disruption within the tech leadership space. And a lot of them are emerging to be top 40 under 40, and a lot of them are actually rising. And George, you are above 40. <laughs> We've got a lot of young talent that is rising within the top 40 under 40, which is in the tech space. And just by the mere fact that we carry the second largest community of startups within Africa tells you that the time is right for you. So guys, rise to the occasion, seize the momentum, and run with it as much as you can. Thank you very much, and I look forward to engaging with you more. We have our Dell booth back there next to the cloud. Please feel free to walk there, have a chat with our guys there, go into our website. And uh, for those of you who are looking for opportunities at Dell, jobs.dell.com slash merat. Did you get that? Jobs.dell.com slash M-E-R-A-T. Please feel free. Once again, Safaricom, thank you very much. We are glad to be your partner of choice in as far as technology infrastructure is concerned. And we shall journey this uh, journey together hand in hand until we get to the next level of development. Thank you.
Thank you, Wycliffe. Um, I mean, we, we've determined that leadership is at, at two levels. One, corporate and individual. You highlighted quite a bit on, on the individual and for the benefit of, you know, the larger audience that may also be composed of businesses or business owners, would you have a cheat sheet uh, in terms of a strategy that if someone is looking at then establishing leadership across whatever function, what would they look at in terms of as being an, uh, an organization? What would, would they look at? Well, uh, thanks, Jay. That's a very good, uh, very interesting question. And uh, it talks about leadership at an individual level and then leadership at a corporate level. One thing that I'm very clear about in the entire of my career is leadership begins with you. Leadership begins with you. You will not learn it in any school. You will not go to college to learn leadership. Leadership begins with you in the way you carry yourself around, in the way you engage with others, in the way you interact with others, in the way you empathize with others that correlate with you. So leadership begins with you at a personal level. And it is your responsibility to drive yourself into a leadership position that can be determined or can be uh, referred to as commanding. Why? Because there are leadership traits that you must inculcate as you come up through your leadership journey. And once you have all these traits with you, which actually depend on where you're looking at or where you're looking from, skill is one of them. Uh, integrity is one of them. Uh, when you look at it in terms of hard work, is one uh, diligence is one of them. And then uh, teamwork is also part of it. So at the end of the day, as an individual, you must be able to build all this across within your portfolio so that you can sell yourself. At the corporate level, <coughs> excuse me, at the corporate level, I believe all organizations have their own leadership structures and they are defined by certain matrices that as individuals we must aspire to and surpass. And when it comes to corporates, I think the best thing that you may do as a corporate is make sure that you're setting in place the right leadership capabilities within your teams and then also ensuring all these are being inculcated in your team members before they come to the corporate space. That's what I would say. Fantastic. I'd like to call upon Naisenya to help us appreciate uh, Wycliffe. Naisenya, come on stage, please. Thank you. Just give us a minute. I'd like to appreciate you. Asante sana. And as Wycliffe walks off stage, I mean, for me, when, when he spoke about the individual level, uh, it came down to EQ. It's, um, and you know, when looking at EQ, you're looking at self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. So even as an, as an engineer, as an executive in your, in your organization, how you drive or how you prepare yourself for leadership, you actually, be, and this is beyond skills, you could be the best at what you do the best engineer in a certain category, but if you lack all these other things, I mean, it counts for not, and I guess you'll, be, you'll get very, very frustrated when you see other people moving or getting into positions of leadership and you're lying on the crutch or you're um, thinking that I am better because I'm more skilled, but no, they are because they've actually been able to look at themselves more, more wholesomely. We are live on LinkedIn and other social um, handles, and I'd like to recognize Jo General Kehara from Nanyuki and George Ajuang from Kisumu and they're on LinkedIn. I mean, they've, um, they've really engaged on there. And I'd like to urge you, even as we go into our health break, to continue uh, engaging on social media, reaching out to people who are in here and also online and see how you can connect and continue growing, growing the community. So we're going into our 20 minute break and we'll see you right back here then. Thank you.
IT transformation is having a, a very significant impact on business outcomes, particularly within the Formula One environment. The pace of change within Formula One is really quite staggering. You've got tens or hundreds of thousands of data points streaming off the car in real time. The speed of that telemetry is increasing and therefore our speed to understand it and interpret it and to make decisions off the back of it needs to keep up with that. So there's not really any point where we can have downtime, there's not really any point where we can have a loss of service. The faster we can design components, the faster we can engineer components, the faster we can deliver changes to trackside. IT is a, an intrinsic part of that. You couldn't have those systems that enable the design and optimization without an IT platform underneath it. We need to ensure that we're finding those marginal performance gains within our server estate, our storage estate, the way we use a high performance compute. Every small amount of marginal gain that we can pull from the IT system directly transfers into optimized design and engineering. So it's very easy to draw a parallel between IT transformation and on-track performance. Having servers, storage, end-user compute, all under one roof and all from a single vendor, that really makes our job in IT simpler. What's changed over the last two years for us is moving to infrastructure as code in order to better support a hybrid cloud operating model. Our ability to take services and run applications as easily on-premise as we would in a cloud environment, that's how IT can streamline itself as a function, that's how IT can focus on delivering value into the rest of the business. Working with Dell Technologies actually gives us a partner to run that with. Having good shared insight of our own McLaren roadmap and the Dell Technologies roadmap helps us keep aligned as to where we're going to go next and where do we see risk in where we're going next, where are we may be pushing too fast, but also where are we not pushing fast enough. I think it's a Safaricom engineering community. Uh, to go to area. What's your cue? What's your cue? Kenneth. She jumped on the so questions. We, we, have, we have been using. <laughs> we, used, we will be using. <laughs> your point in Alicata. Hey, I'd come back to your goal. <laughs> Hi, my name is Naisanya Mungai. My name is Kamau Maina. Jacqueline Modani. My name is Felix Mene. My name is George Chuguna. Dennis Kiputo. I am Mark Koyer. My name is Ayan Kainan. My name is Kenneth Awino. I am David Kazi. Alan Kipsang. My name is Rose Maina. Rickliff Kipkoge. I'm Jill Mora. My name is Rosanne Oguelo Diero. Bildad Mwangi. My name is Steven Chuguna Maina. Ngesa Marvin. My name is Beryl Anchep Kemoy. Victor Mwenda Rwanda. My name is Edna Njoroge. Benson Macharia. My name is Jude Juma. Desborn Kipto. And I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. I am. Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. And I am Safaricom Engineering Community. 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 I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. Mi hata si dambi wa take two. Ntoke hapa.
I promised you guys an amazing day and so far I'm doing well guys. I'm keeping my promise from Ambassador Ambassador Professor Bitangen Demo, George Nduguna. Of course we've just spoken, we just heard from Wycliffe Celebwa and Director Alice Munua of Mra the Africa Mradi at Mozilla Corporation. It's been an amazing morning full of insight and you guys have been so engaged online. I love hearing from you. I saw Red Pete saying I think we can use AI in farming and there's a whole conversation going on there in the thread about how we can use AI in farming. Um, I've also seen someone say that they feel like they need Wycliffe Celebwa to be their mentor and that's from several people so I think I'll have to get Wycliffe on this hot seat for a little fireside chat later and maybe he can talk about his presentation a little bit more I'll be speaking to Alice Munua as well in just a minute but I've got giveaways upon giveaways guys first things first 500 bob worth of airtime at the end of the day if you can collect all my passports so I'll say this my second passport of the day if you were there during the beginning you might not have heard that one and that's okay second passport of the day the Wright brothers that's it the Wright brothers just note it down for the end of the day and I could give you 500 Bob worth of airtime I've also got more goodies <laughs> I just come packed with goodness Safaricom you know is super super generous in here there is an Evo pad there is a power bank. There is a decode hoodie because you guys asked for decode hoodies yesterday and we said sour. Tumewaskia. Decode, decode hoodie in Akuja. Like I said, power bank, Evo, uh, Evo pad. Of course, we've also got a very nice hoodie and a notepad. All that is for you and it will be awarded to you by the Safaricom digital team. So keep it here. Stay engaged and keep staying with us. I've also got comments from the guys in LinkedIn because we appreciate you. Sometimes we may not always be there present with you, but we want to make sure you are heard and you are scene. So first of all, I want to shout out Judy Mudoni from Juba in South Sudan. Thank you so much for tuning in, man. I'm hoping it's warmer there than it is here, but thank you for tuning in, Judy. Um, Cyrus says, hey guys, I am a trainee in the ALX software engineering program, and I'm so happy to join the summit that Safaricom provides. I think a lot of you are happy to network even virtually because I see it happening in the comment sections as well, to think through ideas, to collaborate. I never want to hear that the engineering community is stingy again, okay? We debunked that myth yesterday Day with Samuel Kamochu and we continue to do it. Um, I've also got Tawet Kipkingo who says this is the best learning opportunity ever. Agreed. Like I said, when the cameras are off, it's me and my notebook. Okay, I'm going to be a techie by fire by force thanks to the Safaricom Engineering Summit. Um, as I promised you guys, I will have Alice Munua, who is the director of uh, Africa Mradi at the Mozilla Corporation. She's going to join us now and we can go through what she talked about earlier. If you have questions, please go on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and I can see if I can ask her a few. I'll invite Alice now to join me. Hi. Very nice to meet you, Alice. Nice to meet you. Do you <laughs> <laughs> COVID. First of all, love the t-shirt, Alice. We absolutely should all be feminist, yes. um, especially in the tech space. Yes. Do you like the, the representation that we have now? Are we doing a lot better? Are we where we should be when it comes to women in tech? Or are we are getting there? We are on the way. We have a long way to go. Okay. Yeah, just from looking at yesterday, uh, I, I stayed in and I think there were only two women mm -hmm. holding mm -hmm. the presenter. Yes. And uh, they presented late in the afternoon. Oh, sorry, uh, we could not hear you. Can I just switch this on for you? Yeah. Sorry, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Please give okay. the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we, ha we still have a long way to go, especially when it comes to gender representation. Mm -hmm. Uh, yesterday, there were only two women the whole day yeah. that spoke, yes. and that would have been, yeah, that's not very good. And then today morning, the same thing. Yes. Uh, I think I'm the only woman, and there's still there are quite a number of women in the room. You know, I believe are really qualified to speak. Yeah. You know, and you'll notice that the Mozilla booth is actually full of, it's nearly, it's over 99% women. Yeah. So, uh, we have we, a, way to, a, long, we way have a long way to go. And, uh, and we truly believe that the, you know, the web and the internet mm -hmm. is, is a global resource and should be open and accessible to everybody. To so, everyone. Everyone. Yes. Yeah. Regardless of anything. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, first of all, your presentation was very well received online and in the room as well. Um, but Thank I'll you. start from the beginning. You work at uh, Africa Mradi, which is, which works for, or like you said, the profit-making arm of Mozilla, right? But it's more about, um, Mozilla as a whole is more about social impact. How do you bridge the gap between uh, we need to make profit and we need to do good? I, I know it's a very wide question, but um, as best as you could explain it, how do you make sure that you're providing impact while still remaining profitable because the lights do have to stay on? 
and profit does have yes. to be made. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I understand. And yes. in fact, that is the one thing uh, at Mozilla as well. We're still working, you know, and still exploring and still working with. Mm -hmm. uh, but the model that we want, would really like to see, and not just uh, globally, but espe especially in the Africa region, is a model that really puts users back in control of their online life, empowers them, and empowers them to actually do business. But business that do doesn't dehumanize, business that provides, you know, human agency, business that you know really respects uh you know various rights especially digital rights um and as and we're what we're seeing with the web right now uh is actually it's not very good you know a lot of disinformation hate speech uh not what we, we imagined when we were working on the web uh yes. you know back all those years back when it was created mm -hmm. and definitely we didn't imagine that as mozilla will be fighting uh, for you know for digital rights for example you know to against disinformation and all of that so that's what we mean in in terms of you know working to make sure that there's a healthy internet where everybody can innovate and you know uh, make money from with it yes. but at the same time that it's open for everybody, everybody and that people are able to make money in an empowering sort of way so my I like to use this word profit without oppression. Yes. That that is what we should be really uh, ideally looking at. I like the idea of profit yeah. without profit oppression. Without oppression. Yeah. It yes. even goes back to just the first question I asked and you spoke earlier about this. You said um, we've made gains in when it comes to the web so fast that sometimes we skip over the impact of these things and of course um, the dark side of the web and all these things. Do you think that representation would change that when you have everybody included when it comes to you know from the basics of writing code to everything? Now means that your code doesn't have biases your artificial intelligence isn't biased and things like that or you're not seeing um, or you're seeing a lot more checks and balances when it comes to how the web is used do you think representation would help with that um, representation will help but it's not the only thing mm -hmm. yeah I think we need representation we need justice we need diversity we need inclusion we need accountability we need transparency we need honesty yes. you know all the things that actually Safaricom is talking about mm -hmm. you know honesty integrity transparency people centered a people centered internet yeah. a healthy people centered yeah. internet yeah. and I think once we achieve that and it's going to be a long way coming in that I love the, the approach here that Safaricom is taking the approach of or the journey of becoming a technology company by involving the community. Yes. There's no way, you know, it's it's really going back to that, you know, the African philosophy of Ubuntu. Yes. You know, I am because we are. And I think that's exactly what Safaricom is saying. I am because, because we are. Yeah. And so because we are, we all come together and develop Safaricom into a technology company that is respectful, involves the community, mm -hmm. that listens yes. to the community. Yeah. And that we were able to build technology products and tech technology that really respects you know human agency yeah you know and puts people first Put, including and, women yes including yes. women yeah. um, and Especially like, women. like you said this it's an engineering it's an engineering summit put together by Safaricom but to bring different stakeholders and I'm, I'm sure even and using the internet to the best of their ability. Is it perhaps lawmakers? Is it other stakeholders in the industry? Who would you say is the biggest bottleneck? Um, or maybe a, a softer word than bottleneck. <laughs> yeah, it's not so much a bottleneck. I would yeah. really call any stakeholder a bottleneck. Yeah. I think I, I really tend to believe that every stakeholder has, you know, uh, has really, you know, uh, good motives. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, I hope. As, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> to the best of our knowledge. To best, yeah, to the best of our knowledge. But the, my, my biggest problem we see, and at Mozilla we see, there's so much, we focus so much on engineering and technology and not so much on humanities. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And then we, we look at every single human problem and, and think, oh my God, this technology is going to help. Yes. No, you, there's no, you, technology cannot solve social problems. It will not. Technology can only be a facilitator. Technology is just an int like, an, like infrastructure. Uh, your mobile phone is not going to solve all your problems. Their mobile phone is not going to solve our corruption issues. Uh, blockchain is not definitely not going to be solving our corruption issues. Yeah. In, 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 no. That's so technology. Could, could we lean in on that one a bit? Because yeah. most people uh, hail blockchain as the end of corruption. You know. No, <laughs> because corruption is a human problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I tend to think technology sometimes might, technology tends to facilitate biases, like we're seeing with AI. As we create AI, the people who, are, who are those that are creating artificial AI? They are the human beings. white 
male, male <laughs> based in Silicon Valley. And yeah. so what are, the, are their biases? Yeah. They're embedding all those biases into, the into code. Yeah. artificially, into coding. Yes. And so what are the biases? Racism, misogyny, patriarchy, homophobia, all of those are embedded in it. Yeah. And I think I always encourage people to read, for example, books like All Algorithms of Oppression mm -hmm. by Sophia Noble and others, Race uh, by Benjamin, Ruha Benjamin at Princeton. And they actually mentioned some of these words, or Tim Nitgebru, who's been talking about this for the longest time, who was the former Google person who was working on AI at Google. Yeah. We keep talking about AI is not an, a panacea, and technology is definitely not going to be solving all our problems. Yeah. You have to understand. They thought that that model would work here in the Africa region. No, because most of us don't depend on credit. Credit facilities. For these facilities. Yeah. So it, it just meant a tweak, a little tweak, business tweak, not business, not technology, product tweak. Mm -hmm. Just a tweak of thinking, creative thinking. Yeah. To, be, to, um, to introduce, you know, um, measure, measured internet or the scratch cards yes. or bundles and see how it's become so popular. But if they had come here really insisting on this is the way the mobile should I'm going work, to... I'm going not to mail you your phone bill at the end of the month. Yeah. How? What's How? my address? Oh, yeah. We don't even have an address system. Not just that. <laughs> I don't have that kind of income. Yeah. I can only afford a shilling or even less than a shilling. Yeah, a day. A day well, yes. to, to use. And so the allowance for that. And I think that's why M-Pesa is, is so important. Yeah. And uh, Safaricom becoming a tech company is so good because they can continue to think from that perspective. Yeah. yeah. Do you think we can draw a tangent between um, what you're saying, thinking of um, a solution and then working backwards to the problem? Um, 
with the tech and the startup industry in Kenya right now, do you think we're at a place where we have a lot of startups that have a solution but no problem behind them? I, I, I don't know if that's your particular area of expertise, but just in case. Yeah, um, rhetorical. On your, One of your... these was, was it Kuna Food? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you should mention, but yes. Yes. They came here. Yeah. They had a, uh, a solution and lots of money. Yeah. But uh, no they, they, they really didn't have a problem. Mm -hmm. Because really, seriously, are you going to tell me that there's no way we can find cheap food, Kenyan food that can be delivered? Anywhere. Come on. Literally it, That's anywhere. why it didn't survive more than three yeah. months. Yes. So, and, I, and I think a lot of startups fail. But it's not just that, from not, not looking at you from a problem solution. Mm -hmm. But it's also, you know, a lot of us don't have business management skills. Um, you know, even that social science, you know, that understanding of humanities. Mm -hmm. Because you really have to understand human nature yeah. to really be good at, you know. And I think that's why I go back to what Michael Joseph called us. He understood the peculiarity of, of Kenyan, Kenyans, <laughs> you know, and that's why Safaricom is doing so well. Yeah. So it's really understanding human nature that, yeah, that... Yeah, that, that, oh. that perhaps becomes uh, a winning formula, understanding human nature, understanding society, understanding a problem, understanding the job to be done, mm -hmm. and understanding what the gaps are. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll end with where you ended uh, your talk as well, which is about data and how uh, it's, it's a benefit. It's, it's in the hands of a few right now. You, you can only use the data you have, um, and perhaps the democratization of data, and using it in a, not, in a not so extractive way, because at the end of the day, whenever I'm on social media, for example, I understand I am the product, but not many people, you know, have that understanding. And uh, tech companies are growing based off of me and a million and 10 million others like me. Yeah. But then what am I getting in return? What does that look like um, where data is a bit more democratized for uh, everybody, not just big tech? Yeah. And it's an issue we are looking at. Data governance is an issue that Mozilla has also started taking quite seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're currently developing a policy position on that, including a position in terms of how we're going to look to address, uh, you know, how we collect data. But we've always, always put privacy first, and most of our products are privacy by default. And in fact, not only that, we have a product called Lean Data Practice that is a free course uh, on Udemy that we are offering for all SMEs and all startups. Okay. Uh, it's called Lean Data Practice. Look at uh, you can find it on Udemy. Um, and what we are offering this course for SMEs, for startups, for entrepreneurs, for developers, yeah. so that it can help you as you're, as you're developing your products to understand, to collect data, only the data you need. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're not just collecting, like I gave the example of... And then you can number. sell the extra data to someone else who wants to... Yeah, know, so that you can sell it. Yeah, no, yeah. You, you have to be respectful, mm -hmm. you know. So there are several principles, you know, collecting, you know, the, the principles of, you know, collecting only want, or minim, min, minimalism, mm -hmm. collecting only what in, is needed, yes. you know, encryption, you know, and an, an anonymization as well, mm -hmm. you, know, all, you know, all of those principles are really well iterated on the Lean Data practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for some of, we are, we are, you know, partnering with the African African Union Commission, <clears throat> they have a huge project called A Thousand SMEs, mm -hmm. and we, are, we want to offer that course to as many startups and SMEs as, as possible, especially here in Kenya, because we have a data protection commissioner, yes. to help them also make sure that they're adhering to the law. Yeah. You know, so... Would you say we're at a place where, um, I, I, just from a layman's perspective, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, the EU and how protective they are of, yeah, of people's data. Yes. yes. Uh, do you think we're at a place where that could be our future? Or, uh, you know, we always play catch up with things. So it will take us as much time as it took the EU to get to a place where data protection is a priority. How long would you say we have before we get there? In, in just a, you know, in, in your opinion, your best. Yeah, no, no, we have. We don't have a long way to go. One, okay. one thing I'm, I am, uh, I'm very proud of yeah, Kenya as yes. a Kenyan. Yeah. Is we tend to be really fast when it comes, very quick when it comes to these things. Yes. Uh, and in fact, I tend to think mm -hmm. that our data protection legislation is the best. Uh, in the African continent, okay. you know, um, and we now have a data protection commissioner. I'm hoping that she's given enough resources and, and independence as well, Yes, you know, to be able to, you know, uh, to regulate this space, but also to, crea to, to create our, our startup and, and as we are working towards a single African digital market, yes. preparing our startups and SMEs to be able to to do trade across the continent, having been empowered f with our Lean Data Protection course, yes. and we have a Lean da uh, uh, Data Protection Commissioner and a very strong data protection bill, I think it will help our startups be ready mm -hmm. when, uh, the, when the AFC, AFC, the African Free Trade 
area mm -hmm. comes into force, completely comes into force. And when we create the Africa digital market, I think it will put our startups and our SMEs, you know, fast yes. when it comes to uh I hope so too. Trade. I mean, we we have been um, a leader in Africa when it yeah. comes to and we continue. To. Yeah, and we continue to be. So hopefully the trend continues. Yes. Um, I'll get a little bit more and more less formal now. First, who is your favorite artist? Who's my favorite artist? Yeah, Beyonce. Ah, Be oh, this is so perfect <laughs> because I was asking why or who your favorite Beyonce. artist is, so I could uh, could curate a question to your favorite. Uh, but the question also suggested Beyonce. Yeah. So would you rather create a super successful app or go on tour with Beyonce? Both? Can I have both? Oh, don't! It's that. Would you rather you have to? I have to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ask the question again as I'm would thinking. You, would you rather <laughs> create a super <laughs> successful app uh -huh. or go on tour with Beyonce? I would create a super successful app mm -hmm. and then go on tour with Beyonce to market it. No, but you can't do both. You're <laughs> <laughs> I see you trying to cheat my question and I will not allow it. It's the app or the tour. It's the perfect it's, thing. It's, it's, I'm, going to, I'm going to be marketing with Beyonce <laughs> of a super app. Do you think you can get her to write the app into her songs? Yes. And suddenly people are just listening and they're like, okay, oh, yeah. download on, on Play Store. Cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, for example, I really, really love the song Nikona Safari Com. Yeah. You know, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've walked okay. around. I won't, I won't let you walk around the next okay, one. Fine. Would you rather have an iPod fitted in your mind and, and listen to any music of your choice anytime or watch your dreams on television? Watch your dreams come alive on television? Both. No, no, you, uh, no, we're not taking both okay, as an we'll app. Watch my dreams <laughs> on television. Okay, um, I feel like the iPod in your mind would be very distracting. Yes. Because I think I already do have a exactly an a iPod in my mind, mind. right? Yes, yes. Um, would you rather have your brain transplanted into a robot or an animal of your choice? Animal of my choice, preferably an elephant. An sorry, an animal. Of my choice, of your choice, preferably an elephant. An elephant, because yes. they have good memory? Is that yes, where you're going Yes, extremely good memory. Yes. They are gentle and kind yes. and matriarchal. Yes, that's very true. Did you see the story <laughs> about the elephant that um, killed a lady, unfortunately? Yes. <laughs> and went back to her funeral to trample her. Yes. That's the kind of memory. That's human memory. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Would you rather um, give up your... No, let me do a different one. Would you rather surf the internet or shop till you drop? That's interesting. Hmm. Surf the internet. Yeah, I don't like shopping. If it's even ish, if it was um, online shopping, I'm not a very, f I'm not a fan of shopping. Yes. I get really bored. Yeah. I'm the type that goes, I need a pair of shoes. I go straight. Yes. yes. Do you even get like sometimes if I okay, I like this pair of shoes. Let me get it in three different colors so I don't have to think about this type of shoe uh, for a long time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love it. Um, I've enjoyed the Would You Rather session. I've enjoyed talking to you as well. Thank you so much. Thank it you. was a beautiful presentation. I think the online audience really loved um, hearing from you. So yeah. if we have any more questions, maybe we can get you again. But I know your time is very important. Thank you for Thank making you. time for us. Thank you. We will now go back on to the main stage with Mbogo and Jihia for the next session. Thank you guys for saying so, so interactive with us keep the comments coming we'll try and have some of your questions answered inside as well i'll see you and like i told you hamper and i've got 500 bob worth of airtime again if you're listening to the passport stamps the stamp for this session was the wright brothers bogwa over to you um, yeah we've cut thank you so much it was very lovely meeting can you take a picture with you sure. check check hello hello Hi guys, I'd like to call you back into the main hall. We're about to get started on the next session. Kindly take, kindly take your seats. DJ Asante Sana for those awesome beats and vibes. For this next session, we're getting into what you're calling the engineering culture, where we have six themes from Safaricom showing us essentially what, what they're made of. And if you see something you like or something that you need more explanation on, kindly, the hashtag is Safaricom Decode. We'll be able to pick it up from there. And the first, the first demo, the first live demo is application observ observabil observability. Gosh, to, to, to. Using Dynatrace. And this is by the Business Support Services Tribe led by Gideon Cargo. So this is part of the digital technology team that builds, delivers, and operates core business platforms such as billing, messaging, integration, call center, and USSD. 
The BSS stack that they're going to be looking at is the core layer to the network and helps in ensuring service provision and experience to Safaricom customers. Gideon, stage is yours. Thank you. So thank you very much. I hope I'm uh, audible. My name is Kago from uh, technology and more specifically from uh, monitoring uh, aspect. So today I'm going to take you through our application uh, monitoring. And uh, as a number of teams have talked about the different layers of applications, yesterday we heard about uh, DXL, today we have heard about uh, cloud services. And uh, from a customer perspective, we'll want to ensure that all our services that we have are properly monitored. And uh, for that case, I'll take you through one of our application tool that we use for monitoring and ensuring that our services are up and running. So, first of all, uh, in terms of application monitoring, we've got a number of tools that are out there. We've, co we've got the likes of uh, New Relics, AppDynamics, Datadog, and others. But for Safaricom, we chose Dynatrace as one of the tools that we'll use to do our monitoring. And this to ensure that the, the services that we give to our customers are top-notch and we're able to pick issues in real time. So in this particular case, maybe you can go to the next slide. In this particular case, we are going to see our customer on the far end. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's OK. You know, can OK, so. So in this particular table, we are able to see that our customer at the far end, when you're using your mobile phone, when you're accessing our portals, you're at the far end and you want to, be, to get the best quality. But you realize that these applications are supported by different services and different uh, technologies. So at the middle, we have our midware, where we have the on-prem servers, that are there that we do uh, monitor. We have our TIBCO layer, which fall under the DXL layer. We also have our OpenShift, where we, have our, we, we, we do our orchestration of our container services. And also now we have our containers. And this is the middle layer, which now talks to the lower layer. And on the lower layer, we have uh, our servers, which are on-prem. We've got some uh, of our application running on AWS. We also got others uh, that are running on Azure. And these particular services or uh, cloud is now supported at the, at the bottom layer. We have now the bare metal, we have the VMware, and we have the OpenStack. So this is what we want to monitor within one particular space. So we'll, we can go to the next step. So in our application monitoring, we want to ensure that uh, we're able, first of all, to see real user monitoring, to be able to see what our customers feeling when they use our services. What are the sessions? Are the sessions dropping? Are we having proper response time? Are we having crashes? Are we having um, uh, error rates, high error rates? Those are things that we want to look when we are, when we are checking at the real user monitoring. The other aspect we want to check at is the SmartScape. How are these services interconnected? How do they talk to each other? How do they discover each other? You have an app in your phone, but it is being run on AWS. It is still consuming some services on our team Colea. It's going further to hit our G2 for M-Pesa. How are all these interconnected? And that's now what we do with the SmartScape. The third item that is very key that we are looking at is the root cause analysis. How fast can we be able to get to the root cause of the problem? When we have issues, how fast can we get to the bottom of it and be able to fix the issue and reduce on the impact that is having on our customers? So we're able to do that root cause analysis and go up to the code level uh, errors and be able to see this is where the issue is for this particular customer. 
at this particular code level, and this is a code that is having issue, and this is a server that is having issue. So we are able to go to drill down to specific issue using the root cause analysis. The other item that we do is the synthetic monitoring. And for the synthetic monitor, we are setting up a number of uh, synthetic monitors to ensure that those endpoints are also monitored. So we pick a, an endpoint and we are able to monitor it from different locations, both within and outside the country. So we have a number of uh, monitoring centers that will now try to access that endpoint and give us the result. So basically, that's what we do as, as far as uh, the monitoring is concerned. I'll take you through uh, the demo just to, to give you a feel of uh, this particular tool that we use for application monitoring. So let me start with the M-Pesa app, for example. This is, uh, I believe all of you have the M-Pesa app with you, and we're able to monitor the customers that are accessing this particular app at any given time, even in the last five minutes. And able to see, for example, I've been able to select 30 days here. I can be able to go further to whichever time that I want. For example, if I go to, for the last two hours, I'm able to see the customers that have accessed this particular application. They're actually 119,000. I'm able to see the, the guys who have been able to have a few crashes, which is only 238 people. I'm able to see even the distribution. Where are these customers within the universe? As you realize, M-Pesa app is being accessed worldwide, especially now that we have uh, mini apps and we have even the Visa card part of it. So we have customers that are outside Kenya. We want to see how are their experiences. And in this case, I can be able to hover around and be able to see the customers in South Africa uh, who are 146. I'm able to see in DRC, in Sudan, in Russia. And whenever I change this, I can be able even to see the customer who are there for the last 24 hours in different locations. And now this gives us a feel of how is our application performing and how our customers feeling. This tool goes further to show us the customer satisfaction level. And this case is what we are calling the updex level. The updex level is how is customer satisfaction when they are using our application. And in this case, we are looking at the response time and the error rate. So we can say either the customer is satisfied, either the customer is tolerating our services, or our customer is now fully uh, frustrated. Those are the three layers. And in, particular, in this particular case, for Impress Up, we can see it is 0.92. The range is from 0 to 1, 1 being the best, and above 0 0.85, that customer we consider they are satisfied. So we also use this uh, particular tool to show the distribution, as I said, about the SmartScape. So this is the SmartScape that we have, and these are all the resources that we are monitoring with this particular tool. So we're able to see currently, we are doing 100 applications that are being monitored as we speak. Uh, these applications are supported by 20,320 services that support these 100 applications that we are monitoring. At the lower level, we have 98,000 processes that are currently running to support the 100 applications that we are seeing there. Down there, we are able to see the number of servers that we are monitoring at this particular time and their health, actually. For this particular case, you can see we have around 28 that have issues that need to be fixed. At the lower level, you can see the data centers that support these servers that we are monitoring. So the 22 data centers will support the 2,800 servers, which will support now the 96,000 processes, which now will run these services, and now application will be at the upper layer. Again, we can be able to, to pick uh, the topology sketch for a particular application and see how is that connection for that particular application. I'll take you through that. I'll pick an application. Um, for this case, we have seen the con M-Pesa consumer app. Let me pick uh, an application like uh, 
Safaricom app for example and I want to show you the, the, now the smartscape for my Safaricom app so this now the, the smartscape for the my Safaricom app we are able to see that my Safaricom app has the services that are supporting it some of them are Java, Java. We have uh, Apache, we have uh, Kafka for streaming, we have um, web services. All these now support our my Safaricom app. On the lower level, we have again the processes because each service will have the underlying processes. Down, we are able to see that for my Safaricom app, it's being supported by 63 servers or EC2 instances, and some of them are running on the cloud and some of them are on-prem. So we're able to see maybe from the, the ones that are running on the cloud, we've got a uh, West one, and we've got a West one B. So that's where our application are running. So this cannot be achieved without having a proper monitoring tool. Because essentially, before you could have the application being monitored from a different place, maybe Firebase, we have services being monitored by other tools. We have servers being monitored by another tool. We have uh, data centers maybe being monitored by another tool. And that brought a lot of disconnect. And our service operation team were having a hard time to pin, up, pin out where the problem is. So with this, we're able to ensure that we give the best service and we're able to, to see the correlation of the different services. I'll also take you through uh, the part for the synthetic monitors. So we have been, been able to set up around 256 synthetic monitors on different locations. So for example, we have Dubi, which is being monitored from two locations. We have uh, all this and we're able to see the availability. We're able to see uh, the response that we are getting from those particular uh, endpoints. So I just want to pick one that at least has more than one uh, monitoring location. You can pick this one. So if you look at, for example, one of the applications, which is the bill manager, we're able to say, we want to see if our customer is outside Kenya, is he having good experience? So we have a monitoring center at Abu Dhabi. We have another one in Joburg. And now we have our own on-prem servers. So all these servers will try to call this particular endpoint at a given interval. In this particular case, we are doing at every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, we, to, we want to see, is this application up? So this is what we are using for synthetic monitors, just to ensure that our customers who are outside Kenya, still they are getting the best quality. The other aspect that I want to take you through is uh, about the SLOs. Now, this is where we bring the business into our monitoring because the business understands the language of service level objectives. So for most of our applications, we have put a service level objective. And we are saying for this particular application, this particular service, we want it to have these SLOs. And we ask ourselves, are we meeting this SLO at each and every time? So for this particular case, we'll have uh, the SLOs for my Safaricom app, SLOs for M-Pesa, SLO for other front-end applications, and we're able to see the ones that we are not meeting. For example, in this particular case, we are seeing for chatbot uh, uh, services, we have put ourselves at a target of 95%. We are doing 93. So we already have a gap of around one point something. So that's the error budget that we have. But for most of other services, we are meeting those particular uh, objectives. I'll also take you through now for the root cause analysis. How do we do our root cause analysis? In this particular case, uh, allow me to, to work with you in this. I've picked uh, one problem. And uh, in this particular problem, we're able to see that the customers, the service that is impacted is the post pay, and uh, it's still being worked on. Another one that has already cleared, we had a problem with uh, device financing 
for a, sh a very short stint. And we were able to go to the code level and be able to see that for this particular problem that occurred at this particular time, the problem was a, a HTTP 500 error, of course that's the server side error, and we were able to pick that this is the endpoint that has the issue. What this does is that our SOC team is able to see exactly where the problem is. And if it's to fix it, when they call the support team, they tell them exactly that the problem is error 500 on this particular server. Even if it manifested itself from an application perspective, our SOC team is able to give it and tell the support team exactly where the problem is. So I want to take you through. Um, this is where we see the, the problems. We are able to analyze the problem here. So currently we have 89 issues. And uh, this 89 issue, MacQ, is for the 92,000 processes or servers, uh, services that we are seeing, the 2,000 servers that we are seeing, all the data centers. So out of that, only 89 issues are open as we speak. And uh, these are C4 information. So, but if you look at what has been closed, there are quite many. Uh, so far for the last... Uh, For the last two hours, uh, we've been able to close uh, 22 issues, and uh, only the ones that are open are 93. And this is because it's real time. Some of it has actually occurred 11:18, and currently I think we are at 11:19. So one minute ago, two minutes ago. So it's real time. We're able to see exactly where the issue is. On this particular case, we're able to see that this particular server. Sorry. So as, as they fix, let, let me just uh, conclude. We are able to see within the DIT ecosystem how many issues are there. We are able to categorize them based, based on the different uh, stakeholders that are supposed to solve those problems. And the way we do this, we do through what we are calling tagging. And I believe in the first, in the initial session, uh, Ronald to took you through our DevSecOps and the importance of tagging. Because it's these tags that will now come to our monitoring tool. And you're able to say, categorize these teams in different sections. And you're able to filter out the problems per team. So you're able to say, for, for this particular period, we have uh, maybe financial services have two issues. We have uh, digital engineering have this number of issues. And you're able to categorize them based on the management zone. So I wanted to show you about the management zone. Thank you. So th this is a problem that we just clicked. And uh, we're able to see the issues on our CPU saturation. And now the team can pick this one. And actually, it has occurred only three minutes ago. Meaning, uh, being able to pick this issue real time and pushing it to the support team, we reduce the time uh, to recover. And one thing also that we are doing with this particular tool is uh, we are doing what we, we are calling auto-remediation, whereby whenever an issue comes, we are able to trigger a recovery. If it's something that we know for this particular issue, this is how we solve it. So we have a script using now the other DevSecOps tools, as you had, and one of the tools that we are using is Ansible, now to do the auto-remediation. So some of it will be fixed automatically whenever they come up. The last part I wanted to take the team through is on uh, user sessions. Uh. 
So for the user sessions, we are able to see all our customers that are using our services and how they are feeling. And in this particular case, these are the customers for the last uh, two hours, we've had around 638,000 customers using our applications. We can be able to go further and uh, filter based on the different applications. I can filter based on M-Pesa. So we've got around 391 customers that have used our application for the last two hours. Uh, what we are doing, we hash uh, these uh, users so that we don't have personally identifiable data going to our applications. So you won't find uh, like my name here or your number here because we have to hash them for privacy purposes. So in this particular case, this is a, a real customer that is using our application and this customer is live. So we can pick one. I, I'll, I'll wish to pick the one that has a, a few errors so that we're able to narrow down to it. If I pick a customer like uh, this one, we're able to see the status of that particular customer, where the customer is located, the kind of phone that the customer is using, is this customer frustrated, and uh, the kind of device that he's using, the kind of browser that he's using. So you can go further to that particular session and drill down further. Now for this particular case, you're able to see the IP address, the application version that the customer is using, the Android version, and whether even the, the, the phone is on a, a portrait or a landscape. Then we're able to see where was the pain point for this particular customer. So I've picked the one that is uh, very frustrated. So we pick, he has got uh, nine issues. We can now filter down and do now the analysis for this particular customer. And where we have the issue with this customer is uh, on the token generation at the network layer. And uh, if you go further, you're able to see there's the Java unknown error. So you're able to go at the code level and see where this error is coming from. And for this particular case, just a step back. I've seen that for that particular customer, he was using a mini app because this is a mini app uh, at just.com and this is where the error was coming from. So if you are now to engage you as the developer, you have developed your application, you have put it on our mini app, and now we have issues with the application. You can be able to pick it and tell you the application that you are running on our mini app has these and these issues. So you're able to pick at the code layer and tell you at the Java level, this is where you're having the issue. So that's how deep we are going to ensure that we serve our customers, we give them the best, best in class services. So I think uh, I'll stop there. And um, just to give our customers the confidence that we are looking at the customer service, we are looking to ensure that they get the best service and we are supporting our developers. So when you come and develop and you give us your mini apps, we are able to go deeper and also work and collaborate with you, even in fixing the issue that you are facing. So thank you very much. As I said earlier, my name is Kago and I'm pleased to have you guys. Now, th this is what you're talking about, Sindio. Safaricom Engineering Summit. I think fantastic um, showcase from, uh, from Cargo and, and, the, and the larger team behind the scenes. At least now we get to see their tools. There are many tools, like you mentioned earlier, but this particular one was on um, using Dynatrace. And I think it's fantastic to see that there's actual work that goes on behind the scenes. Okay, and it's being worked on. It's being what? It's being worked on. And there's a lot... There's a dashboard. Dear customer, we know you, but we don't know you. It's anony anonymized. <laughs> One way hashed. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think it, uh, th thank you for that thank excellent you. showcase. Another round of applause for Cargo and his team. <laughs> now we're going to another team. And this is the Digital Services Tribe. And this tribe consists of business and tech members who develop digital content products and services. And they're going to be showcasing 
bass, video, and music. Karibu. Mason. <laughs> I'm a product manager for video, a product owner for Digital Content Squad. Um, and as a Digital Content Squad, we are responsible for designing and taking to market dig digital content propositions in music, gaming, video. And today we are here to talk about BASE, but before we do that, I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. So, my name is Wycliffe Kikoke, commonly known as Kobe. Yeah, I'm a content and bus delivery lead and also a solutions architect. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Felix Mene. I'm the tribe tech lead uh, for this tribe. Uh, glad to have you all here. So um, as we listen in, we'll be looking forward to listen to a bit more um, feedback from your team, either uh, through questions or through feedback that you'll send uh, on Twitter or uh, other portals. Karibuni. Okay, I'd request that you put our slides and videos up. Thank you. Okay, so as you all know, the smartphone revolution has changed how we live our lives today, from how we consume content, to how we learn, to how we communicate with each other, and to how we consume content in general. So, um, the growth of smartphones is what has led, or rather created or necessitated the need for us to create a product by the name Baze. And Baze is an entertainment platform for both music and video. Sure, how to cue the next slide. Is there? Is this this? Oh, yeah. Okay. So what Baze does, it places entertainment at your fingertips, meaning you can watch content anywhere, anytime on your mobile phone. So what value, we pro what value do, we pro we, do we provide to our customers? We have delivered a wide variety of content on um, the mobile phone. So we ensure that uh, on base you have access to all types of content that you'd want access to. So if you think about um, drama, uh, comedy, uh, music, you have all that available on base video. On base music, we've also ensured that we've curated um, a lot of content. So you'd find podcasts, you'll find vernacular music, you'll find um, audio books um, as well. The other key proposition around Bayes is the fact that there are no ad interruptions. So you'd ask yourself why position, why, why is Safaricom coming up with a platform, yet we have YouTube. For us, we want to ensure that customers can access content and enjoy content without interruption. So with base, there are no interruptions. Then the other key proposition we have is, of course, affordable subscription. So with our content platform, you can access, we make sure that any Kenyan um, can access this content on their mobile phones for as low as 10 shillings per day. We also have two variations, uh, flexible packages. A user has the option to buy a uh, product on one-off, they can also buy a product on auto renew. There's the option to pay via airtime and M-Pesa. So just ensuring that we democratize access to content. So what cool features do we have on base? It's based off HTML5 uh, technology, meaning if you have a basic smartphone, you can access this content. You don't need to have a smartphone that has a lot of memory space in order to, to watch uh, content on base. We have something called picture-in-picture -picture functionality, meaning you can multitask when you're watching content on base. We have a Chromecast feature. You can uh, display base on your TV so that you get that lean back experience. And we've also ensured that the quality is pretty high. It's the same quality you'd find on YouTube um, and, and Netflix. So we ensure that we give you the best viewing experience. 
On Bayes, we've tried to curate exclusive content, not found anywhere else. So if you go to Bayes, you'll find content that's unique, fresh, and never been seen before. Then the last thing that we pride ourselves, something we developed recently, is that we've improved on the search function, meaning if you go in and search your favorite pastor, Pastor Ward, um, he'll actually show up as, as content. Uh, for bass music, again, you get to stream or listen to music in HD quality. Um, we have the option for you to try with a seven-day free trial with 500 MBs so that, you know, um, it's easy for you to adopt the product. As I mentioned before, we have podcasts um, and audiobooks, and of course, the, the fact that we have a wide array of local and international content. So our key selling feature is that, that there are no interruptions on, on base. You get to access uh, very good quality local content, and um, you get to stream this or listen to this in, in good quality. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to play the video. We wanted to show you how to access the service. Um, but the demo itself is actually on a mobile phone. So if you dial star 44, star 55 hash, you'll be able to access uh, the product and actually experience it um, on your mobile phone. Thank you. So I'll hand over to Kogi. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, I'm going to speak about the underlying architecture and the technology stack uh, that has uh, enabled BASE as of now. And uh, before I do that, uh, maybe we can participate. We don't have a presentation on uh, the actual um, service, uh, as you can see, but uh, anyone can, can try BASE. You can go to safaricom.com. So to safaricom.com, then you go to discover, then you go to video, and, and then you can purchase base, and you'll be re redirected to base.co.ke. You can also start your journey from USSD, that is star 544, uh, and then you can purchase the bundle, get a message, and then you can redirect yourself to base. But you can also start from base.co.ke, and base is uh, uh, with a Z, not S. And then you can uh, get a subscription and uh, also enjoy the content there. So, um, so I'm going to start uh, with uh, the layers uh, in which the application lies. So we have uh, five layers. So we have the pre presentation layer, which is actually what you're seeing on base. That is from base.com, the HTML rendered page. That's a presentation layer. Um, from that page or from that particular area, you can um, access the content, get subscriptions, uh, and be able to also enjoy either music or video. Um, with that, um, uh, as you are doing that, we have um, uh, to communicate to our backend uh, services. And to communicate to our backend services, uh, we have uh, another layer, which is uh, the gateway. At the moment, we are using uh, RPG as our gateway uh, to pass all the transactions and requests from your service, from your mobile phone. And uh, RPG routes the request to our uh, logical layer. Our logical layer is built on a TIPCO stack, which uh, we are also migrating to a digital experience layer. This is a specifically uh, an acronym from Safaricom called DXL, where we place our uh, uh, logical layer, making decisions on uh, exactly the scenarios that you get uh, or uh, what you're trying to, to access within base. The uh, uh, digital experience layer then uh, routes the requests. For example, if you are doing a purchase on, uh, on base, it routes the request to the integration layer. We have an integration tool. This is an enterprise service bus uh, called TIPCO, in which this is the only uh, layer that can actually communicate to our core systems like billing system, M-Pesa, 
and all that. This is to ensure abstraction uh, from um, the implementation of the actual billing system from the implementation of the actual service. So um, TIPCO as our service, um, enterprise service bus uh, enables that particular um, uh, implementation. So um, I also want to speak on uh, the managed service. So what we have done is, uh, this is kind of a hybrid between Safaricom and one of our partners. So um, BASE is a managed serv service from a different partner. And then uh, with Safaricom, we provide um, the billing aspect uh, for BASE. And then together, we integrate the two systems. So uh, speaking on uh, the managed service itself, what you are accessing on your phone. Uh, this is built on uh, Google Cloud Platform. So uh, uh, all the architecture is based on Google Cloud Platform, whereby uh, we use uh, several technologies on Google Cloud Platform, including uh, Google Buckets, uh, Redis for caching. We use uh, some CloudFront uh, edge uh, 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 for, for content delivery, and also uh, we ensure that we have uh, different uh, availability zones within um, the architecture. So um, I will also want to speak about some of the future plans we have. So currently, if you look at PACE, how it is architected, it looks like two different systems when you move from BASE to safaricom.com and then from safaricom.com to BASE. So what we're doing is uh, we're ensuring the user experience is better, and that's why we have it here, so that we can continue to build a product that is actually um, favorable to our customers. So if you actually go to base.co.ke and start a journey from there, you'll be required. And then after you log in, if you do not have a subscription, you will go back to, uh, you'll be redirect to safaricom.com, where you'll get your subscription, and when you are directed back to base, unfortunately for now, you are required to log in again. So we have other technologies that we want to utilize to ensure that um, the experience that a customer is getting on base is exactly the same experience you are getting on safaricom.com. And the seamless between base and safaricom.com is not uh, clearly seen uh, from a customer perspective. So some of the uh, technology stacks that we have, we have um, something called head enrichment. So head enrichment is a technology where we can actually uh, identify customer and uh, uh, be able to get your MSSDN without you providing your MSSDN. So with this, it means if you're on base, if you're on safaricom.com or any other safaricom provided platform, you'll be able to be identified and not asked uh, your identity when you are, you are accessing those sites. We have also uh, been focusing so much on the actual customer experience, the latencies of uh, our applications, and uh, generally how uh, the, the customer uh, uh, starts getting, getting the product and all the way from uh, actually consuming product. So um, up to there, I'll, I'll let our lead pick from there. Yeah, uh, thank you, Wycliffe. Uh, thank you, Ida. Um, as you've heard, at this base, we are only beginning. We were able to do this with only about, was it four or five guys? A partnership with, uh, with Mobi Media. Yes. But there's uh, much more coming. So we'll be doing quite a bit more as we get into this year uh, within the video, music, and the gaming area. Uh, so we have a full team that we're working with. We have also our partners, uh, AWS, coming on board. So our call to the team, or to the community, is that we need you guys to partner with us. Uh, I believe we have a good number of rich skills or rich uh, knowledge within uh, our base, and we want to tap into, into all of this particular um, uh, rich knowledge. So we'll be requesting that you plug into this. We need to be part of uh, this community in terms of building the content business uh, for Safaricom and for Kenya. Uh, feel free to join the community, feel free to be able to reach out to me or Kogi or Aida or any of the champion leads who are here so that you can be able to participate. Um, we believe the future in terms of how we are our business, not only in terms of voice or data, but a very big bit that talks about content 
and lifestyle. And what we are doing at Safaricom in this area is to bring you the lifestyle that will pump up your life. So feel free to join us, feel free to connect, feel free to share your ideas, and we'll be very able and willing to listen to you guys. So thank you all for listening to us. I'll call back the MC in case of uh, any questions that uh, he might have for us or for the audience. Thank you. Asante Sana. I love that the, this presentation showed the diversity of teams at Safaricom. And, and I think it's great to see, at least you see the previous one was very, very technical. <laughs> I mean, it was insightful because there are dashboards and most of you could see colors and therefore you figure things are moving. <laughs> but now this guy showed you how you connect both the tech and the business because in as much as Safaricom offers connectivity, I think anytime you look at uh, an engineering challenge, I always say you must connect it to the business outcomes. And the business outcome here is most people want connectivity for, for free, mm. but then they're willing to pay for the stuff that actually moves, moves on to there. So another round of applause to the uh, base team as they exit the stage. So, and I'd like to give you a reminder on the Mozilla, on the Mozilla coding challenge. So Common Voice is a crowdsourcing project by, by Team Mozilla to create a free database for speech recognition software. And this project is supported by volunteers such as yourselves who record sample sentences with a microphone and also review what has been submitted, submitted by others. So Mozilla is inviting the Safaricom engineering community to help train the dataset in local languages, especially Kiswahili. And there are prizes for this, so, and the individual prizes. First prize will be 50K, second prize will be 30K, and the third prize will be 20K. Submissions close today at 3 p.m. And a link was shared yesterday by Kathleen Simiu from, uh, from Mozilla. And is it on, st on screen? No. It will be pinned on the YouTube uh, comment section and also shared on Twitter with the hashtag SafariComDecode. So go, if you haven't yet um, you know, signed up, check out the socials, make sure you participate, and let's help build out this, um, this data set that will open up lots more opportunities. Next on stage, we're going to be looking at a demo by the business support VAS services team that builds, delivers, and operates on value-added services. VAS means value-added services. Um, so on VAS core products and services. This is with AI-driven operations. I'd love to welcome on stage Joshua and Emmanuel. Karibuni. Where is the cutting? Dark. Green in your gun? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Afternoon in Mefika? No. Hey, bado, bado. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, so um, thank you, uh, Bugwa, for that introduction. So we are going to showcase um, a bit of AI um, on what we are doing from the BSS team. Uh, BSS stands for Business uh, Support Systems, uh, uh, which support uh, our core services that integrate to the application services. So what we are trying to show is how we are using machine learning uh, to reduce MTTR. MTTR is mean time to recover. I know tech is like using acronyms, but MTTR just stands for mean time to recover, and MTTD means mean time to detect. Um, so this is when things go wrong, how do we find out uh, if something has gone wrong, and how quickly do we restore it? I know uh, Dynatrace has shown a bit of that, but this is just expanding on um, and on a more particular subset of services, how we've used um, AI to be able to do that. Okay. Can go, can go to next. Okay. So in terms of um, the statement or what we're trying to resolve, um, these are critical services. I'm sure most of us here have used 544, uh, 444, and uh, in terms of uh, availability, these services must be really at 99.999. And uh, that's why in terms of detection um, and experience for our customers, we must be able to provide that uh, required uh, availability ratio as well as reliability. Uh, in case something goes wrong, we are also, we also uh, able to detect that 
send notifications and alert our service availability teams as, as, as well as our monitoring teams. And in some cases, we are, we, we are able to restore automatically um, our AI solution can be able to point what needs to be done or uh, auto-recover. Um, because of the scale of the services that we offer, uh, that's why we are using machine learning to be able to improve on this particular um, availability uh, ratio. And um, what, we are going, what we are using are just um, learning algorithms. We are actually using supervised learning algorithms that uh, we keep testing for the coders who are here and uh, we are able to improve on a continuous basis so that um, the algorithms get better day by day. So my colleague here will just touch on the stack that we have deployed for, e for this and then just showcase a small demo on the same. Good morning. I'm Emmanuel. And I'll be, I'll be working you through the stack. So basically for you to be able to 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 learn from some data, you first need to identify the data. And we start with identifying what kind of data you're using. And with the current error, there are a lot of data which is being generated. So you, you need to identify the source of the data. It can be logs, it can be from databases, it can be from the system. So after you identify the data, now you need to at least pre-process the data or prepare this data for machine learning. So we get our logs, mostly they are raw logs, which, which is unstructured data, and you need to model it to, a, to some data which can be fed to our machine learning model. So we use Python, Perl, and Go just to do the pre-processing because of the high concurrency of those languages, because they are able to process a lot of data. So we use Go, Perl, and Python for pre-processing. As I've said, this data is usually a, a lot of data, commonly called big data. So we, you, you need to, to choose a database which will be able to handle this high traffic data. So for our case, we use Elasticsearch for the storage of the pre-processed pre data. You can also choose to use Cassandra, Mongo, but for us, we want to use Elasticsearch for storage. After we are able now to store this data on our data lake, which is Elasticsearch, now this data is pulled by our model, machine learning, which is able now to analyze this data, compare it with the, with the previous data, and able now to, to detect any anomaly. So if we have any degradation, so the module, is the, the module will automatically detect and send an alert. The alerts are sent through SMPP. SMPP is a protocol for messaging, for messaging where you are able to bind to SMSC. SMSC is the, is the system which is able to deliver a message to, the, to your number. So we use SMPP protocol for that, or SMTP, where we just send an email to the support engineers, and they are able now to restore quickly. The system is also able to, to, to automatically restore, but for those cases which it's unable to restore, we send, an, we, we send the alerts to the relevant engineer. We also have the dashboards, which we host using the Apache, which, which, which our NOC team use for monitoring and also alert in case the issue is not picked. So these are sample alerts, you can see on the right, those are, those are SMS alerts for some of our services. That's M-Pesa overdraft that should be for Lisa. Also here you can see a sample alert with the different scores. So on that you are able to see we have a score for the responses, the request, the response time. So all these are, our, are the different fields which we use for the machine learning and we are able now to detect which exactly where is the issue. Is the, has the response spiked? or is, it, is there a dip in success rate, then now with this, you are also able now to generate an RCA where you are able now to get the exact issue and then you can quickly resolve even before the customer realizes that there is an issue. So these are some of the, some of the ongoing projects. 
So we, ca we, we are having a model which is also doing uh, check-in spamming. At times you get, you get spammed maybe by, by the sender name, partners. Eh? You get maybe some, some spamming, maybe it's a system which has behaved. So we are also doing monitoring where we are able now to, to check the frequency of the SMS sent to, to, to subscribers number. And, and, and from, the, from the pattern we identify, we are able to identify if, this, if the sender name is spammy, and if it's spammy, we put it a candidate of spammy, then we, we are able, it's now able been, been able to be reviewed and necessary action taken. So I'll take you through a demo, briefly just to show you, just show you the, the dashboards. So we give it some few seconds for the platform to come up. So these are some of the alerts. And from, from here, you are able now to, from the from NOC, they can do monitoring now from this platform. So on the far left, you can see we have the service or the connector. Then we have the status where we are able to see whether the service is OK. Then now on, the, on the, that column, we have the description where we are able now to get the different responses or the, the different output for our, our model. So you can see like for that, for that test bed whitelist service, we are having a spike on the responses and with, with a scope 0 0.4. We can also see the number of requests debugged, the, the spike in request, the response time. So we have all this data. We can also see the start time for this particular issue and the duration it has taken. The same alert has also been sent through the different channels I've showed on the previous slide where we were able to see the the SMS and email alert. So this has already been picked and we can get an heat map of how this particular service has been behaving. So here, we have a graph. The green means the service is okay. The gray ones, that's the time, the, the time we are yet to get the analytics for that because we are, we are yet to get at 12. So the yellow one, we had some issues which was automatically recovered by the, 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 the machine learning model, model. So from here, you just have a brief history of how the service is running. So for, 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 for those systems which takes longer, longer than 20 minutes, we are able also to get an RCA automatically generated by the machine learning model, which can be reviewed by the necessary team. Root cause analysis. Yeah, so RCA means root cause analysis. So we are able to see what was the particular issue with this particular service and necessary action to prevent the occurrence in the future is taken, depending on the RCA, which is automatically generated. Also, we can download the output for this particular service. 
So you are able to download the, the history and also the, the data which is used to, to, to do the predictions and also the, these, different, these different parameters which, which has caused the alert. So here we are also able now to monitor the different services we use for this modeling. So as I said, we use Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a NoSQL database which is capable of handling high traffic. So we have a cluster which has five nodes and we are, also, we are able to see all the nodes are alive. We also use Logstash. Logstash is also another tool which you use for, for, for passing the log. Eh? So this in combination with Python and Go, we are able now to pass the data. So Logstash is just a passing, passing, passing tool which ingests the data now to elastic nodes. We can see also our model server is alive and we can also see the different, the, 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 the last time the, the, this, this data was updated. Here, we are able to see now profile of all our services, the different services we monitor. We can see the, the, the predicted success rate for this particular service or the expected success rate. So any deviation from this, an alert is automatically sent. So yeah, we can also have the different weekly pattern of how the service has been. So here you are able now to see the, the pattern for this particular service. So any deviation from the expected pattern, an alert is automatically sent by the alerting tool and the monitoring tool. Yeah, I think that's all. Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. So, yeah, so that's... Um we wanted to keep it brief, uh, just to showcase how we're using AI. Maybe if there's any question, we can take, but um, that's, that's it. <clears throat> Thank you, Joshua and Emmanuel. I think, again, very practical, very practical applications for machine learning. When I see two Leonasema, Tafanya machine learning, we are building models Again, straight line to, to the business, um, straight line to the business case. And like we said, also because of time and just to keep people uh, engaged, because I'm sure the questions from both uh, the online audience and also here may be many, we're asking them to go onto the socials using the hashtag Safaricom Decode. Please ask your questions there. And the teams are looking through those comments and, and that feedback, and they'll be able to respond to you, uh, to you directly. So another round of applause for Joshua and Emmanuel as they leave stage. The next presentation is on DevOps by the team that do pipeline for automation and software delivery within Safaricom, looking at continuous improvement and delivery frameworks. Peter Kiptanui, stage is yours. Karibu. <coughs> ah, sorry. Hi. Ah, yeah, how are you? Hello, to present to you. So, my name is Peter Kiptanui. I'm from DevSecOps, and I'll have my team with me here. Uh, my name is Keith Nzagi from DevSecOps. Josh. And uh, my name is Peter Kimeli from uh, DevSecOps uh, yeah. team. I'm Nixon Kipkorin from DevSecOps. And as we had introduced team. yesterday, yes. we've all seen how DevOps can be a very key enabler to At least a know. software factory, to anything that we're building as software engineers. And one of the key things that DevSecOps or Dev DevOps in, in generally advise us is we need to shift some of the items that used to be that used to be silos. One of it is shifting test to the left. And by shifting test to the left, one of the key tools that we've always been using to test the quality checks of our code has been Sonacube. But with Sonacube in place, there's been a bit of some anti-patents among us or how we implement most of a, especially when doing our continuous integration. We've always have many slave nodes of Jenkins, 
but only one specific SonarCube instance running. And that has always resulted to a longer queues, which at the end of the day, you find that you're going to have more queues, and therefore the, release, the developer release time to a specific environment would be more. And for today, our demo will want to show us how we can, ha how we can sort that specific anti-pattern to, to running SonarCube as part of a Marvin build job. And that's what you're going to be seeing even we're going to be showing us here. Yes, so for our implementation today, we will be using Terraform, uh, which is an infrastructure as code tool. I believe George presented uh, the same using a Jenkins pipeline. So we'll be doing it a bit manual. Uh, and for our case, what we'll be doing, we will be provisioning a VPC that will contain two subnets. And, uh, Elastic load balancer as well as an internet gateway. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, so with a well uh, architecture, uh, this is how uh, with a well architecture AWS uh, SQS setup. This is how uh, we recommend a SQS queue uh, setup on the uh, based on the AWS EC2 uh, auto scaling. So let me pass it to uh, Peter to introduce on us on how we are going to use serverless uh, setup to uh, auto scale uh, SonarCube, SonarCube setup. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So just notice that I have to delete two files before I start. <laughs> um, and then my key. Yeah, because I, I want to generate new keys. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So let me just close this tab here. So we are going to do uh, two things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to provision the infra and then we also have some serverless components. So for the infra, we're going to use Terraform. So the first thing that I have to do, I have to create a key so that Terraform can actually use it to run commands within, within, within the instances that it will provision. So I think the first thing I'll do is create, uh, create that key. And the path in which I'm going to do the... Um, To, to generate the key at is here. So now I won't pass any uh, any process. So now that we have that, we can actually just validate our um, our 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 Terraform if, if the state is, is good. And so just give it a bit of a, some seconds just to validate so it's a success. And then we can do the Terraform plan um, as a step. And then it will check and then create that state for us. And then um, once, once, once we're satisfied with the, with the plan, then we will do the Terraform deploy. So just a bit of a second. Um, yeah, so now it tells us that it's going to create 21 and, and change zero and then destroy zero as well. So after that, we're going to do Terraform apply. So as it does that, there's just like a stage that it has to ask me, do you really want to do that, uh, to, to deploy this plan? Uh, so it's like a make a checker, if, if, like just so that, are you sure, sure that you really want to do this? So while it does that, uh, maybe I can indulge us a bit in terms of what are we doing at this particular step. So as it's seen in the initial slide, actually this is for the serverless component, but as what we're going to do is, as we're going to see in that plan, we're going to, to be provisioning the VPC, and in the VPC create two subnets, uh, one that is private and, and the other one that is public, and then we're going to deploy our workloads in the public subnet for this case. So now I can just tell it, proceed with that. So once we have the VPC and the subnet inside of it, we're going to create, um, we're going to create also a route table and then associate the route table with the subnets as uh, uh, just to ensure that we are also getting communication from the internet using the internet uh, gateway. But so this one is going to take a, a, a bit of, of time as it does that. So probably maybe Nixon, you can indulge us in terms of like what, in, in terms of that um, anti-pattern, sort of like you're speaking about the queues. So maybe you can indulge us in, in terms of how that can affect the, release, the developer's lead time to release. Yeah. Mm. So when it comes to DevOps or DevSecOps, the key metrics that we have to follow would always be one of the four metrics that we follow in DevSecOps is uh, deployment frequency, uh, time, uh, lead time between the time of code commit all the way to a specific environment. And when you find out that, in a, in a, so in, that means that in every step that we have to go, be it continuous integration, continuous deployment, 
uh, it has to be a very short period of time so that we can be able to achieve those specific matrices. And if you, in a, in a case where by most the anti-pattern has been, you have one Jenkins with several slaves, and we always, we always find that in some build stages, one of it being called JEX, or when you are doing some security, when you are doing some quality scans, you'll find that if one specific stage takes longer time, regardless of the slaves that you have, the nodes that you have, you'll still have to wait a similar time. And what we came to think about is, instead of running SonarCube as an instance of itself, because if it is within a given stage, it will still take more time since it is... So think of... Um, let's bring it this way. Uh, with SonarCube being... Because SonarCube is going to be one of the stages in our continuous integration, if it takes more time, it's still, regardless of the slaves you have, it, it, it will still um, impact our lead time or release time. And therefore, with our case here, we are running SonarCube as, as, a, as, a, build, as a build instance which can auto-scale depending on the demand. And in this case, we are, it's, a, it's a pattern that we, ran, we run SonarCube as one of the build stages instead of having on its own specific environment. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. So with the inference code Terraform, which had been introduced earlier, that is what is helping us to provision the environment to set up those specific instances and then achieve the pattern. The, the inf the, we've seen the architecture diagram that we have there. That's what we're trying to achieve by doing this. Yes, and also I think there's also the, the, the element of cost. So you had Rono speak of in the cloud, we also have to manage our costs. So the good thing with the auto-scaling uh, 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 group is that, as is mentioned, so when the demand is high, so for example, maybe it's a day where guys are doing a lot of deployments, you can provision for many instances of Sona, and then it will shrink, it will scale in when there are no major uh, deployments, for example, in that particular night or, or day. But another thing to mention is that, so right now, this, the reports are stored in a Postgres server, which we've provisioned, and the SonarCube instances, when they boot, they will connect to that particular um, Postgres MySQL. So right now, yeah. it's still creating the AWS or table uh, in the public, in the, in the public uh, subnet. So just a bit of time. And then, so also another thing to mention, there's an ELB that is being created, and it's actually one of the outputs that we have. So we're going to get the, 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 uh, the, EL, the ELB uh, URL, public URL. Yeah, so you can see I have a, I have a security police for, for Spring Boot. So inside these images, we have a golden image for the sauna itself. So inside the images, what we're doing is we... Um, we, we, we have, we have a, a, a Spring Boot application that is an SQS consumer. Mm -hmm. So the way in which, uh, and I'll speak of, of this architecture as, as we continue to build so that you understand what is happening. So in the Sona stage, what we'll be doing, we will be passing, we'll be passing that message to the SQS to be queued there. And then, and then we have a job that checks, checks, checks the SQS, what is the length of the messages we have there, and then it computes the number of instances we have in our auto-scaling group. And then it returns that metric to the CloudWatch, and then CloudWatch will take this, depending on the latencies that you have predefined, it will trigger an alarm for it to scale out or scale in, depending on the ratio that you have in terms of the length, or which is the, the, the jobs that are in the queue, vis-a-vis -vis the instances that are already provisioned. So it is taking a bit of time, but I think it's about two. Let's just give it a few seconds. But the ELB is being created now. I think that's one of the last things to be created. So if you see the Terra ELB, it should be okay. So the launch configuration, the workers are still being created. So just a bit of time. It's taking, I don't know, it's taking a lot of time. Maybe there's a lot of workloads in that particular place. So um, let me also speak of now the, the second stage to my, to my uh deployment plan is the serverless framework. So yes, we have used um, Terraform, and Terraform is actually good for infra-infra, like we're talking about VMs and stuff like that. But then AWS also is heavy on, on inf uh, of serverless uh, frameworks, uh, of serverless components. For example, your SQS is a, is a serverless uh, component. For example, your um, SNS, uh, those kind of items. So in this case, if you see that diagram, so for the things like, for example, the Lambda functions, I'm creating them using the, the serverless framework. Um, I, uh, so yeah, so we have, we have, the, we have the two um, Lambda functions that we're going to provision using there. The, um, the serverless framework itself. So it's a, it's a node application. You, have, you can get it on the repo. And then you initialize that project. And then you can do your deployment. It's just like Terraform, but now specifically for, for the serverless components. I don't know why this thing is taking too much time. Um, but let's just give it a bit, of, a bit more time. So it's saying it's 1 minute 50. 
So I think by one minute, by two minutes, that it should be, it should be, it should be done. Um, Talk about the reports. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so wait for this to finish up the setup. If there is any question, you can air it out, especially on the diagram bit and any other suggestion that we could have on that. So uh, the process that we are waiting for to be completed would always be a one-time item. So it's not something that you always be doing. Once, this, this, once we've implemented this specific uh, detector, you will not have to do it over and over again. Because anyway, it is infra as code. We can always build it anytime. But we were expecting that it should happen within three minutes. Three minutes. But it seems it's taken a, quite a bit of time. Yeah, it's, it's saying two, two minutes, 40, 40 seconds. So also, the, good, the, beauty with, the beauty with implementing it in infrastructure as code, like using Terraform, for instance, is the ability to recreate this. Should, should it be found like it's a golden way of implementing your Sona Cube, you can actually recreate this by just doing the, 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 the Terraform uh, plan and then apply. And then if you want to destroy it again, you can also always destroy it. So it is sort of like a, a good thing to have the state of your infrastructure being maintained being maintained in code as well i think that i think in the developer community also there's a challenge in terms of how do we how do we put our lambda functions in code as opposed to just going to the console and then editing your js file there and then uh, deploying it on 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 lambda on the lambda functions so if you have the um, the, the, the serverless framework, you are at least able to just do a git push and then you can have these uh, particular uh, stages run to provision those, part those particular serverless components. Um, I don't know what's happening. Maybe the US is too today is busy or what, man? Like it's taking forever to provision these things. So let's give it like, say, a minute. We see, complete. I don't, I don't think we're going to go to the serverless one, but just a bit of time. Maybe we can. So if there's any specific comment about this, maybe if someone you can share and then we can be able to answer. It's on cloud. It's already doing it on cloud. Yeah. If it's cold. We still have a minute to go, so let's just hope it will finish before our time is, is spent. But maybe we can just we can just look at what has been provisioned so far. Um, is a question? Yes. Uh, my name is Daniel Geshure. Okay, I want to ask, like, for identity access management, how is it handled in such a platform? I am like how to be able to access the the crowd the aws how do you oh. in such a setup when you are using teleform yeah. to 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 be able to provision your 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 services on for example now you are you are provisioning a, a virtual private network yeah so how do you first because you have to first uh, be able to be authenticated to be able okay to okay sorry yeah so you, you, you yes I, I i get your point so how do you so when whatever whatever is happening here you already have uh pre-configured your your credentials yes you're right so we have the api keys the key, the secret and the key id that we already set up i can't expose it on the demo though yeah thank you thank you for that question uh, i think i think we're suffering data network issues or what but um we haven't complete let me see so it's still running but i'm seeing Uh, I think to add on what Peter has said in matters of authentication, uh, we also use tools like Truffle Hog to okay, limit uh, just, just like a, like a not only developers but also ourselves from committing these very same secrets to the Git repositories. So uh, we recommend the use of things like uh, whatever tool you're using, there's a provision for variables section. So whether it's GitLab, there is GitLab variables. Whether it's GitHub, there's the same for that. But no, did it with his. And uh, we advocate for these as 
pushing the secrets within the code is actually a security risk to not only you but your organization at large. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we'll, we'll end it here. Sorry again. <laughs> I think it's the network, I suppose. But yeah, it was, it was a pleasure uh, presenting to you. We would have wished to go to the serverless uh, framework. But yeah, thank you. It's been a good audience. Yeah. So thank you. So we are still around if you want to still follow up with this and check if yeah. the environment is done. So we just, yeah, yeah. find us at our desk, Kaponyuma. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Any? Dev, DevSecOps, you build it, you secure it, you operate it. Thank you, Peter and team. I'd like to mention one of our sponsors for this uh, two days, TDG, called Technodyne Group. They're one of the subsidiary, com one of the subsidiary companies, Tibco TechSoft, are uh, the main data analytics sponsors for the, for the Mercedes Petronas Formula One team. For those of you who follow F1, and are the integration and business process management platform enablers for Safaricom. They had an amazing showcase at that corner that showed us how to you know, work with big data and that sort of thing. For the final presentation in this engineering culture segment, we have the FinTech Integrations Tribe who take care of the Mpesa ecosystem. Eric Nyaga and his team will walk us through the Raja and close with an amazing demo. Karibuni. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Nyaga from the Daraja Squad and a FinTech Integration Solutions Tribe in Safaricom. And for us, we usually deal with the MPS APIs. Um, by now, perhaps you've come across the word Daraja. And um, I'm going to be taking you through what it is all about. But first, let me just give you a brief introduction. So today, I'll be presenting on my own, but the, rest, the other team is just behind there taking care of th things so that we keep our developers happy. Um, so we have um, we, 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 we've, oh, we've, we've um, come up with a, a few um, platforms, or we've availed two, uh, two platforms uh, in the last uh, few years. And uh, one of the main, and I can actually say the main objective here is to make sure that we open MPS as a, as an, as a platform so that Oh, uh, businesses, innovators, developer communities can actually use the power of MPS or leverage on the power of MPS to actually power their innovation and solutions. So um, over the last, um, I think, let me just say, since 2014, we started with a platform that was called Broker. Um, the reason I'm using the past tense is because uh, uh, late last year we decommissioned it and replaced it with another platform called Aggregator Platform. So on this platform, we were availing the MPS APIs in SOAP, um, which is simple uh, object access protocol, uh, one of the um, early um, protocols for web services. So um, in 2018, um, we, we realized that there's a growing uh, community of developers that are actually very interested as far as um, uh, the mobile money is concerned. The FinTech space is really growing, and right now it's a reality. And uh, we thought, well, why not we come up with a platform that developers can actually come and consume the, the, the API products that we have and the use cases that MPSA avails um, in a way that it's easy, uh, self-service, and they can actually take part in terms of the develop, uh, development of the platform. So Daraja is our first self-service portal, which is available over the internet right now. If you go to developer.safaricom.co.ke, uh, you land on that page. Um, and this is where we've exposed um, uh, at least 11 APIs right now, where you can actually interact with them on Sandbox. Um, you, can, uh, you can have a production-like experience as far as the various APIs that I'll take you through are concerned. So um, when, when it comes to um, uh, REST, today I'll be focusing on Daraja, uh, which is now a 2.0 version. and. Um, as far as the APIs are concerned, uh, we are using REST as opposed to SOAP, um, uh, which is, this, this is one of the most common uh, protocols as far as the APIs are concerned. And Daraja right now uh, uh, has, uh, has, has a, number of, um, a number of APIs that I'll show you. And also, you can see we have actually been able to get 
a huge developer, developer community over the last four years. Right now we are sitting at 50,000 and over, and this keeps growing every day because we get new developer accounts created every day on the platform. We also have these developers have been able to also deploy 30,000 plus applications on production, and I can tell you the traffic is growing each and every day. And this, as you can see, is something that is slowly turning from a product within Safaricom, but also a platform that is actually owned by the developer community. And today I'll be showing you some of the things that we are doing around that, and some of the things that you can expect in, 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 the, in the near future. So what do you need to access Daraja, for instance? Um, so previously you, da you had to go, you know, get a VPS or a virtual private server, uh, do a VPN tunnel or an MPLS link, so that then you can access the API platform that I mentioned earlier, Code Broker, which is in SOAP. But now, right now, you just need an internet connection. So if, with internet connection or a shared domain, uh, I mean, a, a, a hosted domain somewhere in a shared, uh, in, in a shared um, uh, host, you can actually consume these APIs. So um, what you need to do is access the developer account, the developer portal, uh, that URL over there. Um, once you do that, you create the account, this uh, quick get started section where you can actually um, just go through like five steps to create your account, uh, categorize what it is or about, is it individual, is it um, company, and all that, and then you can create your first sandbox uh, application or test application, and you'll be automatically um, allocated the test credentials. Um, so you need skills in REST, developing in REST, of course. You need some coding, understand JSON, uh, and all that, so that at least even as you even as you interact with the APS, you are, you have you have um, you have the, the capability to you know troubleshoot, do the uh, the service deployments and all that. All right. So these are the APS. These are just some of the APS that you can find on Daraja right now if you go to that portal. Um, we have Dynamic QR, which is the newest. We have C2B, which is one of the most common APIs. We have B2C, Reversals API, M-Pesa Express, Account Balance, Pool API, and Transaction Status Query. So uh, for those of us who have interacted with the APIs, um, M-Pesa Express is by far one of the highest consumed API products on that platform. And I can tell you, a lot of us have actually interacted with it. If, if you've gone to uh, an e-commerce site, for instance, and you actually check out, and you, you just enter your phone number, and you get that prompt on your phone, requesting you to enter your M-Pesa PIN. That product, that interface that powers that experience is the M-Pesa experience. So when you go to Daraja, you'll be able to interact with that, and you'll have a live or a production-like experience um, uh, as far as that, that, that API is concerned. So, um, I'll quickly go to the dynamic QR. Um, so this, simply put, is dynamic. Q, it's just QR that is dynamic. Uh, previously, um, we, had, uh, we, had, we, had, we had that capability or that uh, feature on, 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 or rather, it's still actually there. Uh, what you could do is just go to the M-Pesa app, and then if it's a till, you have a printout or a QR display where you can just scan to read the, the till number, and then you enter the amount and complete the rest of the payment journey. So right now we have this API, and what this does is that it enables you to actually uh, dynamically generate not just the till number, but this time even the amount. So let's say you are, at a PO, you, you are, you are using a POS system, you are using a POS, and um, you have a screen there that can actually display a QR, so whenever the, uh, you know, the customers are just coming to check out. Uh, they just need to scan that QR and they get the till number, for instance, the amount. The only thing they need to do if it's a buy goods is just enter their PIN and complete the journey. So this is now open for developers out there to innovate around. You can think of all those use cases that you, that you have uh, on e-commerce, on POS systems, and all that. So this is one of our newest, and we are excited to invite every developer in, this, in the community to actually interact with it. Even as we improve on it, uh, you, you, get an, you, you also contribute to the, to the, to the same using, uh, by, by giving us feedback. All right, so we have the customer to business API, which is um, uh, one of the most common APIs. When you go to a, a supermarket and you want to pay for your shopping, um, you, you enter your till number, your, your, your amount, your PIN, and then complete the transaction. Then the transaction details are already captured on the POS system, so you just need to confirm the phone number and that deal is done. So this API is also what 
is the one that enables you to purchase your tokens uh, within a second and you get your, you, you complete the transaction. As the M-Pesa message comes, you have the KPLC token message in your inbox. So this is the API that allows that, that enables that. And we have so many other use cases that you can see here, um, including mobile banking, that is M-Pesa to bank deposits, the customer to business API uh, enables you to do that. So these, um, also we have the B2C, which is like the opposite of that, uh, whereby you can send money from a business to a customer. Um, a very common uh, use case or application for this is when you are withdrawing money from your bank to your M-Pesa wallet. So what happens is that the bank has consumed this API, has integrated into this API, that then they can quickly uh, initiate a transaction directly from their banking system to the recipient's mobile number, and they receive it within, um, within under a second. So this, 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 this and, uh, this and uh, other APIs that I may not be able to talk about uh, because of time uh, are the APIs that, as developers, you just log in there, interact with them, and we have more coming. A lot of features are coming as far as the portal is concerned and even the experience is concerned. We've gotten a lot of feedback from the community, and we have, you've seen, hey, this is no longer our platform. This is the community's platform. So um, uh, uh, I'll just brush uh, through the others. So we have account balance, which allows developers to actually check or businesses to check the balance in their business account. We also have the Vasos API that enables businesses to automatically initiate transaction uh, um, from their accounts. For instance, if you made uh, um, uh, a deposit to say uh, a bank account or even made a, a, a wrong transaction to a till, they can actually use this automatically from their system to re initiate that reversal. Um, we also have transaction status query and as the name suggests, this one now gives you the opportunity to or the capability to check the status of a transaction that you might have missed a notification or a confirmation message for on API and it will also give you additional information. So if, for instance, you missed uh, what we call uh, callbacks for the APIs, this API will enable you to actually fetch or get that status, that status of that transaction so at least you, you can do the reconciliation or the other uh, processes that are involved. All right. Um, today I really wanted to talk about best practices as far as the APIs are concerned. Um, we have things that we have to do at, uh, as a squad so that we make sure that the experience of the portal is concerned. And there are also things that we can give as tips to the community so that you make or you get the most out of that portal as you interact with the products that we have availed. So these are just some of the, uh, 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 some of the tips that we felt would be great if as developers we can actually pay attention to them. Um, when you're interacting the APIs, especially for the cases whereby you're not just doing it for, uh, you know, uh, testing the platform, but rather also want to deploy the production, uh, the solutions to production. What you can see are, are basic principles as far as, uh, uh, you know, any software development is concerned. But they are key because as time goes by, um, uh, it is easy to ignore them because we have uh, platforms that are automating some of these things. API uh, library, uh, uh, SDKs, API uh, libraries that are actually automating all this, but it is also important to make sure that it's taken care of. So number one, please always read the documentation so that you make sure that even as you consume, let's say, M-Pesa Express, you are able to know which parameters are to be passed in what format. For instance, when you talk about um, the TIL number, if you're passing your TIL number, what format is it expected to be in? You can assume it's going to be a number, but when you pass it in, in a different format, then uh, you might be challenged with, by, by um, basic errors because of that particular format. Uh, and if you just go through the documentation, it's, it's, gonna, it's going to be an, an, an issue in that you'll be able to, by the time you do your code, you'll have taken care of that. Uh, uh, I can tell you you've seen cases whereby developers really struggle with that as far as the business short code is concerned. Um, it's not just the format, but also the parameter spellings. Business short code, for instance, is supposed to be in camel case, or uh, lower case, or upper case. All those things are important. And you know, if you pass in any other, any other format, all those will be issues that you'll have to deal with. Um, you can see all the other things to do with the optional parameters, which is 
one of the things that we've seen, especially during the data minimization initiative that we previously had initiated. Um, so, uh, for instance, when you look at uh, uh, the names of the customers, and, and this is something that, of course, soon we will um, we'll not be sharing as far as the notification is concerned on the C2B API, um, the optional parameters need to remain that. Don't make them mission critical in your logic, so that if it happens that we don't send that value on the notification, then your application is not going to crash, um, or you're not going to have issues on, uh, with uh, reconciling the records on your database. So this, these are important things that if you can actually take care of, you realize that, that uh, those activities that actually took you like two days to get, to get done, it can even take you less than you know, uh, two hours, because a lot of it is reusable. Uh, we have a lot of things that are reusable as far as the API behavior is concerned. We have asynchronous APIs that have a request maker and a HTTP call, re call receiver. So it's just an endpoint and another one to consume an endpoint. So th some of those modules that you can reuse, reuse them. Make, make them generic in your, in your application so that at the end of the day, you, are, you do not have to um, um, uh, do I call it, you don't have to, do, uh, to, to duplicate the effort that you have, uh, you have already done uh, for other implementation. Now, um, we have these things that are coming soon. Um, instance app approval and credentials generation, this is already done. I can assure you right now, if you go to Daraja, go to live process, complete for, for SDK push or any other API, your pass key will be in your email by the time you close that portal. So this is one of the things that we've just done. And you can see we have a list of things that we've committed to make sure that they happen uh, within the next very short period, especially within the year. So that ne then after this, what, what we make sure that we give, we give that opportunity, we give the developers the peace of mind to innovate as much as possible. Now, um, I've... I've been saying about, uh, I've been talking about opening, making the platform, um, uh, or rather uh, the realization that the platform with over 50,000 plus developer accounts who are, who are daily active, um, that, that tells you any time that, that platform is down or any time we have an issue as far as the experience is concerned, um, that's, that's no longer an issue internally, but also an, an issue affecting innovations, developers who are busy cracking things and uh, hacking things um, out there. So what we are, what we are now, what we've actually decided is to, make sure, we, is to make sure that even as we come up with new products, we will involve you, the developer community out there. So we'll continue taking your feedback and using it as input to our next great things or great features, uh, great experience on the developer portal, especially the Raja, um, uh, so that we give you what you need to get things done uh, out there. And um, how to achieve that is to have more frequent um, engagement forums. This is just one. This is just the beginning. We are going to be having more and more either online or even physically uh, when, when, the, when, when the corona period and the you know, regulations are, you know, when we get out of the, peri or the uh, pandemic period. And at that point, we'll be able to even ask questions, interact with the squad, ask, give them that candid feedback, because that is what we really need to know what pain you are, you are feeling out there when you're interacting with the platform. And uh, in that note, I would like to invite you We've come up with a Telegram group or a Telegram channel whereby uh, we want to make sure that we interact with you every day. Every day that we are coming up with a new product, every day we are coming up with a new experience as far as the, the portal is concerned, we want to engage you so that you can be part of that development team. And kindly scan this QR. It's, it's going to take you to that Telegram channel. And we are going to be having um, uh, a lot of great things in that, in that channel, other than just the co-creation opportunities. We'll also be able to um, you know, uh, have you guys suggest what you like. Um, you, you, we can even get that feedback in real time. If you are facing any errors, let's troubleshoot them in that particular channel. So um, as I wind up, I would like us to just scan this, join us there. Let's get things going there, because I know we might have a lot of questions after this, but the team is on standby to make sure that we respond to those queries on this platform. So I'll 
stop at that as I wait for you guys to join the team. And also you can pass by our booth over there. We'll be able to respond to your queries uh, with my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, especially for those best practices. Who remembers number one? Number one is do not skip the docks. Nikama to IKEA, you know, you get onto a new platform, you want to do something, and you go straight. I just saw Makitu. And then you're there calling support, tweeting, saying, where is this? Why can't this thing work? Yet you have not read, read the docs. And I mean, you're an engineer, but at the same time, sometimes, when you're consuming another engineer's product, you don't do the very same thing that you'd want them to do if they're consuming yours. So what an insightful session from the Safaricom team, our members across the different functions. And ladies and gentlemen, we will now take a 10-minute break, short break. Kindly make time to visit the, the, the sponsor booths, and I'll see you back here in 10 minutes where we have an amazing panel uh, lined up for you. And also before that panel, we'll run a trivia. So if you've not been following or you need to catch up, go on to, go on to the socials, figure out, see what people are discussing there, because that's where the questions will come. See you guys in 10. Centennial. from anywhere enables you to network with people because being connected is an advantage. Orders must be processed, tracked and delivered. So you can move from ambition to success. Feels like cloud nine and being on the move takes vision. Let's help your business be built for bigger with Safaricom Tech Solutions. Efficiency, cost, productivity. Business as usual has always been about turning a profit. If you stop to think about it, what more is there? The universe, nature, life, civilization as we know it, is about the search for something greater than ourselves. Huawei Cloud is innovating technologies to make the world more inclusive. The Cloud, AI, 5G, are building a fully connected, intelligent world. They do more than drive digital transformation. It's a new paradigm for innovation. Imagine, if you can, what amazing secrets await when we unlock the secrets of the universe. What cosmic answers will we learn? AI can help preserve in the rainforest by identifying the sounds of gunshots or the sounds of illegal logging, protecting the most precious sounds, birds and trees for generations to come. In cities around the world, we can collect traffic data and analyze it to improve transportation and bring order to a chaotic world. Even reporting the weather can be improved with AI. With more accurate forecasts and timely alerts, we'll travel safer and get home to our loved ones. Also, so many delicious flavors, chili, herbs, and spices automatically selected to improve flavor, quality, and nutrition. Delightful flavor explosions to dazzle our taste buds. A cloud for everyone. Unleashing the power of innovation. Making every day better. A cloud for pervasive intelligence and a better future. Huawei Cloud. Grow with intelligence. Safaricom Engineering Community is a group of engineers who have come together uh, to have fun 
uh, to transform lives and to build an engineering culture of perfection within the specific field that they are in. The community that I'm patterning is the community for soft architecture. So the vision is to build a culture of developing solutions and designing solutions that are secure, that are performant within the environments that they work in, and that also transform lives. We will equip the community members with the right skill set and knowledge to develop the next generation platforms that will be hardware agnostic. So this community will be looking at designing solutions that first of all are secure, that uh, perform very well when subjected to load, that also meet the needs of the customers, and then defining standards within which software is built. Having led developer communities in the past, I'm going to set up forums and events where the community members will be able to meet physically, collaborate, share ideas, create networks, and do follow-up events where members of the communities can showcase items they are proficient in or new knowledge areas that they are trying to learn and understand. My primary goal for this uh, engineering community will be to bring in experts from the market to work with young engineers, to grow their skill, to share engineering practices and then also to give them a platform where they can show guess what they're doing. A strong community has is made up of people with different skill set, both junior and senior, who are able to collaborate freely, share feedback, receive feedback, do knowledge transfer whenever they meet, whenever someone reaches out for support. Looking at the way they'll be collaborating together, learning from each other, having fun with each other, and also sharing what they've learned from the community so that the community can grow bigger and bigger, depending on where they are I'm Victor Rwanda, I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. My name is Kenneth Awino, I am Safaricom Engineering Community. What a great conversation we've been having so far. I see so many of you really enjoyed Eric's presentation, and I'm glad that you did. I've seen so much love for him. First of all, Wadi, you say that um, Daraja is proof that software is about simplicity and solving basic problems. Absolutely right. We just had the conversation with um, Ms. Munua, Alice Munua, and she said the exact same thing. I think Eric reiterated that with his presentation for sure. Um, Davis Matengo, great presentation. Your slides are clean and well put. That's to Eric. And then, of course, some very technical questions, which I hope you'll get answers to in the group in the group chat because you guys are very active Clinton is asking due to the introduction of data protection policy what is the solution for businesses who need to send confirmation confirmation messages to customers after pay payment while we get masked numbers he says we always we do not always get STK push so that's a very important question and I can see there's a conversation happening around that but I'm really glad at how well you guys are engaging with us we also have people watching on LinkedIn as well not just here on YouTube I see Dennis Chacha um, who is feeling um, very nice and very happy with the conversation and Abdul Aziz Hussein who says it's a great presentation um, and we have a couple of other people from all over the country some from South Sudan yesterday we had guys from all the way in Canada and the US so thank you so much for being with us I've been playing a game with you collecting passport stamps if you've been keen then you, are, you already have two stamps okay I'm not gonna say what they are because you have to be there for each part of the day to get all the stamps and collect 500 bob at the end of the day but just in case you've been there this is your third stamp Collect this name, Joseph, Joseph Fourier. I hope I'm saying it correctly. F-O-U-R-I-E-R. F-O-U-R-I-E-R. That is your stamp for this session. Remember, if you collect all of them at the end of the day, 500 bob worth of airtime. I've still got a lovely gift hamper there with an Evo pad, a notebook, a power bank, a hoodie that you guys have been asking for. So please do stay engaged with us. I'm having a tiny fireside chat, uh, fireside chat now with uh, Lenin or you, Assembo Oyunga, who's going to join us. He is a senior director for global product solutions at Oracle and let's just have a talk with him and figure out how Oracle comes into play, what opportunities exist there and how the Safaricom, the very first Safaricom Engineering Summit is going for him. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, Lenin, so thank you so much for coming through and for joining us. I want to first ask you um, the very first Safaricom Engineering Summit as of, of course a sponsor and being part of it but also as just a techie how's it going in your in your opinion? <laughs> well, I think it's amazing. Yes. It's amazing just to see the turnout. Yes. The big developer community that we have in Kenya. Yes. And just all of them coming together you know to let me say build Kenya. Mm -hmm. I think it's so much of an eye-opener and in my view I think this will have been a five-day summit. Yes. 
it should be a five day summit. Maybe next year we can get a five day summit. I'm speaking to the powers that be, which <laughs> include you as well. Yes, um, yes. But tell me how uh, Oracle factors in um, software that is, you know, very thoughtful, very ethical when it comes to solving solutions because you're a customer facing business as a Safaricom. Yes. Yeah. So Oracle is a customer facing business. So yeah. Oh, we oh, forgot sorry. you don't have a mic. Wow. Yes, we'll start again. Sorry. All right, that was on me. I forgot to, 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 to let you know. I, I thought you'd been mic'd. But um, let's just have uh, the conversation from the beginning. So okay. first things first, what has the summit looked like for you? Have you enjoyed it so far? So I think the summit has been amazing in terms of just the turnout, the topics of discussions, and seeing the developer community in Kenya just build from ground up. I think it's been... Uh, eye-open experience and a total mind-blowing experience just see developers in Kenya coming together in, in a single community yeah. something that has not happened for a very long time uh, in the country yeah next year hopefully we get um, a five-day summit it has to be a five-day summit it has to be a five-day summit <laughs> we will take it to the bank I'll be here next year asking you so we're on day four <laughs> okay <laughs> um, exactly absolutely but I've, I was also asking um, like I said Oracle is a customer facing business um, engineering is basically problem solving at the end of the day how are you ensuring that at the end of the day your end user is happy and that you're making ethical decisions when it comes to your engineering to your code to your AI to everything yeah yes I mean Oracle first thing Oracle does is uh, put the customer first mm -hmm. and then work backwards from there mm -hmm. so everything that Oracle does revolves around the customer yes. so as providing a platform and problem solving we look at practical problems that are facing the industry and the society mm -hmm. and we build it from there mm -hmm. and for example we have the Oracle cloud infrastructure yes. which is a general platform where you can build across any industry mm -hmm. uh, we build talent uh, we train on the same uh, technologies and we have also a developer community that that's constantly innovating and building future solutions. And such an avenue yeah. pretty much gives Oracle a pivot to be able to also expand the platform to others yes. and get other people to build on the same. So we're very excited to be here yeah. and also provide a platform that people can develop on. Yeah, and I'll ask why partner with Safaricom for the Engineering Summit and um, what, what do your partnerships with Safaricom look like also on a day-to-day -day basis, not outside the summit itself? Yeah. yeah. So, so we've been partnering with Safaricom for over 15 years. Wow, okay. Uh, pretty much powering different businesses within Safaricom, mm -hmm. from their infrastructure to their applications, uh, to the supply chain, to their HR, uh, to their finance. Yes. And, you know, our journey with Safaricom, you know, having walked through all the years, goes beyond just this developer summit mm -hmm. because we seek to see how can we make an impact to, you know, not just a customer, but the people that interact with Safaricom and Oracle. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at opportunities where we can jointly go together to just make an impact to the overall customer. Yeah. So beside providing solutions, we are holding our hands to see what more can we do yes. as two, you know, big and great companies. Ah, I love that you said, what more can we do? Because um, sometimes profit is the primary motivator and these other things come as an afterthought. <laughs> and we've had quite a bit of that. Um, yes. I'll ask just from a tech mind, what do you think makes um, a good tech company? What separates a successful tech company from a not successful? What, what, and what determines who's going to be a startup? startup success or a startup failure or in general yeah just longevity in this industry uh, I think a couple of things yeah. uh, one is agility because a successful tech company will have to be very agile in how they operate yes. because we're in a world where technology is just becoming faster and faster in terms of adoption mm -hmm. and we have new things uh, secondly is capacity I mean, a good tech company will have the capacity to be able to move fast. And that involves perhaps some good uh, rounds of capital, a good capital base to be able to scale. Yes. But the most important thing about a tech company that will be successful is the understanding of the customer and the market. Because that's where the problem is. That's where the solutions are, and that's where the whole sustainability of a tech company evolving will lie. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know a big chunk of our audience is university students, mm -hmm. and I think a good part of that success is also dependent on the quality of human resource that that you're that you're attracting. So, for those who may want to find their way into Oracle, what does that look like? How do we get these opportunities? So, so Oracle has a Generation O program yes. where we particularly target you know, early graduates, so people who are just early into their careers getting into the, the company. Mm -hmm. And the beauty about the Gen O program is you get to shadow perhaps a future salesperson or a future technical person, a future architect mm -hmm. in their day-to-day -day jobs. Mm -hmm. And after some time, you have... A future or a current um, architect? A current, oh, a yes. current okay, architect, okay. sorry. Yes, yes. A current architect, a current salesperson, yes. depending on the route you want to pretty much grow into technology. Mm -hmm. And 
across a gen or program, you're able to pretty much grow and become a professional. So we have that, mm -hmm. and we are constantly hiring, yeah. uh, especially for this particular that's good market. To hear in an We're economy constantly like hiring. This, that's so really good so anybody who's looking for a job, yes. just go to Oracle Careers. Mm -hmm. We constantly post job opportunities there, mm -hmm. and it's a fantastic company to work for. Yeah, yeah. if you do say so yourself. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yes, yes. Three years in, I think I love it so far. So far, you're yes. loving it. Um, what do you? Th what about women and Oracle in specific? Because I was speaking to Alice Munua earlier. Yeah. And she said, you know what, we're not where we should be. We're making progress, but we're not exactly where we should be when it comes to representation of women in the tech industry. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I think as Oracle, we've decided to be very intentional about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Oracle Women Leadership Program that spans globally, and we even have it here in Nairobi, that specifically looks at how can we invest in women as part of diversity and inclusion, yes. and how can we build and also scale women future leaders. Mm -hmm. So as Oracle, there's a very deliberate effort to make sure women are actually in very good positions of leadership. I, I love that there's active work going on yeah. behind it because it's very easy to say, yeah, I would like to have a third, two thirds, whatever number you think, um, but if you're not actively working towards it, it will not happen. Um, I'd also like to have some fun with you and not just get on the serious stuff. But before sure. I go there, I'll do one last serious thing, um, which is the fact that cloud computing, um, data, all of that is the future. But then there's always so many ethical issues surrounding how we use the data, um, you know, why the, the charges, there's so many things. What do you think is the most, is the best way to bridge that gap between profitability and ethics um, from an Oracle point of view? Uh, from an Oracle point of view, I think uh, the baseline uh, of that or the spinal cord for all that will yes. be, first of all, understanding the local dynamics. Uh, I'll take an example of the, you know, the GDPR and now we have the Data Protection Act. So first of all, baselining it on that mm -hmm. I kind of like brings a good balance on how do we use the data, how do we, are we ethical about it yes. and does it make sense? Yes. And that goes down to how do we even localize some services? Mm -hmm. uh, do we now give you comfort that you know we have data in a country for example in terms of how we handle your data mm -hmm. but the biggest bit is being transparent about it you know as an organization are we transparent in how you how we handle your data yes. are we transparent in how we deploy our solutions mm -hmm. and are we true to it I think once you do those you're able to pretty much you know do a horizontal across this yeah. let me call them pillars in this particular instance yeah. and, and solve the solutions and um, you mentioned localization and I went on a different tangent I think sometimes we problem solve while thinking globally of tech as a global thing yeah. without really putting into perspective that uh, things are different here than they are perhaps you know at Oracle's home base and elsewhere uh, what would you say are the, the biggest opportunities operating in Kenya for Oracle and the biggest challenges I think the biggest opportunity is we're in a market where you know the growth uh, you know the growth gap is so huge yes. in terms of where industries are trying to leapfrog uh, you know to be automated for the future yes. and that presents opportunities in terms of what we can do better but the challenge of that is uh, the speed at which we need to address this gap uh, is not yet at that particular level as you would compare to a first world country yes. so it's kind of like a give and take situation where you need to leverage on the global strategy to address a local problem with understanding of the local dynamics yeah. and that gives I think a very good mix of a very good opportunity to pretty much grow here yes yeah. so I'll open it up to the audience to ask any questions to you and they'll be asking of course on our YouTube or LinkedIn sure. they're watching from everywhere but in the meantime I'll play a game called two truths and a lie yeah so you start you just give me two truths about yourself and a lie I'll try and figure out which one is is the lie and then we'll switch it back okay yeah okay. Uh, so, so introvert. Okay. Um, plays uh, basketball. Okay. Um, plays golf. Introvert plays basketball. Plays <laughs> all. All three <laughs> seem very plausible. Hmm. I don't want to go with the. I'll say your. You appear extroverted. So I'll say that's that's the lie. I could be. I, I guess I'm looking. You look. You're looking like I'm wrong. Am I wrong? You're very wrong. Oh, no, okay. Do I get a second guess? Let <laughs> so me if, give you a second guess. Honestly, second. if I get the second one wrong, I, I will just leave this here and I will let you take over from me. I'm doing terribly. Um, second guess. Plays basketball, plays golf. I don't want to, to just be obvious about it and say Lenin is tall, so of course he must play basketball, but tall people play golf too. Oh. It's a hard one, right? It's a hard one. Let me go with <laughs> plays golf. Wrong again. Uh, I, okay. I, am so, I a so terrible the, the two truths, uh, uh -huh. I'm an introvert. Yeah. I'm introverted and uh, I play golf. Yes. Uh, I don't play basketball. 
Wow. Okay, so I am a bad reader of uh, faces, I guess, or liars. That should not. That's not very. That's not a very good thing. Again, keep the questions flowing online. But I'll also um, do two truths and a lie so that you can see if you're a better judge of character in quotes than yeah. than I am. Um, truth. Hmm. I'm a tomboy. I have two siblings. And hmm, what should I do as the last one? This is my first time working with Safaricom. Um, the lie will be you're a tomboy. <laughs> it's actually a truth. <laughs> At oh. the core, I am. <laughs> I am actually a big tomboy. <laughs> should I give you a second guess as well? G give me a second guess. Okay, so go for it. I think it's on the sibling side. Um, so you guess I do not have two, two siblings. siblings. Yeah. Would you guess more or less? <laughs> <laughs> I think more. Would you guess more? More, yeah. More, okay. It's actually yeah. less, but it's fine. It's true. I do not ah. have, yeah, I only have one sibling. Ah, so that's a, that's, yeah, that's a fair <laughs> I guess. I got it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very fair guess. I don't know why I, I thought that you would guess it's the fact that this is my first time working with Safaricom. And I was like, okay, no, maybe that's when kind of does not make no, sense yeah i've seen you before okay in Safari Club. okay fair enough fair <laughs> enough um we'll get to the questions now let me just see i'd seen someone asking um more about the the opportunities that are open at oracle for non-tech people okay that's a good question because i think uh, especially with this being an engineering summit you assume everyone here is either in software engineering um or some form of computer science and and so for non-techies as well are there opportunities um and what do they look like yeah, so there's tons of opportunities because Oracle being a technology company mm -hmm. uh, has technical people, yeah. but around technical people mm -hmm. are the whole ecosystem. Yes. So there's sales, there's business development, mm -hmm. there's strategy, uh, there's, uh, there's back office, mm -hmm. there's finance. So there's a whole ecosystem of opportunities in Oracle beyond just the technical bit that we look at yeah. uh, as a company. So, so my, my reply to that is we have, let me say, all the opportunities yes. at Oracle. Yes. Yeah. Would that require, uh, would a tech background still give you an advantage even when you're applying for something in biz development and, you know, um, back office, fine, you know, everywhere else? Would a, a background in tech help you or give you an added advantage? Because nowadays we have so many resources that yeah. can allow anyone to be a techie. Should, you know, if you're willing it's, to it, it, it could give you an edge on an opportunity because yes. it's a technology company. Yes. Uh, but beyond that is Oracle look at the niche on what you bring on board uh, despite you not even have a t having a technical background. So, yeah. uh, you know, you could have a niche in finance without a technical background yeah. and still nail a finance job in Oracle. That's, that's, that's very fair. Um, I'm seeing, I've seen another question. I've just lost it. Give me one second. All right. Um, there's a conversation. Okay. So there's the conversation around data protection that we'd even talked about um, now that we have a data protection commissioner we'd spoken about it earlier with even Alice uh, Munua what does does that mean that it's something either to be scared of or to be embraced I know you said you're very you know it's transparency and openness yeah. when it comes to comes to your data is, uh, is, is is key to how Oracle operates but sometimes we can overdo things as a country I guess sometimes you know and then you're like okay this is meant to be regulation but now it feels like <laughs> oppression <laughs> is that a fear that you have or you are open to um, data protection privacy uh, going a notch higher I think let me start by uh, change change is the most permanent thing yes. and I think as human beings and organizations we all are afraid afraid of change or something new yes so I think it's more of something we need to embrace and change on how we kind of like work around it because uh, the reasons that we have data protection acts, the reason that we have data residency rules in the country, and I believe technology should be flexible okay. in terms of you know uh, being water that fits into a glass. So, so in my view, I think it's something that uh, we should embrace mm -hmm. rather than fight because yeah. in embracing it, we're able to even find more opportunities. Okay, fair enough. I'll end now with uh, a game that I've played with every person I've had on the fireside chat, chat and I've had very interesting answers, yeah. but it's always different questions. So let me see um, what I should ask you. I want to find questions that are better suited for you. So, would you, this is interesting. <laughs> are you on Facebook? I am. Okay. Yes. Would you rather be stung by a jellyfish or give up Facebook by, for a week? 
give up Facebook for a week. Really? Yeah. Even if it's a non-poisonous jellyfish? <laughs> I don't do well with pain. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been stung by a jellyfish? No, I, I don't wish to. Okay. It's, not, it's, it's not a pleasant experience, so I think you've um, got your best answer. Would you rather lose all your contacts or lose a thousand dollars? Wow, okay. I'd rather lose a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars, yeah. Because yeah. I, I think... Your phone book is almost, you know, people say your network is your network. It's worth. your network <laughs> any day, any day. Yeah. So let the 1,000 go. Yeah. Um, oh, that's, no, that's, that's a dumb question. Okay, would you rather <laughs> watch TV all the time or never again? That's an interesting one. Yeah, I'm not really a big TV fan, so I, I would probably be on the never again side. Yes. Yeah. Is that because you think that TV is no longer engaging for you? I think because the engagement model has changed. It's, it's TV, it's phone, it's tablets. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could do without a TV and still get you know, all the content get all the content ah, one way or another you know, so it's so interesting that even my mind has switched that when i think of tv i don't think of the box now i just think exactly. of the content yeah so when i said give up, when they said give up tv i thought giving up uh, movies content. and series ah, and everything yeah th that makes it a bit tougher right that makes it tough yeah. which one would be the option then if i said giving i think up i'd stay with the tv then you'd stay <laughs> okay um what what do you check first when you wake up in the morning uh, or do not go on any form of technology so when I wake up in the morning, I, I don't kind of like go in any tech for, for about an hour. Yes. I usually have a quiet time yes. uh, to think, uh, kind of like uh, reflect on the day. Yeah. Uh, then after that, uh, I will pretty much go on my phone. And the first thing I will check is, is, is LinkedIn, even before my calendar. LinkedIn, yes. before your calendar. Okay, so that answers my question. I was going to ask you between um, your email probably and your social media, Twitter, Instagram, which one do you go to? But clearly LinkedIn, so I guess the email would be the closer, yes. the closer answer. Yes, that's right. Okay, so now we can do conundrums, which are a bit tougher for someone who's in tech. Would you rather <laughs> use a keyboard with a Chinese layout forever or write everything in, windi in wingdings forever? Sorry. That's a tough one. <laughs> I, th I think the right, uh, I'll go on the right option, yeah. Okay. Then a Chinese um, keyboard. Chinese keyboard, do you speak, what, do you, Mandarin, do you speak Chinese? No. But you can Google Translate. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, you got that right. <laughs> we'll, find a walk around, we'll find a way to walk around it. Okay, that's fair. Um, would you rather explain NetFlow to the intern or explain, I hope I'm saying this right, explain 4chan to your grandmother? <laughs> Netflix to an intern. <laughs> why is that easy? I do, from a, for a non-tech person, explain to me why that's the better option. I think it will be easy to unpack that to an intern than uh, than yeah. the latter. Than the, yeah. than to your grandmother. Yeah. So I'll pick the easier route. The intern, okay, because they already have a tech background. If they already have a tech if, background, if so it's just be. Yes. Um, expose your browser history to the entire country, a company actually, not country. Or, hmm, do you have a Reddit account? No. Mm hmm share a reddit username so i'll tweak that uh -huh. to your either say, share your social media dms with the entire company or your browser company your browser history browser with history. the entire company yes i would share my social media handles no no not dms dms not handles or dms yes. okay <laughs> <laughs> yes i know I would give them my browser history. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. I guess that's a, that's a safer choice. Yeah. All right. Um, I've seen some more questions coming in um, about base. Uh -huh, prof the, so someone says that the content provided here today is astounding and it's first-hand content which hasn't been um, watched anywhere. And it's a great networking opportunity. What would you say is the best way to network in tech? Because I think it, it changes. I mean, there's the basics that work from industry to industry. But how do you tweak it for tech for example to I grow I as fast think, as you can i think for tech uh two things yeah one is is presence because one of the challenges for for tech people is yeah. we're always in our very comfort uh, kind of like zones and we never want to get out there yes. so one of one of the ways is to get out You're of there huh? i'm very <laughs> introverted yeah so one of the ways is just be out there and yeah. kind of like uh, you know make make what you're doing known yes. the other bit is uh which uh, i've been benefiting a lot from is have mentors i mean because stand on the shoulders of giants. Because at the end of the day, there's someone who's done something you're trying to do maybe five years before you. And the challenge we usually have is we want to raise our hands and say, you know, I want to be helped yeah. as, as, as a techie or as a tech person. Mm -hmm. I've seen that grows in leaps and bounds because it's like viral marketing. You get a couple of mentors who are pretty much growing you out of your skin. They become your 
agents yeah. in terms of making sure you're in the right spaces, even high up. So I will look at it that way because, yeah. uh, you know, how I like to close it is think of the rule of the lead. Mm -hmm. If you're a five and you're always hanging around fives, you will always be a yeah, five. five. Sure. But if you spend once or twice kind of hanging out with an eight, you'll yes. probably be lifted to a six. Yeah. And that's how you grow. You grow more muscle in the tech industry. Yes. So I think, uh, you know, as techies and people in the tech industry, we need to embrace that whole bit better yeah. in terms of just being big and bold okay. in getting out yeah. there. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I think it's, it's, it's for life, you know, even just tech. It's for yeah, life. Yeah, wherever, if you're always uh, the smartest person in the room, <laughs> you really know, <laughs> you'll just stay the smartest person in that room yes, forever. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lennon, for making time with us. Thank you so much. It was so much fun. Um, it was so much fun. I, thought, I hope we can do it sometime soon. We have four days next year, so we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time. We'll do it for five days. <laughs> yes, we'll do yeah, it for definitely. five days. And I'm, ho I'm hoping you guys um, enjoyed the talk as well. He's given you career opportunities you can find at Oracle and of course told us about Oracle's work with Safaricom. I'll now go back in with Mbugwan Jihia who's been, who's ready to hold it down for our next session um, before we do a small lunch break. So Mbugwa, please take it over. I'm hoping we've cut. Yeah, oh, my top back wasn't working. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I hope uh, you have had a good day. Thing. No, yeah, you know, I just... I, I, Thank you so much. It was very nice meeting you. Yeah, have you seen me where else? Here? I'm a... Yeah. Mohanga, over to you. Bugwa, welcome to the session. My name is Fides Nyamohanga. I'm a manager of Money Security Services, Cyber Security in Safaricom PLC, and today I'll be the moderator. And I'd like to welcome my panel, uh, Ivy Cachero from Dell. Welcome on stage. Next, I'll have Seka. Seka Selo must be a South African from AWS Oracle. Welcome, Mr. Seka. And finally, I'll have Harry Hare from CIO Africa. He once hosted me in a session. Now I get to be the host. Welcome. So we have uh, limited time, and uh, we communicated with my panel that we'll keep our responses short and precise and detailed. And I hope by the time you leave here, you'll be interested in taking up the topic that of, of discussion which is navigating digital transformation in an evolving cybersecurity landscape. So my first question, and I'll start with the lady in the room, Ivy. Okay, before I go to the question, kindly introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, what you do, and one hobby that will be interesting to the audience. Um, my name is Ivy Kashero. I'm the territory manager for SecureWorks, handling the African region. I um, one hobby. I'm a foodie, so me I just eat a lot. So <laughs> wherever there's good food is is, is a plug. Uh, I've just had uh, the viazika rice outside. So <laughs> interesting. I wonder why we are not the same size. But over to you, Seka. Hi. Um, my name is Lord Seka. I'm a solution architect at AWS, and I work with uh, Safari in building their solutions. Thank you. Yeah, to you, Harry. Uh, good afternoon. No. Good afternoon. Mm. My name is Harry Hare, not Harry Hare. Harry Hare. <laughs> and uh, I work for DX5, uh, which is formerly uh, CIO Africa. My hobby? Yes. I do glass art. Do you know what glass art is? <laughs> mm -mm. Okay, you can look for me later. Oh, good, at least we have cloud people who give us services and we can Google what all these are. So is everyone able to hear my panel loud and clear? Anyone struggling? No. So we'll start our discussion. I know people talk about cybersecurity, but what does cybersecurity mean to you? And what does it mean in this evolving regulatory landscape? We'll start with you, Harry. I think cybersecurity is a, 
is securing your digital assets, you know, in its barest form. Because, uh, you know, you expose your assets, your digital assets in the internet, uh, and, uh, you know, they're good guys in the internet and they're bad guys in the internet. Uh, so you, you need to be able to secure those assets uh, so that, you know, you don't uh, get into trouble or people don't uh, take advantage of uh, your systems or use your system or steal your, st your data or whatever it is. So cybersecurity in its, in its barest form is uh, you protecting your digital assets online. Thank you. You, Seko, what's your opinion? Yeah, 100%. So as we, you know, living in a digital world, and most of our life is currently, you know, running on, on the cloud. Uh, it is quite critical that your information, your data, your application, wherever they are running, they're secure. And um, at AWS, we take se uh, security very seriously and it's, it is our highest priority. So when you're thinking about uh, building a solution, first thing you should think about is how, how we'll uh, secure that solution. Yes, and to our audience, most of them are developers, so I'm sure those are, those are some of the things they want to understand, how do they incorporate security while developing. And to the audience, we are a digital company, so one of our panel will be joining virtually. Eric, welcome. Kindly introduce yourself, what you do. Good morning. I'm Eric Oh, welcome. Have you introduced yourself? Uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, kindly introduce yourself, tell us what you do. Uh, yes, I'm Eric Rusmurla, I work for Mozilla, I'm the CTO for Firefox. Thank you. So we've just started the discussion, you're not left behind. So you do a lot of cloud solutions and services. How has cybersecurity evolved and how is the regulation around cybersecurity evolving as most organizations are moving cloud? Um, by um, evolving your, your solutions, we you get new use cases that were not possible in the past. And, um, you know, regulatory organizations and governments are basically looking at the implications of um, what does the new cloud world mean in terms of governance, all right? And um, the, the, the Kenya Data Privacy Act is an example of that. So. Um, as solution uh, uh, builders, we must think in the context of the governance around us in terms of how compliant are we with the laws and the rules of uh, the countries we're operating in or the markets we're operating within uh, so that you don't find yourself having put a solution out there that is not compliant with the regulations, especially with African countries as the, um, the data privacy regulations are, are being promulgated into law. Oh, thank you. So, Ivy, I know cybersecurity, uh, when um, Harry introduced it, he talked about protecting your digital assets. But what are we protecting, f protecting it from, and how is it affecting digital transformation? Um, you know, I think the idea of where, how we used to think about security before is we'd think about locking our doors, uh, making sure um, we have security guards and whatnot to ensure that we are secure. Uh, what's that, what that has now evolved to is because we've a adopted a lot of um, cloud native uh, platforms, we've adopted a lot of online related um, assets and applications for, to make our lives easier. What that has done is also created an exposure and to what we'd call the cyber security that landscape, which means the physical people we once feared are now pretty much online. And so to be able to protect ourselves from those who would call um, the bad guys online, and this would be either state-owned state, state -owned, um, uh, government, I mean state-owned threat actors, mm -hmm. it could be, you know, just hacktivists who are just having fun and, and, and different types of individuals who have different interests are the guys we are now trying to be more concerned about. So it's, um, it's more strategic and in some cases just, you know, a bunch of 
random folks trying to um, leverage as much as they can on the internet. So who we're trying to protect ourselves, it could be basically every, anybody. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be more proactive and more um, cautious uh, in how we relate to the, uh, with the applications and the, a lot of the technology that has now um, advanced for our efficiency. All right. So to Harry and uh, Seko, how does this affect the human resource? Human resource being here, people who are in the industry, being organization where they hire people to form the different uh, policies, how has it affected them? <laughs> okay, let me, let, me, let me take that. And, and I think I want to go back a bit uh, to, to look at also the, from, from a regulatory, uh, just a regulatory point of view. I, I think security and cybersecurity is a responsibility of everybody yeah it's so so regulators are going to put their uh, their compliance uh, policies and regulations for for people to to follow and make sure that you're safe uh, to make sure that uh, the landscape whatever it is it could be banking it could be manufacturing it could be whatever it is uh, that environment is stable yeah, it's safe and stable. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, businesses are run on tech. So businesses are run on systems. Uh, so it's the responsibility of businesses and a responsibility of the people in those businesses to make sure that their businesses are safe and secure. So I just wanted to, to throw that in as, you know, because you see, we, sometimes we, we put too much responsibility to the regulator, but actually it's our responsibility to make sure that whatever we put out there is secure. Yeah? So, so I just wanted to bring that out. Um, in terms of uh, resources, of course, uh, cybersecurity, I think, uh, I think one or two years ago, I, I was seeing that we have a shortage of probably, I don't know, some millions uh, of cybersecurity experts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is because, you see, this whole concept of digital transformation uh, has brought in a lot of digital staff in the four, in the businesses, uh, which means it has also created a very wide threat surface. Yeah? So organizations are, you know, continuously very vulnerable in terms of, because uh, you see everybody, so let me give you an example. Sorry, I'm, I might take too much time, but let me give you an example of uh, what happened during COVID-19. You know, March 20, 2020, One. when everybody now had to work from home, um, and, uh, you know, we were not ready for that, yeah? But uh, IT people, engineers, had to make sure that that happens quickly for business continuity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then that happened, and a lot of guys actually uh, had to create uh, systems where now people can log into the corporate land from home, which was not entirely secure at that point, because you, know, you needed to get people to work. Yeah? yeah. So that opened up a lot of uh, a lot of issues, and if you guys remember, 2020 there was a lot of hacking going on, especially in the financial services sector. Uh, so, so, so we need to. I think for organisations, I think it's 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 an investment in re, in in, a, uh, in a resource, a human resource, but it's also about engineers like this one, the, the, the people in the room, engineers who are budding engineers, we need to, to start creating that pipeline uh, for, for people to get into this space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Ari? All right. So from an AWS point of view, as I said, um, security is our highest priority. And um, we have what you call the well-architected framework, which I would highly recommend it for any developer out there building an app. Uh, um, as, as we have said, there have been, there's been a flurry of, of applications that have come to the market in order to make people's lives easier. So when you're building your solutions, um, you should always have a human resource, as you're saying, in your team that understands security.
to ensure that all those checkpoints around how secure is the application, um, have you done your penetration testing, is always taken care of. Um, security shouldn't be, when you're building a team um, or, or, or putting together a plan to build a solution, security shouldn't be an afterthought, but it should form an integral part of your team and your plan mm -hmm. so that uh, you can use tools like the well-architected framework which has a security pillar, mm -hmm. then you can use that to review your application and show that you have taken care of the most uh, well-known uh, uh, security flaws that developers make. Oh, and I assume these uh, uh, frameworks for cybersecurity, do they come inbuilt with some of the solutions, for example, AWS offers, or they have to form their own best practice? so that you find organization A has different from B, or are they similar, or what happens? Yeah. At AWS, we have what we call the shared responsibility model, mm -hmm. and we believe that um, as a developer the, the, or, or a, an organization, the security of your customer's data is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. We will actually give you the tools, the guidelines, but you need to ensure that you apply it on your solution. So it is your responsibility as an application developer to ensure that you have applied all our guidelines on, on your application. All right, thank you, Harry. So to you, Eric, for joining virtually, what is your opinion in terms of the regulators governing the cybersecurity landscape? Do we have enough? Do we have, uh, do, are all sectors and domains covered within cybersecurity? Well, I think maybe we have enough. Um, I, I guess I worry in some cases about whether the regulators are trying to regulate the right things. Um, so, you know, uh, one thing I would say is there's a real tendency um, in regulation to think about response and to think about having visibility into systems and visibility into breaches, but we need to start earlier than that. When we think about how we regulate systems so that they're built securely so we have fewer uh, cybersecurity incidents and not so much that we are able to recover from when they happen. And so, you know, one thing that we see is that, you know, it used to be very, very hard to build secure systems. Uh, and uh, for some of the reasons that were just being mentioned, that we're now developing a set of practices around how to build those systems more securely with things like frameworks, things like memory safe languages like Rust, um, you know, things like um, you know, strong cryptography. And so what we need to do is regulation needs to foster um, people building more secure systems so that the systems uh, you know, do not suffer so much from the kind of uh, cybersecurity problems that we see. And I think I see a lot less emphasis on that, and a lot more emphasis on sort of visibility and surveillance and, and also kind of security box checking and less on the kind of system architecture that we really need to see to have um, you know, the systems we need. Thank you, Eric. Ivy, to the same question, um, what is your opinion in terms of regulation on cybersecurity locally? See, for me, I think when, when we focus on, you know, policies standard is we get into the approach of just focusing on ticking a compliance box as opposed to uh, addressing the risks that we currently have in business. So other than, and the, and the problem, problem with checking boxes, it converts um, organizations to look at jargons in terms of technology to acquire. Mm -hmm. So just because they'd want to take uh, a compliance metrics for, for whatever sort. So they, they, if, if we focused on risk, we for sure would need compliance. But if we, you know, it's, it's, it's not assured that we fo if we focus on compliance, that we'll be able to focus on uh, and resolve some of the risk uh, elements that we have. And just to give an example is, you know, when we talk about the major key problems that we see a lot of organizations facing, which is um, from a security operation perspective, which is visibility, uh, complexity of the infrastructure, as well as response, mm -hmm. um, those are things that can be simplified and resolved if we we're focusing on risk um, and, uh, and depth of um, enhancing the uh, security posture of an organization. But now, if we were to switch that into looking at a compliance metric framework, um, if we said visibility, um, what it sounds like is getting get a log management solution and you tick a box. Um, if we talk about uh, complexity, you know, you'd find a solution that ticks the box, which organizations would basically focus on that to meet their compliance regulations. So for me, beyond looking at just compliance, 
I think what we need to start focusing on is on elements that focus on risk and then align those to how we're able to meet compliance. And then other elements of privacy, because of we're looking at risk, but PII um, concerns that organizations have would ultimately also be res uh, met because we're looking at a more bigger picture and focusing on solution providing as opposed to just uh, compliance. So, yeah, I, I think that was my perspective. Yeah, and I think uh, risk assessment is something that organizations are usually encouraged to do and develop their own framework on carrying it out. So to you, Harry, and in ref uh, relevance to our audience, most of them are engineers, developers. How then do they support, what role do they play in this landscape, especially in ensuring that organizations comply to the regulatory requirements and also ensuring they are aware of the regulations they need to comply with. Safaricom is a telco, fintech, uh, the organizations that are NGOs, how then do we support by them understanding their role? I think, I think as builders, uh, we, we need to to build with security in mind. Uh, you know, from, from, the, from the word go, I think the, this is, there's a company that has a tagline uh, that says uh, uh, security by design. Uh, so from, from, from the time you, you know, before you even start building, you, you, you need to start thinking about security. Uh, whatever you're building, how, how have you designed uh, what you're building and how have you infused uh, security into your design before you even start building. I think that's, that would be a good approach so that you, you're not building stuff then later on discover that you actually need to have built uh, some security features into, into your product. Uh, so you, you start off with security in mind. That's, that's what I would, uh, I would encourage people to do. Seko, does that mean as an engineer myself, I need to learn cybersecurity or leave it as an independent uh, domain where someone else has to come and check for me? Do, are we telling the engineers that they have to learn? Or we just go with the process of, I do my part, someone else does their part. What's your opinion? Well, it's, it's quite difficult to be an, an expert in multiple domains. Yeah. So if you're good at um, coding, uh, you might not be good at cybersecurity. But um, if you think about uh, the process of building a software, um, you usually need uh, multiple disciplines. So if you are not an expert in security, just ensure that you, you rope in the help from a uh, security specialist to review you know, your architecture before you even build it, as we are saying. So um, I think it would be quite hard for every developer to be a, a cybersecurity expert Mm -hmm. And uh, for every DBA to be a, a, the, the area and the depth uh, of, of, of security is quite a lot and it would distract them from their day to day. So I would recommend that they collaborate with, um, as you are saying, you know, uh, how do you know what, what regulations and compliance are enacted upon your industry? So you need to understand the industry you are in, understand who the regulatory bodies are and what the legislations are and get an expert in that domain to guide you to ensure that you're compliant, be it a security um, specialist, be it a compliance specialist, or even legal. Yes, and just to have your point in, uh, Seko has said that you just need to understand or know who are the regulators in your industry. If you're developing product for an NGO, manufacturing, uh, health, know the regulators, then get an expert to give you more concrete information or even recommendations on how to implement. Maybe, maybe to add, can I add something yes, exactly. on that? Sorry. I think um, I think in the keynote earlier on, we the the. Um, speaker mentioned about uh, ensuring that we don't run a lot of development in silos. Mm. So the idea is organizations have experts as well in-house who understand, one, the business objective because the 
the challenge sometimes of leveraging external resource is internal teams ex understand what the business objective is and, and what the organization is trying to achieve. And then you've got the technical resources as well in-house. So you've got legal guys, you've got uh, the um, security teams that um, you know, manage security operations and different functions within the organizations. So the idea is when building the team, in, in, in the project team, is to keep those resources in mind so that they could help raise an awareness of certain things that as a developer you might not need to you might not think about but because those teams are key stakeholders as part of the project then they're able to input their views and, and their thoughts so again because again making this thinking of the business in mind is you don't security for me always is security shouldn't necessarily come at the expense of business mm -hmm. so leveraging every critical resource that you have internally for efficiency is, is, is an appropriate approach to look at it from that perspective yeah. okay and to you eric as an owner as the ceo of your organization do you think you sh what is your opinion about organizations sharing data with the regulator to inform some of the recommendations that they give are they sharing enough? Do we need to do does do organizations need to share their threat attack vector, their threat intelligence, some of the risk and the breaches that have happened to the regulator and how does that help in forming recommendations? So I mean we already do see quite a bit of information sharing um, with regulators um, and also other companies. Um, so um, you know I think that, that that certainly does happen. Um, you know, it's always hard to balance, I think, uh, sharing specific details versus sharing generality, because every time you share specific details, of course, you're sharing information that both, you know, both may be a threat to the privacy and security of your users and a threat to the, you know, to the company's um, confidential information. Um, so, so, so we certainly do see quite a bit of threat intelligence sharing. Um, as, as I said, I, th I think that, you know, um, perhaps more important than sharing um, details of threat intelligence is sharing, um, you know, what's possible and, uh, uh, you know, with the technical frontiers. So, um, you know, this is a very fast moving field. And so what we often see is attempts to regulate that are, I would say, out of touch with what is actually practical in the real world. Um, you know, one, one example, um, you know, I often give is the GDPR, um, you know, cookie uh, bot banners, which I think were well intended, but, you know, uh, we're, we're not connected to, you know, what, what real practice in the website was. And if you look at GDPR cookie banners, you know, they're, they're really quite onerous and very unpleasant. Um, so there's an example where, you know, regulators, I think, didn't take um, insight from industry about what was what, what was and wasn't possible. Um, and so we ended up in quite a bad state. So I think, you know, um, Perhaps less focus on sharing individual details and more focus on sharing how systems architectures work and how they and how the technology can and can't do, and you know allowing regulation to be guided by that. Thank you, Eric. Seko, what's your opinion? Um, that's a bit out of my area of, of expertise because I'm more with the builders. Mm -hmm. So there would be something that a compliance officer or someone would be able to speak to. I'm more on advising developers as a solution architect. Okay, good. Uh, data sharing is, is, is a very tricky animal, uh, and especially if you're sharing that data with your regulator. Because uh, it, what data are you sharing with them? So the, I think there has to be clarity in terms of, because you know, at the end of the day, you're running a business. So if you're running a business, uh, there's some data, yes, you can share, some data you would not want to share. So I think, I think there's, it's, it's, a, it's a very dodgy animal, uh, which uh, probably might require a deeper understanding of what kind of data you, uh, the regulator's uh, needs um, and in, in what format that data needs to get to the regulator. Uh, so it's a, it's a very dicey animal, I must say. Because, uh, it's, look, it's, it's a business risk mm -hmm. uh, to share data. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you need to have... Um, proper structures, proper information, uh, and, and clarity on what data that you need to share. Interesting. I think the audience can give us comments, uh, can comment on the comment section if sharing is good, sharing is bad, but I think we depend on statistics a lot. So 
how do we support the regulator in ensuring they get data, analyze it, because we have data analysts here, give us the trends to be able to give us the right recommendation. But like you say, you have to do the cost-benefit analysis of doing the data sharing, so probably is a discussion we can have the next time. So what is the cost of not evolving as cybersecurity landscape is evolving and everyone is moving digital? What is the cost? To start with you, Ivy. I mean, if you look at what, who we're trying to protect ourselves from, they're leveraging the development of technology. So while we're, we're, you know, we're throwing words like machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, a lot of the automated capabilities that um, are being used right now to enhance technology and, and, and applications and whatnot, the attackers are doing the same. So to not evolve means the speed at which and the volumes to which these guys are working with, um, if you're not able to leverage technology to stay up to speed, because you know there's, there's some level of capacity that as security analysts and operations guys, we've been able to master because of what has happened over time. A lot of the tools we have um, are able to automate certain aspects of this, uh, of this um, of the protection, but if we don't, if you don't evolve one to be able to enhance your detection and response capabilities, mm -hmm. um, and also just ensure that you also have a stronghold on visibility, what will happen is one: if, if you have no visibility, you're moving a lot of your things to cloud. You have no idea, no control, uh, no security tools that are also um, keeping you to helping you to stay ahead. What's going to happen is, it's it's, it's not how it's just a matter of time before you are swallowed up in this whole uh, this whole big hole that's that's now what we call <laughs> cyber security but i think the idea is leveraging all the technology that we have that the attackers are using so that we also become more proactive as opposed to waiting to be more reactive when things happen oh thank you seko yeah i think it's critical that you understand that security is an evolving field continuously and you keep yourself abreast with the changes. Uh, you understand the ever-changing threat landscape that we live within. And um, as, you, as, as you are uh, building solutions, you understand whether it, it actually is fit for purpose given the area you're, 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 you're playing in. So think about uh, the what-if scenarios. What if a hacker was to take over my app? How would I, how would I handle that? What if my database was uh, wiped out. What would that mean for me? And have mitigating factors for that and keep up to date with what's happening in the industry because it's always moving forward. Thank you. And I can see time is not on our side, so I'll just wrap up the session. So to just end... One, one thing, let me just say one Sorry, thing. Harry, yes. um, for, for, for us, for you guys, you have to protect and defend and make sure you defend all the time. For the hacker, they just need one gap, and you're out. So that's what you need to think about. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. And that was to my question, the last uh, question. What advice would you give to the engineers, the developers, the data scientists? Because if you notice, most of them are introverts. They they like, okay, this is a managerial uh, discussion that don't bother me. What advice would you give to them? Because they are like the core of every business to be able to navigate this digital transformation and ensure the future is brighter. To all my panelists, so we'll start with Eric. Yeah, I think the most important thing is to learn to think like an attacker. So, you know, the, the technology changes. Um, and the threats change, but what doesn't change is the basic principles. And the basic principle is to think, um, as was just being mentioned, about what can happen and about how someone attack your system. And all too often, what I see is people design systems and they forget that you know what you have is an intelligent adversary who's trying to destroy what you're trying to do, and that you know anything they can do, they will do. And so, um, you know, that's a habit of thinking about how to build systems that w that will allow you to be successful in building secure systems going forward, even as the technology changes and the threat landscape changes. Thank you, Eric. To you, Harry. Then we have you next. I think to me is the, uh, we we just need to go deep. Um, in whatever we're doing, we 
Um, you, you know, there's, there's this tendency of just doing enough. Um, but I think if, if we want, you know, if we want to grow in our space, grow in what we're doing, then uh, we need to be better than the next person. So you need to go deep. And sometimes you just need to go deep one level. Um, and, and you differentiate yourself from everybody else and you become the best of class. So go deep. So my advice to you is think of a worst case scenario for your application, come up with a plan for it and be able to survive it. So don't say it will never happen. Thank you. Short and precise. Ivy? Actually, I've just realized everything I wanted to say is like a simpler version of what Harry said and what he said. Yeah. I would say one is be curious. Um, there's, there's, there's always something new every day. Um, and so if you want to stay ahead is stay curious. The, the other thing I wanted to add is assume the simplest of, of things could happen. Because sometimes, as, as techies, we could get very deep into the complexities of things. And where loopholes come up is from the simplest of things. So try stay simple in, when looking for loopholes, because it's in the simple things that a lot of the big things actually happen. Because everybody is looking for the big things. So if you try and once in a while switch off and just assume you are not that deep of a techie, you'll be surprised. Thank you to our audience, to the panel, Harry, Seko, and Ivy. Thank you for taking time to joining and sharing your insight. I hope the audience was well informed, well engaged with our panel, and we look forward to the next session. Over to you, Jiha, Bugwa. Thank you. Asante Sana. I think it's sufficient to say that you know, security is, uh, should be a primitive for everything that we build, right? and that we should, it should be front and center for literally everything that we as software engineers or the engineering community you know, put together. So a round of applause for Nyamohanga and our amazing panelists as they walk off stage. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, we have a very packed afternoon session. The CEO of Safaricom, Mr. Peter Degwa, will also be delivering his keynote speech then. So for now, I wish to release you for lunch a 35 minute lunch and I'll be sure to nudge you when you know, we, are, we are due for time for you to come back this way. Bon appétit. IT transformation is having a, a very significant impact on business outcomes, particularly within the Formula One environment. The pace of change within Formula One is really quite staggering. You've got tens or hundreds of thousands of data points streaming off the car in real time. The speed of that telemetry is increasing and therefore our speed to understand it and interpret it and to make decisions off the back of it needs to keep up with that. So there's not really any point where we can have downtime, there's not really any point where we can have a loss of service. The faster we can design components, the faster we can engineer components, the faster we can deliver changes to trackside. IT is a, an intrinsic part of that. You couldn't have those systems that enable the design and optimization without an IT platform underneath it. We need to ensure that we're finding those marginal performance gains within our server estate, our storage estate, the way we use a high performance compute. Every small amount of marginal gain that we can pull from the IT system directly transfers into optimized design and engineering. So it's very easy to draw a parallel between IT transformation and on-track performance. Having servers, storage, end-user compute all under one roof and all from a single vendor, that really makes our job in IT simpler. What's changed over the last two years for us is moving to infrastructure as code in order to better support a hybrid cloud operating model. Our ability to engineering community is a group of engineers who have come together uh, to have fun, uh, to transform lives and to build an engineering culture of perfection within the specific field that they are in. The community that I'm patterning is the community for software architecture. So the vision is to build a culture of developing solutions and designing solutions that are secure, 
that are com performant uh, within the environments that they work in and that also transform lives. We will equip the community members with the right skill set and knowledge to develop the next generation platforms that will be hardware agnostic. So this community will be looking at designing solutions that first of all are secure, that uh, perform very well when subjected to load, that also meet the needs of the customers, and then defining standards within which software is built. Having led developer communities in the past, I'm going to set up forums and events where the community members will be able to meet physically, collaborate, share ideas, create networks, and do follow-up events where members of the communities can showcase items they are proficient in or new knowledge areas that they are trying to learn and understand. My primary goal for this uh, engineering community will be to bring in experts from the market to work with young engineers, to grow their skill, to share engineering practices, and then also to give them a platform where they can show guess what they're doing. A strong community has is made up of people with different skill set, both junior and senior, who are able to collaborate freely, share feedback, receive feedback, do knowledge transfer whenever they meet, whenever someone reaches out for support. Looking at the way they'll be collaborating together, learning from each other, having fun with each other, and also sharing what they've learned from the community so that the community can grow bigger and bigger, depending on where they are based. I'm Victor Rwanda, I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. My name is Kenneth Awino, I am Safaricom Engineering Community. You see a lightning fast Formula One car, but McLaren saw a way to rapidly transform the healthcare industry. By taking the same predictive analytics powered by Dell Technologies to diagnose their race cars, Applying it to the human body, McLaren can help healthcare professionals provide more personalized solutions, which could in turn support even speedier recoveries. I think it's a Safaricom engineering community. Uh, to go to area. What's your cue? To what's your cue? Uh, Kenneth. <laughs> she, she jumped on the questions. So we, have, we have been using. <laughs> we will be using. You're pointing at Likata. Hey, I'll come back to the goal. One day back. Hi, my name is Naisanya Mungai. My name is Kama Umaina. Jacqueline Modani. My name is Felix Mene. My name is George Chuguna. Dennis Kipruto. I am Mark Koyer. My name is Ayan Kainan. My name is Kenneth Awino. I am David Kazi. Alan Kipsang. My name is Rose Maina. Cliff Kipkoge. I'm Jill Mora. My name is Rosanne Oguelo Diero. Bildad Mwangi. My name is Steven Chuguna Maina. Ngesa Marvin. My name is Beryl Anchep Kemoy. Victor Mwenda Rwanda. My name is Edna Njoroge. Benson Macharia. My name is Jude Juma. Desborn Kipto. And I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. I am 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 Safaricom Engineering Community. And I am Safaricom Engineering Community. 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 Mia ta si zambi wa take two. Ndoto kwa. I really deeply believe that you need to give more than what you receive, and that the best reward is the goodness that you will bring into this world. One of the most innovative program that I've seen is this solar powered classroom. It's a concept to bridge the educational divide in areas where uh, you are suffering not only from poverty, but also from lack of access to uh, energy. The solar learning labs are very important to Dell Technologies because it really embodies all aspects of how we drive social impact. It's fully sustainable. It reuses shipping containers that otherwise would have been discarded. And so it really exemplifies our circular economy. It clearly applies technology to drive transformation 
in youth and help benefit their education. And all of that together really helps develop this culture of inclusivity that is so important for us to address some of the most complex social issues that we have. When you provide technology access, it's just been incredibly transformative regardless of program, regardless of culture. Hemos diseñado un espacio que va a ser para el aprendizaje de jóvenes en habilidades del siglo XXI. It has helped me because I've been doing task math and it has been improving my grades from 60 to 98. We want to open up the opportunity for others to partner with us and so we're now enabling the crowdfunded approach so that we can scale the impact. Don't underestimate your capacity to transform the world. This is a land of wonder, the source of all life, the cradle of civilization. Right now, a wave of intelligence is spurring new growth. Cloud and AI are breathing new life into this fertile land of ours. Here, Intelligence connects all things, driving insights for a smarter future. Track weather changes, uncover the secrets of time and space. Explore the depths of the universe with relentless computing power. Tap into the pulse of Mother Nature, bringing smart agriculture to the field. Analyze geological structures to unearth more resources. Activate the value of data for more efficient use of energy. Accelerate viral gene analysis to save people's lives. On this land, computing unlocks boundless possibility. Build intelligent roads for a faster, safer drive home. Reclaim the desert and give life back to Earth. Free up workers with intelligent inspection. Jumpstart the digital economy with intelligent data infrastructure. Make minds safer, smarter. Teach and learn more freely anytime, anywhere. Push beyond limits and scale new heights. On this vibrant land, AI is driving an intelligent upgrade, powering industry growth. Together, we can build an open, collaborative ecosystem that thrives on shared success. On this fertile land, Let's build an intelligent world together with ubiquitous cloud and intelligence for all scenarios. feeling that uh, engineers are coders, they just code and that is it. But the reality is that uh, engineering, um, also engineering basically involves being able to create products that change life. So Safaricom Engineering actually a uh, community entails being able to create products that are able to change the world in terms of how we operate. So the vision, uh, mostly when it comes to product management, is to be able to create products that are able to change life. Yeah, I think community participation uh, is, is more geared up to the com comfortability that people have within the, the community. So my intention to that is to ensure that the communication line uh, is simple, 
and of course um, ensure that we remove bureaucracy to ensure that uh, decisions are not only made by the leads but also the community itself. The goal will be to bring on board engineers who are able to understand products that they're able to put in place. So you move, you move away from being able to do a code work to a point of whereby you look at the value that you create with your products across board. The chapters will impact the technology community uh, specifically uh, on innovation. We will ensure that we have uh, products that are aligned to the community's vision in terms of technology and uh, a vision uh, with Safaricom uh, in which we, in, we ensure that we have a sustainable environment and also impact uh, lives outside uh, uh, for the community to have a sense of uh, pride to, within themselves. So number one will be to create an enabling environment for engineers to be able to um, interact easily, engage easily, share information, to be able to feel the voice are heard. So the, the impact to the world uh, from our community and especially the products area is to ensure these products uh, that the community is providing uh, to the world is uh, 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 products that are more sustainable, future-proof, and they are products that they can actually uh, be replicated outside the community and outside Safaricom uh, to ensure that uh, more and more lives are impacted uh, within our areas. What I believe makes a strong uh, community is a team that works together, that collaborates. Being able to pull different brains and different ideas across board um, will be able to change the world. A strong community is a community that has, have passion to what they are doing. Uh, and, and this passion should give them a, pride, a sense of pride uh, that uh, uh, they belong to a community that is listening to them and also providing opportunities within uh, their area. I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. Safaricom Engineering Community uh, to me means a platform where a group of engineers come together to share ideas, build solutions together and have fun. Uh, my vision for the community is to make it the best place to be where we can be able to build value-based IoT solutions uh, that can be able to transform lives. I hope to see the guys who have never built electronics before to be able to get over the first few bumps of playing with electronics, of writing uh, some code into, into these bare metals. My primary focus for the IoT community would be to create a community that will be loved across the country and indeed across the globe. Number two would be that we can be able to push for adoption of IoT applications for commercial uh, use cases and in there be able to create efficiencies that uh, can be applied through IoT technology. We're going to ensure that we have a range of sessions and we're going to have a discussion with people on how they could get started with building these devices and then go into uh, having more events focused on intermediate sessions and then expert sessions and also in between we're going to have some kind of hackathons where people can be able to use these skills to be in a real environment where they're able to grow by building products. The other bit will be uh, to create and of course contribute to the IoT industry 
um, by benchmarking with others across the globe, uh, contribute to the standards, and then weigh into the big area around big data and machine learning that can then be able to help us uh, drive use cases or build value or get value out of the data that we mine through IoT. Um, the other bit would be also to um, make good use of technologies like narrowband IoT, where we can be able to create solutions um, specifically using NB IoT, and therefore um, create solutions that can be able to, you know, work longer for longer durations using, um, uh, you know, low energy and uh, having longer battery, battery lifetime. A strong community is a community where um, it attracts all sorts of talent, not only engineering but also people who have interest in technology. A strong community is a community that uh, fosters collaboration, uh, where we can be able to, you know, create virtual sessions, events together, you know, uh, uh, hack together for solutions, being able to pick up uh, scenarios, investigate and find solutions together, develop and co-create uh, applications that can be used uh, not only for commercial reasons, but to better the life um, of everyone. We should expect events across the year, uh, some in-person events where the organizers have very close engagement with attendees, uh, things like code labs. And then we're also going to have some events where we will talk about our products or generally the general products in the market. And then also big events which probably focus on networking and talking to people and, and things like that. My name is Ngesa Marvin and I am Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. First Ant-Man, I shrank down so small that I hit a quantum scale. Daddy, help! Oh no. Yes. And it's the first time Hank has ever been exposed to somebody who could go down there and come back. And that begins to set in his mind the idea that maybe he can go get Hope's mother back. In Ant-Man and the Wasp, we're gonna explore the quantum realm. We start to play with the whole notion of scale. It's not just about being tiny, it's not just about being giant, it's about all of those scales in between. Scaling things up in this movie has been a real treat. This is the control room of Hank Pym's laboratory. When we're making a film that revolves around technology and science and engineering and quantum physics, we need some of the most cutting edge technology to help us tell our story. And man the was rely on high performing technology to be able to save the world, to be able to fight crime. Their superpowers are technology. That's what Dell is about. So we thought that this was a really good fit for both sides. And man and the wasp teaming up. You will see Ant-Man size action and giant size action, and you may see a lot of different size action in between. <laughs> Having amazing visuals allows them to immerse themselves in the world. Maybe you just need someone watching your back, like a partner. Will they be able to work as a team together? Will she be able to find her lost mother? Set against the backdrop of quantum realms and shrinking and growing, that's the fun of making an Ant-Man movie. I don't want to die. We didn't die. I dare you to blink, because things don't stop moving. Eh, what'd I miss? We were just tiny. think about a, an ecosystem, a community, I think one, one most important thing is that people need to feel that they belong. I think second, it needs to have a purpose. And I think third, the community needs to be able to, to be successful, to feed into the members what are their aspirations, what are their needs, what are the things that you can actually pull together, you as a corporate like Safaricom, and give to the community so that the community can grow. So it might be access to things like, uh, are there environments that are there? It could be training materials. It could also be opportunities to collaborate and learn.
from even some of the more seasoned engineers. If we really look at the evolution of technology uh, from where we came from, from to where we are today, I think in software engineering is really where, where the place is to be. It's really bringing together so many different and diverse technologies. So at Safaricom, we feel there is a need to have it. I think so many of the other technology disciplines have had communities uh, organized. But I think as we evolve to become a purpose-led technology company, uh, software engineering really is at the heart of it. As we look to build solutions, not just to digitize and automate uh, the experiences of our customers and give them new products, but also to digitize the way we work at Safaricom. But we do recognize as a trendsetter in, in society, as the largest uh, organization in the region, the largest tech company really, that we need to then be a leader and not wait for anybody else. We've also seen a lot of uh, big tech players uh, coming into the market and they're looking at our software engineers, they're looking at software engineering in Kenya. So we believe by having a community we can all come together, create more opportunities, uh, really not uh, look at the challenges we face perhaps in terms of competing for talent, but how can we actually build a strong community that can attract so many people into it and then be the strongest, most vibrant, have the largest contribution, but also realize that engineers are not just there to take, they can also give a lot more than just coding. How do we also create opportunities, I believe, across Kenya, where a young man, a young lady in some far remote area is able to access this community to get opportunities to learn to access perhaps technology like cloud environments, uh, big data play areas, for example, where they can actually begin to learn, but also begin to practice and plug into mentors who can guide them as they start their technology journey and also grow in it. I think one of the most exciting things we're seeing in the software engineering space is most of the people are young. And I think they're moving at a very fast pace. I think that the democratization of technology means that somebody can actually pop in today with a new technology that you didn't even know about and tell you how it's applicable and can do things way better than what we're using. You know, how do we harness all those great ideas and be able to build stuff for Kenya by Kenyans? So the impact I see to society of a strong engineering community is also being able to democratize technology where they can actually build solutions that are going to have a huge impact, not just in their own families, because they're able to perhaps bring money, but even address some of the societal problems that their communities have always faced. But it just needed somebody with that lens, it needed somebody with that skill set, it needed somebody with that opportunity to be able to address it. So I see the impact not just being within Safaricom, but where our purpose as Safaricom is transforming lives. And this becomes yet another way that we use technology to transform lives. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. IT transformation is having a, a very significant impact on business outcomes, particularly within the Formula One environment. The pace of change within Formula One is really quite staggering. You've got tens or hundreds of thousands of data points streaming off the car in real time. The speed of that telemetry is increasing and therefore our speed to understand it and interpret it and to make decisions off the back of it needs to keep up with that. So there's not really any point where we can have downtime, there's not really any point where we can have a loss of service. The faster we can design components, the faster we can engineer components, the faster we can deliver changes to trackside. IT is a, an intrinsic part of that. You couldn't have those systems that enable the design and optimization without an IT platform underneath it. We need to ensure that we're finding those marginal performance gains within our server estate, our storage estate, the way we use a high performance compute. Every small amount of marginal gain that we can pull from the IT system directly transfers into optimized design and engineering. So it's very easy to draw a parallel between IT transformation and on-track performance. Having servers, storage, end-user compute, all under one roof and all from a single vendor, that really makes our job in IT simpler. 
What's changed over the last two years for us is moving to infrastructure as code in order to better support a hybrid cloud operating model. Our ability to take services and run applications as easily on-premise as we would in a cloud environment, that's how IT can streamline itself as a function, that's how IT can focus on delivering value into the rest of the business. Working with Dell Technologies actually gives us a partner to run that with. Having good shared insight of our own McLaren roadmap and the Dell Technologies roadmap helps us keep aligned as to where we're going to go next and where do we see risk in where we're going next, where are we maybe pushing too fast, but also where are we not pushing fast enough. Efficiency, cost, productivity. Business as usual has always been about turning a profit. If you stop to think about it, what more is there? The universe. Nature. Life. Civilization as we know it is about the search for something greater than ourselves. Huawei Cloud is innovating technologies to make the world more inclusive. The Cloud, AI, 5G are building a fully connected, intelligent world. They do more than drive digital transformation. It's a new paradigm for innovation. Imagine, if you can, what amazing secrets await when we unlock the secrets of the universe. What cosmic answers will we learn? AI can help preserve in the rainforest by identifying the sounds of gunshots or the sounds of illegal logging, protecting the most precious sounds, birds and trees for generations to come. In cities around the world, we can collect traffic data and analyze it to improve transportation and bring order to a chaotic world. Even reporting the weather can be improved with AI. With more accurate forecasts and timely alerts, we'll travel safer and get home to our loved ones. Also, so many delicious flavors, chili, herbs, and spices automatically selected to improve flavor, quality, and nutrition. Delightful flavor explosions to dazzle our taste buds. A cloud for everyone. Unleashing the power of innovation, making every day better. A cloud for pervasive intelligence and a better future. Huawei Cloud. Grow with intelligence.
would have thought you could grow a plant in a warehouse instead of a field? Without sun, without soil. We're doing it, and we're not only doing it on an experimental level, we're doing it on a commercial level. Today we focus on leafy greens. We believe we could grow anything. Our vision is to build farms in cities all over the world to allow everyone to have access to fresh, great tasting, healthy food all year round. The fact that we could grow plants using 95% less water, zero pesticides, as much as 390 times the productivity per square foot as a field farmer shows what technology can do. We're able to understand the plants better than anyone ever in the history of farming, and it's by the data. And this is why the relationship with Dell Technologies is so valuable. We are collecting all of these data points of what we're giving the plant, what spectrum of light, what nutrients, how do we improve quality, taste, texture. We're using data analytics and becoming better farmers. At the end of the day, it's about how do we deliver a better product to the customer. This is Aero Farms Baby Kale. This is going to be packed the flavor of kale. The watercress had those peppery notes. The bok choy is super juicy. This is what I love about Aero Farms is that it's like technology that's allowing people to farm better and smarter, and it makes really delicious food. The world needs a new paradigm of how we're going to feed this planet. Aero Farms is illustrative of what technology can do to provide more with less. IT transformation is having a, a very significant impact on business outcomes, particularly within the Formula One environment. The pace of change within Formula One is really quite staggering. You've got tens or hundreds of thousands of data points streaming off the car in real time. The speed of that telemetry is increasing, and therefore our speed to understand it and interpret it and to make decisions off the back of it needs to keep up with that. So there's not really any point where we can have downtime, there's not really any point where we can have a loss of service. The faster we can design components, the faster we can engineer components, the faster we can deliver changes to trackside. IT is a, an intrinsic part of that. You couldn't have those systems that enable the design and optimization without an IT platform underneath it. We need to ensure that we're finding those marginal performance gains within our server estate, our storage estate, the way we use a high performance compute. Every small amount of marginal gain that we can pull from the IT system directly transfers into optimized design and engineering. So it's very easy to draw a parallel between IT transformation and on-track performance. Having servers, storage, end-user compute, all under one roof and all from a single vendor, that really makes our job in IT simpler. What's changed over the last two years for us is moving to infrastructure as code in order to better support a hybrid cloud operating model. Our ability to take services and run applications as easily on-premise as we would in a cloud environment, that's how IT can streamline itself as a function, that's how IT can focus on delivering value into the rest of the business. Working with Dell Technologies actually gives us a partner to run that with. Having Good shared insight of our own McLaren roadmap and the Dell Technologies roadmap helps us keep aligned as to where we're going to go next and where do we see risk in where we're going next, where are we may be pushing too fast, but also where we're we not pushing fast enough. Our purpose and goal is to uh, empower communities to prosper by providing access uh, to financial services, which include payments, wealth, insurance, cross-border payments, and many more. Uh, the goal of the community is to uh, open up uh, our fintech platforms, basically the Mpesa ecosystem, 
to partners and developers. So we continue to do this through uh, providing a one-stop shop uh, uh, for all our APIs to, uh, to develop a community uh, where we have comprehensive documentation and as well as also the tools and standard APIs that can uh, facilitate the, how fast uh, the uh, developers can uh, integrate to a, a system. Uh, we also uh, con con continually um, you know, provide uh, uh, or facilitate hackathons, developer jams, uh, so that we can uh, train uh, the developer community uh, to actually learn and be able to consume our APIs. Uh, once, of course, we've equipped the developer community uh, and opening up our ecosystem to the rest of the world. So we can actually uh, empower uh, the, the individuals to build products and services, basically different use cases, on top of M-Pesa co uh, ecosystem. And, and for, for instance, uh, across the world, uh, we have APIs that can allow um, you know, partners and developers to move money across the world, so in and out uh, of Kenya and also fintech ecosystem. Hi, my name is Esbon Kipta. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. IT transformation is having a, a very significant impact on business outcomes, particularly within the Formula One environment. The pace of change within Formula One is really quite staggering. You've got tens or hundreds of thousands of data points streaming off the car in real time. The speed of that telemetry is increasing and therefore our speed to understand it and interpret it and to make decisions off the back of it needs to keep up with that. So there's not really any point where we can have downtime, there's not really any point where we can have a loss of service. The faster we can design components, the faster we can engineer components, the faster we can deliver changes to Trackside. IT is a, an intrinsic part of that. You couldn't have those systems that enable the design and optimization without an IT platform underneath it. We need to ensure that we're finding those marginal performance gains within our server estate, our storage estate, the way we use a high performance compute. Every small amount of marginal gain that we can pull from the IT system directly transfers into optimized design and engineering. So it's very easy to draw a parallel between IT transformation and on-track performance. Having servers, storage, end-user compute, all under one roof and all from a single vendor, that really makes our job in IT simpler. What's changed over the last two years for us is moving to infrastructure as code in order to better support a hybrid cloud operating model. Our ability to take services and run applications as easily on-premise as we would in a cloud environment, that's how IT can streamline itself as a function, that's how IT can focus on delivering value into the rest of the business. Working with Dell Technologies actually gives us a partner to run that with. Having good shared insight of our own McLaren roadmap and the Dell Technologies roadmap helps us keep aligned as to where we're going to go next and where do we see risk in where we're going next, where are we may be pushing too fast but also where we're we not pushing fast enough. Who would have thought you could grow a plant in a warehouse instead of a field? Without sun, without soil. We're doing it, and we're not only doing it on an experimental level, we're doing it on a commercial level. Today we focus on leafy greens. We believe we could grow anything. Our vision is to build farms in cities all over the world to allow everyone to have access to fresh, great tasting, healthy food all year round. The fact that we could grow plants using 95% less water, zero pesticides, as much as 390 times the productivity per square foot as a field farmer shows what technology can do. 
we're able to understand the plants better than anyone ever in the history of farming, and it's by the data. And this is why the relationship with Dell Technologies is so valuable. We are collecting all of these data points of what we're giving the plant. What spectrum of light? What nutrients? How do we improve quality, taste, texture? We're using data analytics and becoming better farmers. At the end of the day, it's about how do we deliver a better product to the customer. This is Aero Farms baby kale. This is going to be pack the flavor of kale. The watercress had those peppery notes. The bok choy is super juicy. This is what I love about Aero Farms is that it's like technology that's allowing people to farm better and smarter, and it makes really delicious food. The world needs a new paradigm of how we're going to feed this planet. Aero Farms is illustrative of what technology can do to provide more with less. I really deeply believe that you need to give more than what you receive and that the best reward is the goodness that you will bring into this world. And one of the most innovative programs that I've seen is the solar powered classroom. It's a concept to bridge the educational divide in areas where uh, you are suffering not only from poverty, but also from lack of access to uh, energy. The Solar Learning Labs are very important to Dell Technologies because it really embodies all aspects of how we drive social impact. It's fully sustainable. It reuses shipping containers that otherwise would have been discarded, and so it really exemplifies our circular economy. It clearly applies technology to drive transformation in youth and help benefit their education. And all of that together really helps develop this culture of inclusivity that is so important for us to address some of the most complex social issues that we have. When you provide technology access, it's just been incredibly transformative regardless of program, regardless of culture. Hemos diseñado un espacio que va a ser para el aprendizaje de jóvenes en habilidades del siglo XXI. It has helped me because I've been doing task math and it has been improving my grades from 60 to 98. We want to open up the opportunity for others to partner with us and so we're now enabling the crowdfunded approach so that we can scale the impact. Don't underestimate your capacity to transform the world. You know, there's a feeling that uh, engineers are coders, they just code, that, that is it. But the reality is that uh, engineering, um, also engineering basically involves being able to create products that change life. So Safaricom Engineering actually a uh, community entails being able to create products that are able to change the world in terms of how we operate. So the vision, uh, mostly when it comes to product management, is to be able to create products that are able to change life. Yeah, I think community participation uh, is, is more geared up to the com comfortability that people have within the, the community. So my intention to that is to ensure that the communication line uh, is simple and of course um, ensure that we remove bureaucracy to ensure that uh, decisions are not only made by the leads but also the community itself. The goal will be to bring on board engineers who are able to understand products that they're able to put in place. So you move, you move away from being able to do a code work to a point of whereby you look at the value that you create with your products across board. The chapters will impact the technology community uh, specifically uh, on innovation. We will ensure that we have uh, products that are aligned to the community's vision in terms of technology and uh, a vision uh, with Safaricom uh, in which we, en we ensure that we have a sustainable environment and also impact uh, lives outside uh, uh, for the community to have a sense of uh, pride to within themselves.
So number one will be to create an enabling environment for engineers to be able to um, interact easily, engage easily, share information, to be able to feel the ways I had. So the, the impact to the world uh, from our community and especially the products area is to ensure these products uh, that the community is providing uh, to the world is uh, uh, products that are more sustainable, future-proof, and they are products that they can actually uh, be replicated outside the community and outside Safaricom uh, to ensure that uh, more and more lives are impacted uh, within our areas. What I believe makes a strong uh, community is a team that works together, that collaborates. Being able to pull different brains and different ideas across board um, will be able to change the world. A strong community is a community that has, have passion to what they are doing. Uh, and, and this passion should give them a, pride, a sense of pride uh, that uh, uh, they belong to a community that is listening to them and also providing opportunities within uh, their area. I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. The future of money is simple, like unlocking possibilities with a smile and having the world in the palm of your hand. It's the ability to touch many lives at the same time and turn your dreams into reality. It's forgetting and still remembering. Simple is having everything that you love in one place. From the ticket to your next meal, to your ticket to the next holiday. It's an easy way to ask for a boost when you're low. And keeping track of everything on the go. The future of money is simple and it's here. Download the new Mpesa app today. My name's Derek Wesonga. Yeah, I've been at Safaricom for the last three years now. I am the Enterprise Digital Engagement Lead. Before that, I was the Digital Channel Stack Lead and our Digital Engineering. When I was making the career choice, it came down to between law and uh, computer science. And all I knew is I didn't like talking a lot. So software engineering was, it seemed more appealing sitting behind a computer as opposed to being in a courtroom the whole day. The digital transformation definition is uh, where you're using digital technology to transform you know, business processes and communication. My key job really is to ensure that our customers have a good experience accessing our products. Probably the most important attribute that can make a person successful in software engineering is curiosity. If you look at the industry right now, we have a lot of young talent coming in and uh, that has enabled people to work in teams as opposed to before where, you know, it used to be certain, you know, individuals. But right now we have so many more guys doing this thing. You know, in terms of customer obsession, we actually really, you know, feel that we are quite close to the customers. Uh, whenever we release something positive, like for example in my previous role, when you're working with my Safari come up, anything positive we will get feedback almost immediately. You know, through their uh, you know normal channels and also through you know Twitter, especially if it's something wrong. Predicting the future is quite hard, right? They say um, the pandemic was a great technology accelerator. We're going to have a lot more remote teams. I think that's, that's a guarantee. And then, uh, you know, in terms of borders, as far as software engineering is concerned, it's going to be a really change. So before we could only hire engineers from, you know, Kenya, but even right now as I speak, my team is composed of engineers in Nigeria, Ghana, and even Uganda. So I, I think um, that's really the kind of trend that is going to go. So basically being more of global citizens. For our dream to be accomplished, we have to work with very many stakeholders, some in technology, stakeholders in business, and you know, the other guys have their own priorities. So basically getting them to buy into this single vision that we have probably is the most challenging part of my, my job. Digital transformation has impacted my role. 
I would say like for example some of the ideas we would want to implement before that were really hard. Right now with the whole digital transformation going on, we have a lot more ears listening to us. Case in Point is a project that I have right now. It's something that we just were pushing with my former boss uh, from last year and uh, you know this year it became a reality. My parting shot is from Ludwig van Beethoven and uh, he says don't just practice your art but force your way into its secrets because for it and knowledge will force men into the divine. A big shout out to the Enterprise IT team led by Alan, the DIT team, and my team, SME Platforms. transformation is having a, a very significant impact on business outcomes, particularly within the Formula One environment. The pace of change within Formula One is really quite staggering. You've got tens or hundreds of thousands of data points streaming off the car in real time. The speed of that telemetry is increasing and therefore our speed to understand it and interpret it and to make decisions off the back of it needs to keep up with that. So there's not really any point where we can have downtime, there's not really any point where we can have a loss of service. The faster we can design components, the faster we can engineer components, the faster we can deliver changes to trackside. IT is a, an intrinsic part of that. You couldn't have those systems that enable the design and optimization without an IT platform underneath it. We need to ensure that we're finding those marginal performance gains within our server estate, our storage estate, the way we use a high performance compute. Every small amount of marginal gain that we can pull from the IT system directly transfers into optimized design and engineering. So it's very easy to draw a parallel between IT transformation and on-track performance. Having servers, storage, end-user compute, all under one roof and all from a single vendor, that really makes our job in IT simpler. What's changed over the last two years for us is moving to infrastructure as code in order to better support a hybrid cloud operating model. 
Our ability to take services and run applications as easily on-premise as we would in a cloud environment, that's how IT can streamline itself as a function, that's how IT can focus on delivering value into the rest of the business. Working with Dell Technologies actually gives us a partner to run that with. Having good shared insight of our own McLaren roadmap and the Dell Technologies roadmap helps us keep aligned as to where we're going to go next and where do we see risk in where we're going next, where we may be pushing too fast, but also where we're not pushing fast enough. Efficiency, cost, productivity, business as usual has always been about turning a profit. If you stop to think about it, what more is there? The universe, nature, life, civilization as we know it is about the search for something greater than ourselves. Huawei Cloud is innovating technologies to make the world more inclusive. The Cloud, AI, 5G are building a fully connected, intelligent world. They do more than drive digital transformation. It's a new paradigm for innovation. Imagine, if you can, what amazing secrets await when we unlock the secrets of the universe. What cosmic answers will we learn? AI can help preserve in the rainforest by identifying the sounds of gunshots or the sounds of illegal logging, protecting the most precious sounds, birds and trees for generations to come. In cities around the world, we can collect traffic data and analyze it to improve transportation and bring order to a chaotic world. Even reporting the weather can be improved with AI. With more accurate forecasts and timely alerts, we'll travel safer and get home to our loved ones. Also, so many delicious flavors, chili, herbs, and spices automatically selected to improve flavor, quality, and nutrition. Delightful flavor explosions to dazzle our taste buds. A cloud for everyone, unleashing the power of innovation, making every day better. A cloud for pervasive intelligence and a better future. Huawei Cloud. Grow with intelligence. This is a land of wonder. The source of all life. The cradle of civilization. Right now, a wave of intelligence is spurring new growth. Cloud and AI are breathing new life into this fertile land of our. Here, intelligence connects all things, driving insights for a smarter future. Track weather changes, uncover the secrets of time and space. Explore the depths of the universe with relentless computing power. Tap into the pulse of Mother Nature, bringing smart agriculture to the field. Analyze geological structures to unearth more resources. Activate the value of data for more efficient use of energy. Accelerate viral gene analysis to save people's lives. On this land, computing unlocks boundless possibility. Build
Hello, hello. Hi, guys. Good afternoon. After hefty lunch, guys are looking sleepy. Please, if you're still in the dining area, make your way to the main hall. If you're still in the dining area, make your way to the main hall. We're about to get into the afternoon session with, with a number of presentations by some of our sponsors. But as a point of information, because you know earlier we had looked at the Impesa ecosystem, the Daraja API, and numerous other things that um, at one point or another interact with user data. Point of information that there has been an update on you know, the, the process flow for the Data Protection Act. And now, if you're a data controller, if you're a data processor, you must, must, must now proceed on with reg registration to make yourself um, officially certified to do uh, what you need to do with, um, with user data. So once more, making a call for those still in the dining area to join us in the main auditorium for a segment that you're calling the new tech category. And here we'll have two presentations. And I'd like to call upon James Karanja from Dell, who's going to walk us through a demo for cloud infrastructure as code. James Karanja, stage is yours. So good afternoon. So I'm the first session after lunch, so I believe we'll try to keep it light. Uh, my name is James Karanja, and uh, just a quick correction, infrastructure as cloud was done today in the morning, so there was no need to repeat it. So we are going to talk about emerging trends in cloud, focusing mostly on developers and operators at a one-on-one -on -one level. So mostly based on my review of the crowd, the young people who are looking at um, joining enterprises, what they should be aware of, and of course it also benefit people who go beyond the one-on-one -on -one level. So there we go, uh, just a basic introduction. My name is James Karanja. I work for Dell, focusing mostly on modern data center infrastructure and DevOps, but the operation part, not the developer part, but the operations part. And that's it about me, you won't hear anything about me. And we'll talk about, like, for the sake of everyone, I want to assume we all know what cloud computing is, but you never assume in such an, an, an environment. It's just like for developers or anybody out there, it's that maybe I want to run something and all I need is can I get these resources on demand? And that's just at the highest level what cloud computing is. Can I get them on demand whenever I want them? And can I be able to scale up or scale out in any form in them? So. Industry trends, who determines them? So it can be your friend who can be able to determine where the trends are going. But for most people sitting in enterprises or people who are joining enterprises, young people, or people want to know. So we have analysts who are able to do this. Some of the analysts outside there are people like IDC. They tell us where the world is going, where the industry is going. And another form of analyst who everyone knows is Gartner. So basically, they tell you, this is the industry you're working on. This is where we want to be, and this is where maybe you should be focusing your, your time on. And most of these I'm showing you are mostly cloud-related. And of course, other ways of knowing where the world is going is via, of course, online. We normally know what's going on, but usually there is so much out there going on such that you don't know what to focus on. So what and why? So most of the time, us as engineers, like I was chatting with somebody out there, we normally know the how. If you tell somebody, deploy something, they easily can't do it, right? But the, normally the question is what, why, why am I doing it? And what, what is it that I'm doing? So for an emerging trend perspective and what we are seeing right now in the industry and what you are seeing that people are looking at, especially when you're looking at developer side and operator side, focusing on tech, of course there are other people focused on the business side of things. We are seeing a lot of multi-cloud. And from a multi-cloud perspective is like taking an organization like Safaricom. Maybe today they work with AWS, right? Tomorrow they work with Azure, and they work maybe with other kinds of cloud. So they may have whereby an organization decides to have different workloads sitting in different places. And this can be driven by various uh, organizational needs. Maybe it's a compliance need, maybe it's a costing and everything. Of course, there is hybrid cloud, where majority of the people are moving towards. That's the capability to move 
uh, data in and out of your data center most of the time. You have invested maybe in a local data center and you want to move your workloads in and out of them. So as developers, we'll cover like, what do I need to ensure that when I'm building such applications, they can be able to work in a multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. And of course, there is edge computing. As the world has moved, as we collect more data and as we analyze more data, the, the time taken maybe to move this data towards a centralized location, make quick decisions and everything, sometimes it takes a lot of time. So what happens is that we provide some small of compute instance, maybe running somewhere near the edge where something is happening. Think of it like in terms of a factory. You have a factory, multiple factories, maybe you want to be able to make decision making. And for example, I can use a good example, for, for example, Safaricom. As we move towards a world of software-defined uh, world, right? So maybe the BTS is just a dumb thing, then they may attach a small computer there to be able to make quick decisions at the edge, and then after that, maybe they can move them to the, to the core. So basically, as a developer, you may need one to think like, how do I ensure that whatever I build can be able to work seamlessly in such an environment? Of course, serverless, for which we'll cover much more in details, We'll cover, we'll do a basic introduction to containers and Kubernetes, basically talking about what it is and at a high level what it can cover. And last but not least, we'll cover cloud native architectures. As I've mentioned, there is so much happening around cloud. The idea is where do I want to spend my time in and where do I want to focus on going forward. So, so going forward, I'll just spend a few minutes uh, talking about the three topics on there and I'll start with containers and Kubernetes. So. So let's talk about containers. So basically we'll talk about the idea of how from an, us people in ops, how we've grown from where we were. A few years ago, we used to deploy infrastructure on what you call bare metal servers, right? So we could, we, as a developer, all you had to do was build your code, then you tell somebody somewhere, here's my code, run it. So when that person takes your code, runs it and does that, and of course, there are issues back then, constraints of resources, maybe you want to launch a new project, but because they don't have those physical resources, it takes maybe six to nine months to launch a project, which of course does not sit down with the world which is currently fast moving. And after that, we moved into what we call virtualization, whereby we could take a physical server, light to it, that it can host multiple operating systems, right? And now what you're seeing is that you're seeing the trend moving towards more of containerization and Finally, even you're having uh, people talking about serverless. And the idea is that once doesn't mean that you have to do everything in one way. Everything has its own fit at the end of the day. So what's a container? It's just a standardized way of packaging code. So you take um, your code plus all its dependencies, package it to something into a container, and then put it in a runtime where it will be able to run. So you take, for example, and the beauty about it is that uh, it's the portability that it provides you. So today you can be able to like for example, long time ago, you, you, how many people have said it runs on my laptop, right? It works on my laptop. We all know ourselves, right? And then when you give it to operations, they tell it's not working. So the idea around containerization, it allows you to standardize. So when you build that container, it can be able to run on your laptop. It can go into your, into your data center and it can go to the cloud and allowing that portability. So it's a way of doing that. And from a technology perspective, it's not a new concept, right? So the key three things that make up a concept uh, container and to be able to run it is one, you create a namespace for it, so it's a process, you run it at a process level, basically, so you create a namespace for it, you isolate and virtualize the process to ensure that it's, called, it's on its own. Of course, we have all these terminologies came back from the back days of Linux. Then we have the C groups where you put like resource usage. Of course, we don't have infinite resources. You decide what am I giving it? What kind of memory? What kind of compute am I doing? And of course, with everything, it's normally driven from a security first perspective. Most of the time, as we develop systems as ops, sometimes we put security in the back burner, right? It's just trying to make it work. And then that's what actually does make um, a Linux container or something like that. And of course, we have different um, ways of doing this. So, and why do developers love containers, as I've mentioned? It works on every machine. So those people, of, you don't deliver a project on time, you claim it was working on your laptop. Uh, of course, those days are gone. Uh, it takes the pain out of CI, CD. I'm sure somebody has spoken about CI-CD, but basically the continuous integration and development. As organizations, as we move, we've moved from traditional ways of deploying software. So traditionally, we used to take how many months to, to take a version one to version two? Six to nine months, 
but in the current age that we want, we want to be able to be continuously innovating and not doing like forklift upgrades or something like that. So it has taken the pain out of that because all you have to do is build your container and when you're not happy with it, it's just repackage it again and then publish it again, right? Um, of course, it raises productivity because now at most of the time, the developer and the operations are able to speak in one language, especially when it comes to deployments. So you no longer have an area of conflict. It's easy to deploy, just package your application, test it, give it to your people, they run it for you in the operations uh, area. Of course, it standardizes your development uh, and deployment methods, so you create some form of repeatability. As you build software, repeatability is very important. So whatever you have used that, it can be able to do that. I mentioned about portability. Right? You can easily port your application between different cloud providers from your laptop, all those things for various reasons. And when it comes to application upgrades, since everything you are defining as code, right, all you have to do is moving from version 1 to version 2 is just making a few changes, making sure the dependency works, and then you are doing an upgrade. So those days of taking a few months or years to be able to do an upgrade is, is, is done. Of course, it makes application rollback very easy. If you've done an upgrade, and then it's not working, all you have to do is just run the previous version and just scale it as you await to do the changes. And of course, for we are developers, right? We are people in engineering, we like playing with things. So it gives you the capabilities to try new apps at maybe a cost-effective way. You don't need to invest in a lot of infrastructure to be able to do that. So that's the level of containers, and that's where we started at. After containers, an important thing came around, especially at scale. We were talking about how do we manage this? How do you ensure that as an organization, how do you ensure like, for example, if I have multiple nodes, how do I ensure availability, right? How do I ensure that my systems are always up? How do I scale? Today I have an application being accessed by a thousand people. Tomorrow I need to move to 10,000, right? On the instance, can I be able to do that instantly? So that's where um, Kubernetes came in. It's a Google project. Uh, and what it does is that it provides container orchestration and management at scale. Of course, this is more or less how it looks like, it has multiple co components, and if anyone is interested for the sake of time, I, I have like a demo running on my laptop and we can go through the various concepts that comes with it, of course, but basically you have um, a controller, which is like the brain, which makes a lot of decisions for you, and then you have the database, the ETCD database, that's where it stores all your, um, your configuration data, all those things. And now you have the workers. So basically the workers are what we like to consider either a virtual machine or a physical server. And this is where the actual processing happens. And on top of it, now you have what we call the pods. So the pods are logical organization of containers. It's the minimal uh, deployment version in Kubernetes. So maybe you have an app which has like four, four containers running in it, right? You create it as a pod. And the concepts get deeper and complex as you go in an enterprise, because things like networking, where you have to choose how to handle your networking, of course there is the container network interface plugin, which you have to figure out how, which kind of networking do you want to do, and how you're going to manage it. And of course, another new development is what we call the CSI plugin. As we all started in this world, containers were very easy to do what we call non-persistent. They didn't require persistent storage, so you could maybe run and Nginx maybe front end, because you don't store any data on it. If it dies, you just restart it, right? You don't need to, to redo it again. You don't need to store any data. But as they become most mainstream in the environment, we are finding ourselves trying to, to like provide some form of persistent storage. So there is something called the Container Storage Interface Plugin, which you can be able to provide persistent storage to your containers. So basically, slowly and slowly, it's becoming part of an enterprise um, deployment or a part of the enterprise organization just as like VMs were and as physical servers were. So that's just the basics of what Kubernetes and containers do. So they work hand in hand. You have the runtime engine, for example, here we have Docker. You have the kubelet, which is like, um, provides the connectivity with the controller to understand things like, for example, healing, auto balancing, if I want to scale and all those things. So I mentioned something which is Apart from that, so we are building something around how do we de develop for the enterprise at a one-on-one -on -one level. So we've talked about multi-cloud. We've spoken about hybrid cloud. And you need to be able to develop consistently across this environment. So one of the things that as developers need to understand is are we building cloud-native architectures? So those days of building 
environments in a monolith way whereby it was just a single operation, a single application requiring very, very specific hardware to run on it, a rover. So basically you're trying to build something that can be able to do that. And majority of what I got from the cloud native is, if you remember, it, we got the, there is a whole organization called the Cloud Native Foundation. What they do is they incubate um, cloud native solutions and technologies around it. So basically, it's, the idea is, can I be able to build and run applications at scale? So can I start with a single application? Can I take that application, easily make 10 copies without any downtime, right? Or without using a lot of resources? And can I run it across public, private, and hybrid clouds? And the tenants that cover cloud native architecture, as you can see, we have containers, they play a key part. Being able to create a service mesh, microservices, right? Where you take a single big application, break it out into multiple components, whereby that one where also you introduce, if you remember the old days of networking where we used to have that networking stack, you could, you could evolve in one section of the network without affecting the other one. So microservices does the same. So when you break down your application into multiple systems, you can be able to take care of one, even take it offline as the other ones work, and maybe an outage in one doesn't mean that it's affecting the other ones. So think the likes the way Uber are building the application, all those things. Um, how many times has Uber told you they're down? Because they're deploying new code. Right? You'll all be stuck somewhere in Westlands. So, yeah, so that's the idea around microservices. Can I break it down and have specific modules doing certain things? And of course, I can't talk about APIs. You know more about me, but either way, they all have to talk via APIs and be able to do that. Of course, it has four key tenants that are around it. DevOps, which is a practice. We all know about DevOps. It's not a product, it's not a solution. It's a practice where both developers and operators find ways of efficiently running things in an organization. They recently up put some in between, they call it now DevSecOps, because we are now security-first organizations. Continuous delivery and continuous development and all those things whereby there is no stopping of an environment as you build it. And of course, I've talked about microservices and containers. So whenever you are de developing your, your applications, you need to figure out, are they meeting some standards around this? Or whatever decisions I make from front-end to middleware to back-end, is it making sense across these four key tenants? And a good guide to ask yourself as a developer as you build. I would want you to visit 12factor.net. Um, it, was, it was like, um, it was written by, I can't remember, the, it's, it's written by one of, the, one of the Heroku, one of the past providers, Heroku. So basically they provide you like um, principles that guide you when you're building a cloud native app. So as I say, as developers, most of the time we know the how, right? But this is the what and why. Like for example, are you trying to, do this, as you build your applications, does it check this for it to be cloud native, right? For example, you can take the first one. Is it a single code base which I revise? All I do is just versioning on top of it. And of course, like for the backing services, of course, do, can, can I treat them as attached resources, whereby now I run everything as code and all I do is attach to the backend and everything. So please, if you have time and, and you are focused more on development, just visit 12factor.net and look at what are the 12 factors that are considered or best practices when building cloud native applications. So, just to show you how complex it gets as you go into the cloud native environment. These are projects, one or the other, incubated or in production by the Cloud Native Foundation. So, as a, as a developer, as somebody who's working at Safaricom as an organization, as somebody who is out there, you need to make critical decisions as you go by. You need to decide at what level, at which stack am I doing that. Although it's, that's why it's huge even it could not fit. You have to choose what do I want to work with, right? And if I'm working on something and another person is working on something, can all they be driven whereby they talk via APIs or they have a seamless way of talking? And these are the critical decisions sometimes you make in an enterprise when it comes to building software. So you stop building for the sake of building or building in ways that you only understand. So you have to decide where am I going to invest? What am I going to standardize on? So as to avoid this, what we call like a, a loophole once you get into building cloud native applications. So, that's a bit of cloud native application. Again, as I mentioned, we are just mentioning what we are seeing as industry trends, which can guide you on where to, to invest your time, to invest your resources and all those things. Last but not least, I'll talk about serverless. Um, I've seen everyone at some point, maybe they, they know about AWS Lambda, right? To some extent, right? You take some function, then it's triggered by an activity. So all you have to do is, sometimes people interchange it with function as a service, but there is another end of serverless, which is backend as a service. But the idea is, 
you are triggering something whereby you have an event which when triggered code runs. It started simply because for cost savings, but now it has so many use cases whereby you trigger something to happen. There are so many projects that are working in this. So there is Knative, which is basically built on top of Kubernetes. So on top what I've put Knative, OpenFast, and Function, which is mostly supported by Oracle, uh, most of them can be able to be run on-prem, off-prem, and you can build your own. Then you have people like AWS offering their own version with Lambda. You have Microsoft with Azure Functions, and you have Google with Cloud Functions. But the idea is, you, I, what I'm doing is I'm writing very efficient code, which when something happens, it triggers something else to happen, right? Or it provides a certain kind of response. It can be a form of queuing in your code, right? It can be some form of messaging. If, for example, a, a user does this, kindly send this kind of message or something. And this is how it works, because um, I'm just watching time. This is how it works. So all you have to do as a developer is finding a way of writing code. You upload the code to, pro to your provider. It can be your your AWS, it can be your Knative running locally, depending on how big of an environment you have. Then you define an event that triggers it. And once the event is triggered, the function is executed. And of course, after it's executed, the results are sent to you. We are together? I know it's after lunch. Maybe some of you are feeling a bit sleepy, eh? OK, so I've just ended that. But because of time, we can be able to have these discussions. We can talk about Kubernetes and containers and how to run a demo environment in your laptop and how to package these applications as you go forward. Normally, when I do my presentations, I normally recommend um, a few readings. So first of all, if you are sitting somewhere in an enterprise organization at Safaricom today, or you are a developer who plans on joining an enterprise. So you start with the Unicorn project. So basically, it's a storybook. So I'm sure as, a, as people, you normally read your own. You have your documentation you read for technology. You have your white papers and all those things. This is an easy reading. It's written in form of a story about an organization. So kindly, so it's like those, if you read fiction and fiction, pick this as a novel. It will help you understand how an enterprise works. Of course, you can read from project to product as we move from traditional ways of doing projects to becoming product centric, you can be able to do that. And last but not least, look into the DevOps handbook. As developers, as, as operation people, we need to find a way of working together. And for me, that's it. Asante Nisana. And God bless you. So with every session, I usually look at um, you know, one, what are one or two things that I can get out of there from. This presentation, it's been that if you're going cloud native, you know, 12factor.net, that allows you to kind of like a cheat, a, what, a playlist, a playbook? It provides you principles or best practices on how to do these things. Fantastic. So round of applause for James. Check out him and his team at the Dell booth. And I want to say thank you as well for the recommended reading. I think he's one of the only people who have come through with recommended reading. For oh, one of the others is Kamosho right here. But fantastic so that you could take this knowledge Beyond, beyond this room and beyond these few hours. I'd like now to call upon uh, Joe Kanyua from Atlantis to speak to us about open compute. Karibu. Okay. You can hear me? Mic check. Uh, Joe Kanyua, as Mbogwa has said, I know Mbogwa for years. I was working as a Faricom between 2008 and 2013. So today is more of actually networking. Forget about open compute for momentarily. Very nice to meet a lot of former colleagues, a lot of fresh talent that has been injected into the equation. People like Celebwa who have worked with at Oracle. Uh, other people who have met today, like Kamoshu. Kamoshu is a friend of mine. Kamoshu, I inducted him to Safaricom. So when I see what he's doing, I'm very much delighted. So this is a, a great summit. Uh, well done, George, and the wider Safaricom team that has put this together. Uh, so I thought today I wouldn't do anything, uh, but my CEO and founder there, Dan, maybe you can wave. Uh, he's under the weather, you know, the kind of season that we are riding. So it's a little bit tricky. But there is one thing about being born ready. If you are born ready, you are never caught unawares, right? 
you should never be caught unaware. So you should always be ready to step in and do something. So we'll talk briefly. Maybe the only things I want you to carry, for me, I'm here to do three things. To network, to meet new talent. I can see Safaricom has injected a lot of young talent, and I really love it. And uh, also to know, I know sometimes when we hide behind those black screens and we code, we write containers, we deploy, or sometimes we lose touch of what's happening uh, out uh, large. And I know the Dells, the Oracles have been here. I also want you to know that we can also build those kind of companies and bring them down here. Like that's what we are doing at Atlantis. We, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are doing what the Dells do here locally. And we are very lucky to have Safaricom as one of our customers who are buying into what we are doing. So, Let's see what we can cover today. So just a quick introduction to who Atlantis is. As I told you, Dan is the founder. We have our co-founder, Tony. What I do at Atlantis, I'm the chief evangelist. So my work is actually to preach, but to preach technology. And if you have been following the Silicon Valley uh, players, you'll see chief evangelists are usually very critical. Why? Because they bring the marketing aspect and the technology aspect, then fuse it together and then preach that gospel in an authentic way that developers and engineers like yourself can actually comprehend. So that's what I do. 11 years in operation. Uh, we have a great blue chip uh, number of customers, and we are very delighted. But Safaricom definitely stands tall. And as a former Safaricom, I cannot be prouder uh, to say that we list you up there. And you can see, again, people have talked about collaboration. Collaboration is essential. The IT world is as huge as medicine. Like, you won't see a doctor who knows each and everything, even if they are focusing on the body. So you need to find strategic partnerships. But our emphasis really is on the open compute side of things. We are trying to avoid working with proprietary technologies. So any partner that we work with, we want that openness. Even in the English way, we say, keep an open mind, right? Then I don't know why we usually box ourselves when it comes to technology, because you know the pains. The strategic managers in IT know the pain of being boxed into a support contract and what have you. So we are talking open compute, and uh, Atlantis is the pioneer of bringing open compute to the African shores. And, but what's the basis of open compute? I know many developers know about open software, but have you heard about open hardware? Because open hardware is actually changing a lot of dynamics. That's why folks are talking about infrastructure as a code over here. So we are bringing open hardware into the equation. So that when we are coding, we are not just thinking about the code that we are writing and the, the open source tools that we can find, wherever we can find open databases. We are also thinking about, because at the end of the day, the code must meet the silicon. If you hit that command that George was executing here, you know that there is a processor that's actually doing the job. So why only stick on one side of the open software? Why can't we also think about that? And then we bring it together. Last November, George and I went to San Jose in uh, California. And one of the things that we learned there is that the projects that are driving the way technology is being adopted, things like composable silicon, the way you can actually compose a CPU on the fly and then provision it. That's what they're calling infrastructure as code. So we are seeing a lot of that fusion, even artificial intelligence, and I know it has been spoken here, I don't need to go through it. We are seeing a lot of what we call software and hardware core design for artificial intelligence. Because AI cannot run with native capability. If you want to really get the extent of what AI should actually deliver, if you think about a driverless vehicle, for example, if you want to really get to the maximum and to get to the limits of what that can happen, then you have to think about the hardware as well as the software at the same time. So we are here to just also tell you that, yes, we are talking software, but we must remember. So what Facebook did, Facebook is the, the inventor of open compute. They decided that we are not going to be buying servers from the typical sellers of servers. They know themselves. Let's find a way of building data centers in a different way. And for obvious reasons, because we know in a data center, there is a lot of consumption of things like power, for example. If you can save power, even 10%, even 1% saving on power, that one saving can represent a lot and it can help you to invest on other tools that would add a lot of value. So Facebook actually drew the blueprints of how data centers have always been built and decided that they're going to redesign a data center from scratch. That data center, as you can see the quote there, it was 38% more energy efficient, and that is quite significant. So we are saying, even for a telco like Safaricom, well, I hear you are calling it a technology company, and I concur with it, because the uh, communication service providers are all moving to DSPs, what we call digital service providers. I concur with that. That's a very, very humongous saving. But Facebook did not patent how to build an open data center. They decided to share. 
typical open source aspect. You share the design principles so that other data center builders can take advantage of those designs. And that's what we are taking advantage of, to say that if you're building a data center today, like Safaricom, you are building one in Liburu, then we don't want that data center to be built like the way QOA was built. So when I joined Safaricom, I was told QOA, I thought it's quality of something, then I was told it's queen of, of apostles. So I still remember that. So the way the data center at QOA or Thika or Kibos was built, then we need to change because the times are changing. The data center need to be OCP ready. And these are the tenets that you can see on this side. It's about scalability. When we talk about in anything in IT, scale is very, very important because you, don't, you can't predict the load. The elasticity of compute is very, very essential. Impact, sustainability. I know Safaricom is big on sustainability. You won't be able to achieve uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions if you're building data centers that are very power intensive. The power usage effectiveness is on very, very high ratios. So it's about impact. That infrastructure that you're using to run the code and the code components that you're building, what impact does it really have? Then efficiency. Very, I know someone spoke about operational efficiency here. But efficiency is critical. At the end of the day, you need to do more with less, even in the computing aspect. That's what productivity entails and the openness bit. So you can see the founders of open compute, uh, the likes of Golden, Goldman Sachs, the likes of Microsoft, the likes of Google. They are all members of the open compute community. So we as Atlantis, a very small startup here, small, uh, reasonably, but we have 60 employees that we are working with. But we are dealing with this. I, I personally sit in the boards of most of those projects for open compute, and I interact with folks from all these organizations. So, and we invite actually Safaricom, we had discussion with Marco Yer, with George Njuguna, that we want actually the Safaricom team to actually join uh, and participate. The beauty of being in a, in a community like this is that you're not bound by the rules of what happens. You can also contribute. You actually provide the designs that can influence how data centers or how CPUs or how cooling systems can actually be built. So that's what we are doing. So we are working very closely with folks you can find here, uh, KPN, folks from Vodafone, folks from AT&T. Those projects, they are at least like 10 projects around power, cooling, artificial intelligence, future technologies, and all of them we volunteer to have someone who is leading, and then there are sessions that you actually meet and you discuss these things. So I, I, I personally, uh, again, emphasize that it would be great to have the Safaricom community there. Uh, I know a lot of text. I don't like text on slides, really. Uh, someone told me once that what bullets do in real life, they actually do even when they're on slides, so they kill the audience. So I really hate them. <laughs> but you can see on this side, I focus you on this side to say that there are many reasons why people are adopting open compute solutions. Then the number one is definitely cost. At the end of the day, cost is a, this is a business. At the end of the day, you don't want to spend a huge capital outlay on just the technology to run the application that we, the subscribers, the consumers use. So that's a compelling one, capital expenditure reduction. Then open design. With openness, compatibility is never an issue. Locking is, is never an issue. So you can see the imperative. So we are bringing technology that is really well thought out and we know that at the end of the day, the clients that we have today and in the future are going to hew and take uh, lots of advantages from that. So these slides, we can share them, but just to see 50% reduction. I looked at one of the tenders that we responded to one of the government agencies. I can state because a public organization can trade. And I can tell you, the second highest bidder who could not provide as much compute power, as much storage, and even the open networking solution was almost twice the proposal that we put on the table. So it was a no-brainer for the customer. So we are cutting the supply chain. We are not killing the OEM. The OEMs will always be there, the original equipment manufacturers, but we are shunting that. We know if you eliminate the broker, what happens in real life? Even your insurance broker, you know, he's also a businessman. Even people broker, you know, in Nairobi, we are very good at trying to cut something. But if you eliminate the intermediary, you know what happens. Value is God. So that's what we are trying to do. Let's see. Yeah, and uh, of course we are getting, we are getting very good um, uh, press uh, and publication and publicity. Uh, we, you can see like uh, Yahoo Finance, they have already noted that we are not, the, the challenge we are always told as Africans and uh, 
is that we don't really tell our stories and we also lag behind so much that we're always jumping on jump, uh, bandwagons that have already taken toll. So it's good to see that a local startup is also being noticed at serious places. I can tell you in Africa, right now there's no one else who is driving the OCP gospel as much as we do, but then we know we are going to earn very good returns out of it. And uh, if you go to the open compute projects, just Google open compute, you will see the kind of companies that are listed there. None other than at Clancy's, you will see us there. And we are not just there to make up numbers. You know, you can be somewhere to just make up numbers to say, yes, we are there. But we are there, but, and we are also causing ripple effects. We are doing real things with customers like yourselves, and not just in Kenya, but in the Pan-African region. So we are scaling out. We are keeping tabs with what's happening on the technology front in the world and you are bringing them to these shows so that developers like yourselves, you won't be limited and you don't ne need to necessarily talk about, say, public clouds that you don't even know where they run. We can run this kind of infrastructure in a private data center because we know data residency, data sovereignty is becoming very, very critical. So those are imperatives. And uh, I don't know how many have heard about the telco infrastructure project. This is something I would also urge you to read about. We are also members of the TIP. It's called the TIP, Telecoms Infrastructure Project. So there's a, a global trend. If you see the, the players here, they are very familiar because you're in the telco space. And the push there is to see how can we do software and hardware disaggregation. So normally software and hardware, if you have worked with uh, switches, like networking switches in the past, they usually bundle uh, the, the routing software and the hardware very, very, very closely so that it gives you very limited programmability uh, capabilities on top of that particular device. But what if on the networking front, for example, we can decouple the software, the, what we call the NOS, the network operating system, we decouple that to become software which can be managed by developers like yourself, and then the hardware, we make the hardware commodity because at the end of the day, the hardware doesn't add a lot of value. What adds value is what runs on top of that hardware. So there's a global push to do disaggregation of software and hardware to ensure that it reduces in terms of value, uh, it reduces in terms of cost, and at the same time gives organizations like yourselves and developers like yourselves a lot of flexibility. So please read about open networking and what we are doing. Again, we rank there. Let me see. Yeah, another one is OpenStack. We are also members of the open infrastructure community. So you realize the word open is common in all my slides because it's very essential. We are only keen on folks who actually do open technologies. And on the OpenStack, which I know also at Safaricom we have deployed uh, and uh, it's in use, these are the players and we rank in there with all these global leaders. If you go to the Open Compute Summit that's coming up in October, you will see what these folks are doing, and these are familiar names doing uh, substantial stuff. Uh, let's see, skip that. So I won't talk about uh, uh, infrastructure as code because I know that was discussed earlier. Uh, come on. One slide up. I'm trying to go back, but it seems like... Any support guy? Go back. Yep, yeah, go back. One more slide, yeah. Yeah, we can take it from there. So this was demoed in the morning. I don't have to take you through that. Let's go to the next slide. We talk about the TNETs to a greater uh, degree. So these are the open compute TNETs. So if when you join the open compute community, if you need to contribute anything, it will be judged by this criteria. At least an OCP accepted solution must meet at least three of these criteria. So even the solutions we have uh, proposed and the ones that are listed on the open compute community, they meet at least one of these three uh, criterias, 
openness being very, very essential, that you cannot just say, no, we are going to patent or we are going to prohibit the reuse and the design principles around that. So keep this in mind as you think about solutions that you can contribute. Now I have to be cautious. I don't want to jump. Yes. These are compute nodes, storage nodes. You see that green? We call that OCP green. So in the racks that we have shipped to the data centers that are seated at Thika and at, uh, at the river, if you go and look at those racks, you will see these kind of nodes. Uh, we were discussing with Cephas earlier, uh, Cephas Maundo here, my good friend, and you are saying long ago when we were developers, we used to code with him, my first job was actually a software developer, and we never used to see the servers because the servers were, uh, the, the system that means could not allow you to even see the servers blinking. So it was pretty much a black box. But with the DevOps, which I see is a culture that you have adopted here, we are seeing a lot of fusion of development and operations. And it means that a developer should be able to swap, for example, a compute node from a rack and be able to replace it. So the way OCP machines, OCP nodes are built, they are completely toolless. You can just pull through and do a hot swap on a particular disk, and then you can go provision whatever you want to provision on it. So this green, if you, for those who are curious, you need to see where the code that you write runs. Go to the Dika data center, Joram, I saw Joram somewhere. Uh, go there and see where the code that you actually provision runs. So these are examples of uh, OCP nodes. Then cooling. Cooling is critical. Uh, in any, uh, the kind of, uh, you need to think of sustainability from the code you write, because if you write mishmashed code that is not very optimal, you know what happens, that it causes a lot of strain on the, on the CPU level. But then, you need to think about it, even from a cooling perspective. Traditional racks and traditional servers were built with 40 millimeter uh, uh, fans, and what, what that means is that they rotate more. They actually rotate more, but using the cube's law, you can double the diameter, and then they rotate less, and that means they consume as little as 40% power. So any server that we ship also considers this. So you, the developer, do your part on the sustainability, but also know the silicon that you're gonna run, we have already thought about uh, that sustainability bit. And these are statistics, they look more business, but they make a lot of sense. If you look at shipment of servers in the world today, the guys who buy from original device manufacturers direct, you can see the growth. 34.4%, uh, sorry, 61.5% in 2020. And these are the statistics that we have. So for us, we are cutting the supply chain. We are going directly to the original device manufacturer and assembling an engineered system that will make more sense to run the kind of workloads that you run. And in your own data centers where you have control, and security, you can be able to secure your infrastructure better. So this is the imperative, this is the business case of why we are doing what we are doing. So uh, at, at Lancis, we, we are not picking solutions from the sky and landing them here. We are also building solutions that work based on what we know is needed here in the African continent. For example, we have a solution we are calling Cinebox. Cinebox is uh, short for container in a box. And uh, I invite you to have a look at what uh, it does, but in the next slide, I'll give you a perspective. If you look at this the deck, let's start from the infrastructure tier. You can see the OCP infrastructure. So we only do open compute technology at the infra tier, regardless of where you want to deploy, whether it's the edge, uh, edge data center, the virtual uh, private clouds, which we are seeing are very critical, but it doesn't mean that you can't deploy on a public cloud like AWS or Google Cloud Platform. There is no limitation, but we are seeing our customers are very much inclined on the private cloud areas and on the edge uh, because of obvious reasons. Then as we go up, we are working with Red Hat for obvious reasons. Red Hat is always an open player. So we say our partners must be open oriented in their thinking. So we are, we are providing a solution that we are boxing, and we can be able to deliver this as a tanky solution. And this will power your DevOps capabilities, because if you are talking about continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, code release, containerization, you know the Open Red Hat OpenShift is one of the most deployed container orchestration platforms. So we are putting that, we are patching it on the OCP infra, and bringing this solution together. You can see the developer tools on this side. We just did a POC for one of our clients the other day. They were really surprised uh, on the capabilities the developers have 
whether it's the command line interface, whether it's the, the web UI, whether it's the security capabilities, managing secrets within the platform, all that has been considered, the app services, the platform services, and also the monitoring, the logging, all those aspects that you need to do in a given cluster. So we are picking that solution, we are boxing it, and calling it Cinebox, and the use cases you can read through, they're unlimited. So whether you are moving, you are doing cloud native de development, whether you want to port solutions that you are deployed on, say, an AWS cluster, you want to deploy them locally, it doesn't really matter. Whether you're doing data science, which are data science workloads or AI ML workloads that are very high capacity, we have tested on our Cinebox platform, and you're able to run virtually any kind of workload. And I know most of the developers can recognize some use cases here. So what else do I have? Yeah, so I'll skip, I'll skip the web console. So this is just to wrap, this is one of the open compute racks we just decided to put. This is when we are delivering at Tika. You can see it's not the traditional type of rack, the 19-inch racks that you're used to. Very, very different. They actually don't even close it. You can see the bolts. Uh, you can be able to add doors if you want. For Safaricom, we had to do it because of the risk aspects. But usually, they are usually delivered even without doors because of the cooling aspects. So if you're able to secure your infrastructure better or your data centers better, you don't necessarily need to add doors, but we are taking cognizance of what the risk team, for example, might say. Someone might just come and pull this through. So this is when we are delivering. Uh, this is the rack that I was saying. I invite you to take a walk or a ride to Tika. Uh, so this is a populated, the parts that are in white means that you have future expansion. You can add more nodes in that particular rack. And I'm telling you, with the OCP racks, we've seen three traditional racks, they fit into only one OCP rack. So even in terms of data center space and density of compute, it's a very, very remarkable change and customers are loving that kind of, because data center space is also, whether you do colocation or you do your own data center, it's a big, 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 uh, it's a big, big savings in terms of space. So I'll stop here in the interest of time. But of course, we can always have a conversation around this. Thank you very much. Joe, Joe is very passionate. And the one thing he said, I wasn't even prepared. You know this thing, Nilambua uh, 2, yes. Nanimekuja. Nah. So I think it's, it's great that you're an open, open evangelist. Yes. And you know, for the audience, I mean, we've been looking at, we've been looking at uh, mostly data center solutions. But the open compute, which, not even open compute, that, that mindset of going open also yes. goes into connectivity solutions. Correct. You no, know, you're, you're seeing this is the stuff, in, this is the stuff on, in, in the back end, but also if you're looking at stuff in the field, if you're thinking of last mile connectivity, there are also lots of amazing projects. Some of those names escape my mind. Uh, I'll be open sure. Wi-Fi, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there are very many projects around open, including open Wi-Fi. We, we have just done one deployment for open Wi-Fi at Kenyatta University, uh, and it's a, a child of the telco infrastructure project. So, yeah, I concur with you. Fantastic. So, yeah. from Atlantis, it's keep an open, keep an open, keep an open mind. So, Asante Sana Joe, uh, be sure to network with him and the, and the large Atlantis uh, crew. I'd like to call Mariam on stage because I told you guys that Tutakwana trivia. So if you have been here and you've been sleeping, uh, we're about to dish out some, some air time. And we're doing this, remember we're streaming live as well, um, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook as well. YouTube. LinkedIn and YouTube. So I think Mariam will go first with the virtual audience and then I'll shoot my questions for you guys here. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. My name is Mariam. I've spent uh, most of my time with the virtual audience. I know a lot of uh, you were with me yesterday online and it's so good to see you here in person. Like Mbogwa said, it is trivia time. It's a very exciting time for me. I love games like this. I love trivia and I'm glad that I know I'm in a room with like-minded people. You know those places you go and say, I want to play a game and people panic because they think you mean their hearts and things like that. But I'm so glad that we get to play this game. 3,000 bob worth of airtime is going to the online audience, the virtual audience. And Mbogo also has 3,000 bob worth of airtime for everyone in here. So for every person who gets the first answer right, a thousand bob worth of airtime is coming your way. In case you're selected as a winner, Tafadali, please DM the Twitter Safaricom page. Only the verified ones, because there's many people claiming to be Safaricom, but only the verified pages. So I'll begin with a virtual audience. These are your questions. Please pay attention. 
first person to get the answer right for every question goes away with 1,000 bob worth of airtime. I'll also... A, yeah? a quick one. Yes. I'm seeing people starting to type on their phones and they are here and they're also online. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, we have crafty people. We will verify whether you are here or whether you are a part of our virtual audience. I, people want to walk away with 2,000 bob worth. <laughs> nice try. We'll have to find a way to, uh, to, um, vert, to, what do I do? Vet. Yes, vet, to vet. Yes. But first, Mbogwa, I want to begin with you. Because trivia, everything charity we'll begins airtime. at home. We'll get Chari airtime also. You don't get you. For exactly zero bob worth of airtime, Mbogwa, who invented the telephone? Ah, that one is easy. Um, at the risk of giving away my age, okay. that answer was behind the exercise book in primary school. Exercise book in primary school? Kasuku, the Kasuku exercise book. Okay. The answer is Alexander Graham Bell. Who here had Alexander Graham Bell behind the exercise books? Where are my agents? Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> okay, okay. This is a millennial, you're still a millennial. This is a Gen Z room, I think, because even May didn't have it. But did you know something really interesting? Mm -hmm. Alexander, someone filed a patent for the telephone exactly an hour before Alexander Graham Bell did. So technically, someone did it first. But what does that say? <laughs> who, know, who knows that guy? What's his name? What's Elisha name? Gray. Elisha, Elisha Gray. Gray. Yeah. Who knows Elisha Gray here? Filed his patent an hour earlier. It's so, kutangulia si kufika. Si kufika. Execution, execution, execution is key. Absolutely. At Umendo, we make a patent. By the way, I, I speak that way and I'm also, I, ho I hold a utility patent for a telematics device. Yes. <sighs> but we are yet to execute properly. That execution has been such a headache. But if you're in the room, yeah. you have that idea, I may call them brain farts. You think about it like this, we said 10 other people are thinking about it. Yeah. Execute, execute, execute. Otherwise, you become like that guy. I forget his name again. Elisha Gray. Elisha Gray. You, right. like, you become Alexander Graham Bell yes. and be on the back of exercise books for Ab future generations. Absolutely. Generation. And Godspeed with your execution. Asante. I'll give the audience the question now. Again, these are only for the online, the virtual audience, Tafadali. Um, your first question, I'm keeping this general knowledge because I don't know if you've been here the whole day online or if you were here for some parts. Come and see my reporter. I'm not too sure. So I'll keep them very general knowledge. Let's see who first gets the answer. Your first question, which is the most popular social media network? I won't even give you options because honestly, it is an insult to your intelligence to give you options for such a question. Uh, which is the most popular social media network, okay? Your second question, when was the DVD invented? When was the DVD invented? If you're Gen Z, just leave, leave the phone. This is not for you. This is not for you. When was the DVD <laughs> invented? Third one. What was the official language of the UK between 1066 and 1362? General knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> if they even spoke at that time. I don't know if it was hieroglyphics. What was the official language of the UK between 1066 and 1362? If you get the answer to any of those questions right, and if you're the first person to do it, we will contact you and we will let you know you are the winner in the next session. So please stay on your toes to hear your name and get a thousand bob worth of airtime. Fantastic. And Mariam will help me now probably look at who gets my questions right. And you'll have the roving mic. Yes. Uh, These ones know, are hard cash, so you don't have to wait even until you get home. Yes. Yeah. You know, that first question was also a trick question, in my opinion, because where, you know, in, 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 your, in your homes, in your office, the most popular where in the world, in Kenya, so Let's go with in the world. In the world. Let's go with in the world, yeah. Whichever is popular in your heart, that's between you and your phone. <laughs> our sour. Mine are very mboga. Question one. What's the hashtag for the Safaricom Engineering Summit? Okay. <laughs> to be fair, his hand went up, went up extremely fast, yeah? So <laughs> if you get this right, you deserve it. I think so. Um, uh, the answer is uh, hashtag Safaricom Decode. Fantastic, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Boga sana, here you go. Ah, yeah. Second one is from Alice Munya's speech. Mozilla is owned by which organization? Again, your hand, your name, hand, everything went up really but fast. She should, she, actually, she should not. You won yesterday, Bana. I'm trying to win Marambili Mbogwa. I'm trying to good at what they do. She was fast, sour, sour. Okay, you want to give it to someone else? Okay, she's giving it to someone else. Your hand went up super fast. You're so gracious. Oh, no. 
Firefox. Amenoa. Mozilla Foundation. Lauda. Mozilla Foundation. Fantastic. That's the correct answer. Mozilla Foundation. And the, la the third question, the third and last question. Sorry, Mbogo, let me move this side so that I also give this side of the room a chance to get some airtime. Okay. What browser function has Mozilla launched recently? Who whispered? Yeah, you, it was you, yeah. <laughs> Fire. Trans. Trans. Translate. Translate, correct, oh. correct. So that's 3,000 bob of airtime having been given. There's more airtime coming. So even as we go to the next session, where I want to call onto stage Wang Feng Ming from Huawei to talk to us about the Huawei App Cube. Remember, keep tweeting. Now you can go back online and tweet with that official hashtag, Safaricom Decode, and we'll be back here with more trivia based on the discussions and the presentations that we've had. Asanteni. Wang, stage is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my glad to have this chance to share uh, some things with you. Yeah, today I think yeah I learned many things from others who tell more about the technology. But for my topic, I want to show some small story from our company. It refers to technology, and also it refers some business case I want to share with you. My topic is welcome to APB Cube. I think the first things we need to think about, what's APB Cube? It's a new word, right? Yeah. APB Cube, I think first thing we can separate is word. APP and Cube. APP is application, Cube is Cube. So what's the relationship between APB and the Cube? You can see me, right? Today my court, you can see this court is not fit for me. It's a a little bigger, right? So I can handle more. Maybe a baby, a children can handle to my court. So it's just like the relation just like the court and me, my body, application. And this code, a container. So this code can contain more and more application. So this is a big cube. A big cube is application container. This application container can have many, many different kind application from different uh, vertical industry. For example, traffic, transportation, logistics. So this is, this is every cube is something to do the vertical industry digitalization. So, okay. So this is, uh, this is the beginning. So I will start to my topic. As you know, the computer is the most greatest invention uh, for the past 100 years. Along with the computer, the software comes there. It can make a computer work a different ways. And Huawei, yes, we are a new, newer for this industry. We joined this industry in 1988. Although we are new, but we always try to contribute all of our power to take the technology, include the infrastructure, and also software to everywhere. We want uh, the globally, our customer can share the benefit from the software. So we separate, it's our understanding, we separate the Huawei phase to three. The first stage is from the 1988 to 20, 2000, okay? During this stage, our software is, you know, it's, a, it's simple. The target only enable the machine where we provide the core network, provide wireless equipment, and also the switch. Our software, just based on that, enables them. 
It's a simple program, uh, program management, and also some genius developer. It can handle everything. It's full. OK, and the next stage is from the 2000 to 2015s. We get uh, many requirements from our customer, from Safecon, from global telecom company, and also enterprise. We, our, tech, our mission change. We will enable the industry. We will fulfill the business requirement from, from the industry chain. And you know, for their requirement, there are some high requirement for there. It is it's a large functionality can carry what's their operation, right? It hundreds functionalities and high performance. It serves thousand TPS because it must handle the service from the from the country and the highest abilities. It cannot out of service and also have perfect uh, qualities and uh, high pre investment. So it requires a large program management and uh, high complete cooperation between team and the quality control and the security control. And then, now, yes, we into another phase. It's a new phase. We will take the lifestyle for our customer for this country. So, for the, under these periods, the difficult is for us to enable the vertical industry and to build the ecosystem for our customer and to take the benefit for the software to the everyone. Under this period, it will have the export mini program to cover the live signals. Every day when you wake up, we can use our application to do the service. You can call the food, you can call the taxi, you can do many, many things. You can book the airport ticket, something. Okay. And the requirement for here is different. You know, under this scenario, if you want to enable digital vertical industry, we need more partners to join us. It, it will be not a close teams in Huawei internally. We need more and more partners to join us, join our ecosystem to do the same thing. Same team, same dream, right? So, and also the requirement is different. This, under this period, it requires to do the quick publish and the quick innovation, and also not so high requirement for the software quality, software performance stability. We can enhance software along with the business. If this can be successful, we can enhance it. If we, it cannot be successful, drop it, right? So it requires Huawei master open source to our partner, to enable our partner. But only open source is not enough. We must do more. You know the coding is high threshold. So we must decrease the threshold. We make our platform to low or no, no very low threshold for entry. And the last thing, we must use the Angel develop and mode to let you quick realize it and the quick go to the market. Okay. And uh, from our concept, if I want to do something with our partner together, we must do the first exercise. So this is the first exercise we have done in Kenya. It, we call it a digital uh, card green. From last year, we built this application based on our, our IPBQ platform, uh, two weeks, and then we published it to the market. And until now, we already get more than 20 merchants in Nairobi. For example, the Sky Party and uh, the P, uh, Pit Cafe, yeah, some, 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 some merchants like this, they already use our, our application. This application can help the merchant to improve the efficiency, can do can, uh, can manage their menu quickly, can take the order quickly, and uh, also can do the promotion very quickly, and also like Joe, for them. He can get more and more consumption there to their merchant to do the, to do the, to do the, to do the, uh, to, to, to have their food, something like, something like this. It's build the bridge, bring the merchant and the customer quickly online. So this is uh, the other advantage for our digital catering. And after digital, card, digital catering, it's just uh, one industry. You know, we have many industries we, our IPQ can support. The retailer, the education, the government service, traffic, and the Seneca support, support. Here, our partner, if you have willing to join us, just call us. Our position is uh, close to Labrador Mall. Yeah, you just, just come there, call us, or 
yeah, or, or, or discuss, discuss with us together. So, Huawei, what do we do for this? We provide the platform. This platform have low threshold. It's their code and the low code. We, know, we don't need genius, right? We just, you have a feeling. You want to join our ecosystem, just feel this learning. You can use this platform to develop a program. If you have any idea for the, for, for the, for the history, for the vertical industry, yes, you can, you, can, you, can, you can join this. And also, we solve the pain point. You know that for you, it's very difficult for you to do some high technical requirement things. So we solve the multi-screen and the multi-end. You don't need to care about the uh, different uh, terminal, whether we can match it or not, no. So another thing, for globally, yes, the asset we will inher inherit from our developer. We will get it to our globally center. It can share with our partner. You can use it free. So it can support you build a different vertical industry application easily and quickly. After, after uh, in the last of this page, you will see how quickly we can build our application. And uh, everything for our platform is online. So it's, it means that you can get the help easily. You don't need to care about the upgrade. Always, you can always get the last version from our software. You don't need to pay again for the upgrade. Yeah. And as you know, the Abbey Cube is an application you can see, but behind the Abbey Cube, it's different. It's a big system, not only Abbey Cube. On the Abbey Cube, yet we must solve the, solve the infrastructure issue, right? We must have the, soft, have the uh, server storage, and also we must have the cloud, and also we must solve the security issue. So this is the basic thing Huawei we already solved for our partner. We put the complex things in our site and put the most simple things to our partner. So for you, you for our partner, you just need to learning, light coding, and uh, drag and uh, sample. So you can public the uh, application in our IPB cube. And also, we have the enough merchant and the customer resource can do the verification for you. It can make your job most uh, easily. Most easily, yeah. And then we will show that. How can you use our APP cube easily? Yeah, I, I make a word there. You can do the coding just like uh, cooking, right? Cooking is easier. Maybe sometimes it's not easier, right? Yeah, here, the first you must sort which industry you want to, you, 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 you want to do, right? You just make the logic there. And in our platform, we already provide the GUI and the component there. You have the sort, and you put, you get the component, just go to a supermarket to choose some, some goods, and put it uh, in your bag. And then you can build a program and start to make this component, component uh, regularly. In China, you know, we have a famous word, a famous word. Yeah, if you want to win your husband or your wife, the first thing, you must uh, win their stomach. You must be cooking good uh, foods for them. And uh, here, if you want to win your boss, right, you can use our IP cube. Why? Because it can improve your efficiency. Some guys just build one application, but you can build 10. Because it's so quickly, and also we prepare many basic things for you. If you have 10 times the efficiency than others, why your boss don't like you? So this is a, this is a story. But uh, I'm not uh, have a big talk there. It's a low threshold, but it not means no threshold, right? At least you must have an idea how to match the requirement and how to realize in this platform. You mean how to get your materials and the sauce together to make a delicious cooker, right? If you want to make some food delicious, more delicious, you need to have more knowledge for this. So we still have some threshold, but it's low, yeah. So then I think uh, it's simple. We can have a video. This video will show we how, to, how we create a new uh, application for the, for the school, uh, pay school fee. 
Yeah. Uh, this page, this is the page, it's the home page. Okay, we already create create our prog uh, a program there, and then we go to the the dashboard, the workaround. Yeah, we can choose some GUI components and uh, put the GUI components and put on the workaround, and then it will it will it 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 it, it will start to generate uh, uh, application there. Yeah, this is for us to build the main page to for for the school for the for the student to pay their fee. Yeah. Yeah, and then publish it. Okay, and then this this page will, can be shown. Yeah, it can be shown in the mobile phone. This is the, I think this is the whole. This is the, this is the story I want to I want to show and share with uh, our partner. And this is the last page. And uh, welcome uh, everybody to our public, uh, to ABBQ. We can take the smart life to Kenya together. We can enable the different vertical industry. And uh, in the future, maybe when you wake up, we don't need to do everything manually and uh, to uh, do everything. Uh, yes, uh, you, you, you must go there physically. So this last idea for there, this is a small story, and but this is a big dream. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic presentation. And I said AppQ. It's not AppQ bits. It's? APP. You guys are not listening. Why are you listening? It's APP. And I think the integration between you know, hardware and software to Huawei is amazing. Some of this stuff, you think you've read their playbook, but every other time they do a presentation, you see just how expansive that is. So they own, they manage the metal. Their own software runs on their metal. And then they also have the direct consumer apps. That's essentially the entire stack. And I'd like to welcome John Jogona on stage to uh, invite one, one of our key sponsors here to give us a word or two. John, George, come on stage, please. Thank you, Nje here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, one of our key sponsors uh, is going to be leaving shortly. Uh, so I just thought I'd invite him to say a few words. Uh, for those of you who don't know, actually, uh, M-Pesa actually runs on Huawei. So when you do an M-Pesa transaction, the application, uh, the infrastructure that powers M-Pesa uh, runs on Huawei. Maybe let me add more to it. Our billing system also runs on Huawei. And it's an amazing story of the background between Michael Joseph and challenging uh, our brothers from the East to give us a solution at the time when M-Pesa used to go, uh, rather, Safaricom Network would go down every Friday. Kamochu is nodding. Uh, so we, we go a long way, and it's very interesting for me when I work with people from the East and the West, and sometimes they don't always see eye to eye, uh, but I end up being the, the handshake, the API between the two. <laughs> So allow me to welcome uh, the Huawei CEO, Mr. Will Meng. Uh, please give him a round of applause. He's just going to say bye. He, he loves our ideas. He's told me to open a shop where I can sell these. <laughs> thank you, bro. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, because uh, uh, today is a big day, I think, for, for us. Uh, before, I attended a lot of uh, this kind of uh, big party in Barcelona, in Singapore, even Africa, in Cape Town. But this is the first time I came to Kenya, and uh, I'll be here to experience this fantastic party here together. This is my honor. Thank you. <laughs> and you know, because I've been here for five years, five years ago when, when I uh, arrived in Kenya, I can see Till today, a lot of changes happened every day in Kenya. We have a lot of innovations, which is created by everyone who seated here. I thank you for everyone of you. You changed our life. You like our life to become more convenient. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. 
And the last thing, congratulations, George. Uh, well done. A, a good party and good, a good, a good story to every of us. Uh, we are very happy to sponsor this uh, event. It's very important for us. We hope in the future we can use our technology to sponsor you to create more uh, applications to use our app cube to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Asante. Asante Sana. Please uh, don't leave the stage. I think Naisenya will bring something for you. Uh, but I just want to invite the leaders of the, the sponsor companies so we can just take a quick picture before uh, Will leaves. So I know Bunei Learning, you are here. I think uh, Eric uh, on the BTN side, uh, the TDG team, uh, Celeboa, oh, Nizar, you want Nizar to come? Alice, kindly come for a photo op. Uh, as he leaves. Who am I missing? Oh, Ellie, you're here. Uh, TD. Who's coming from TD? Is Brian there? Or someone from that side? You'll come? Okay. Ah, there's brothers from South Africa. Suta. Riding on stage. <laughs> uh, who am I missing? BTN, Eric, or Alex? Eric is here. And where is uh, Oracle? Uh, Oh, sorry, Ellie's here. But I know David was here and Lenin. And they might crucify me. All right, then we'll continue with Ellie. All right. And from Mpesa Africa, I don't know if Juliana, Juliana, please come. You made it from Dubai in time. We'll be doing the closing ceremony. Please clap for my other MC. <laughs> Juliana, good to see you. You should have used the expressway. <laughs> How are you doing? Good to see you. Bye. Like one minute, Lenin. We're good to go. Thank you so much. Please clap for them. All your hoodies, your COVID tests, the screen, the auditorium would not have been possible without our sponsors. Thank you so much. Again, thank you to our sponsors. And um, just a quick note for the guys who are participating in the AWS an an anomaly detection call. Please get your laptops and make your way to the to the sides of the stage so you can begin your setup now. And I'd like to invite um, on stage now, he's already on stage, Dominic Juma, Principal Technology Solution Engineer at Oracle, giving us a presentation or a demo, right? It's a demo yes. of low code application development with Apex. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. As you've heard, my name is Dominic Juma. I'm a Principal Technology Solutions Engineer at uh, Oracle. So today I'm going to do a live demo. Uh, I hope that the systems will cooperate with me today. Uh, I'm going to do it live. Um, to start us off, uh, because I'm talking to developers, I know you've learned a lot of languages. However, those languages will always evolve. And we're trying to add as many people as possible to be able to make use of data. And so Oracle has technology that so. we've developed to put and put in the hands of our different users that can be able to help them make uh, applications with as little code as possible. And that tool we are calling Oracle Apex. So in a nutshell, what I'm going to show you today, I'm going to demonstrate today, is, is how we are enabling citizen developers uh, to be able to develop applications quickly rather than using things like uh, spreadsheets that are difficult to control the information in that. And similarly for line of business developers, they can also be able to extend and quickly be able to bring, uh, to, uh, to bring uh, applications online very quickly and very rapidly. Similarly, the other people that you are looking at are the professional developers 
So if you have things like your ERP, uh, you want to extend them, they don't really fit into your business processes, you can be able to extend them using the Oracle Apex tools. And finally, the other people we're looking at are data scientists. How are they able to bring those uh, visualizations online uh, very quickly? So moving on, uh, because I have a short time, I'm going to now uh, show you a demo. So in this case, what I'm looking at is an education official who has a spreadsheet, and his job is to be able to update the schools that are within Nairobi County, uh, the number of students that are in there, so that they can be able to allocate uh, the uh, resources accordingly. So in this demo, you can also be able to do it. Uh, it is within the Oracle Live Labs. I'm going to show the links at the end of the uh, presentation. So the team, if you could move me to my laptop, please. Okay. So it's very easy to do. As you can see, uh, we have to go to Oracle Apex. To use Oracle Apex, you just go to oracleapex.oracle.com. So once you're there, you're sign you sign in. I've already signed in. In this case, I've said I have a spreadsheet, the, a list of all schools of Nairobi, and I want to create an application that I can be able to do analysis on, I can be able to create charts on, I can be able to report on, and I want to do this uh, very fast. Uh, so first, I'm going to go to my app builder, and then I'm going to uh, say create a new application. So when I create a new application, it's going to ask me uh, whether it's a new application, create an application from file or a starter application. So I'm going, I have a spreadsheet as the education official. And then I'm going to choose the file where I've stored my spreadsheet. So here I have my Nairobi High Schools. And then as it loads the data, I can be able to preview and view what type of data I'm looking at. So as you can see, the schools are categorized by constituencies, school names, what type of neighborhood it is, how safe, how many seats there are, how many applicants. If I'm satisfied with that data, I'll just save and then load the data. After I load the data, I'll be able to, I need to specify the uh, table name. So in this scale, I'll, I'll call it Nairobi Schools Table. And uh, then I'll say load data. So after it has finished loading, I can say, uh, I can view now the table to see what data has been loaded into my system. So you see this is the other uh, tables that I have in my, uh, in my workspace. And this is what we've just added. And this is the data we've added. So I'll proceed and create the application. So just like that, I've created an application out of a spreadsheet of data that I had. And from the application, I can rename it. So this is uh, Nairobi High Schools. And then I can give a logo, if I have a specific logo that I would like to use. In this case, I'll choose uh, this logo here that I'd prepared earlier. And then these are the pages that by uh, default Apex recommends based on the information that you've uploaded. So as you can see, there is the home page, there is the dashboard, there is the search page, as well as the interactive report page. I'm happy with this. I would also like to be able, I would also like to allow my users to be able to install progressive web app, so I choose that. If there are any other pages that you are interested in, for example, you'd like to add an access page, just select, and then you create the application. So in less than five minutes, I've just showed you from a spreadsheet 
you would have created your application. So once it's finished, I click on run application. So uh, here is now the finished application you have online uh, in less than five minutes. So I'll log in so that you can see whatever pages that uh, I was creating. So this is the user's view. Uh, you can be able to add other users. So with Oracle, when you are building our applications, we put in the, we build it with security in mind, and so uh, only the users with the correct rights are able to get into the application. So when you see this, it's because I'm the developer of the application, so I'm able to see everything. And then you see I'm able to go to my dashboard, my dashboard has various uh, graphs that were generated automatically. These ones, you can be able to modify them uh, depending on the uh, usage, what you'd like to see. So you see here, it shows me the number of schools per constituency, neighborhood, and so on. There are also these other two pages for search, and then uh, some other page for the report. So you see, this took me uh, less than five minutes. However, as developers, I don't know if I ask, if you were to develop this type of an application, how long will it take for you to do that? I just shout the answer, how long will it take to create this type of charts, these types of tables, and so on? I bet if you are to use, I don't know, uh, React with the back end of Node, I'm sure it will take you more than an hour for that. So the beauty of Oracle Apex is based on the data that you have, whether it's within your database or whether it's a spreadsheet, you can quickly uh, develop an application uh, very fast. Now, these are just the default uh, pages that you can get, but this one can be customized much further. So, for example, uh, when I look at this search page, I see that there is a method, uh, this is the method of teaching, which constituency, uh, these are the various filters that we have, uh, the attendance rate and so on. So I may want to change the constituency to be uh, the filtering method that is uh, uh, preferred. So I'll just go to the application builder and then I go to the page with the, uh, the search page and uh, based on this, I can just be able to uh, drag and drop and put constituency on top and say, uh, I'm, I want to filter by which schools are safer on top. And then, uh, for example, the rest are leave the same. And then I will save. So when I save and then I run, after I run, you see the changes that I've made. Uh, we'll now, uh, I'll want to see only, I'll be able to now to filter based on the, uh, based on the, uh, based, based on the method that I chose. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about is on your reporting side. Uh, you may want to also adjust maybe there are certain columns that I don't want to view in this, uh, uh, in this page, so for example, uh, I'm, I'm not interested in the latitude and longitude and so on. I may just remove them like that, and that will be able. I will be able to uh, customize my table uh, specifically. Next, I may want to group by neighborhood, so I just click on that row, and then I say Control Break, and then you'll be able to view. Uh, by neighborhood. So uh, the other aspect I wanted to show you today is, uh, for example, I wanted to do an analysis on the number, of the number of applicants you get per seat in each school. So for that, I go to data, and then uh, uh, I go to data, and then I can say compute. So for this, I want to be able to show a, a new column of applications versus uh, 
applications to seats ratio, and then uh, specify the format that I want my, my data to look like. And then uh, when I look at the application, that is on uh, row on uh, column M and seats is column L. So I divide by application, divide by seats ratio. And then if I apply, then you'll see a new column that has been generated there called applications to seats ratio. Now, based on this, I may want to also uh, aggregate that by uh, the constituency. So for example, I could just go to data, aggregate, and then say uh, I want an average for each, uh, for each application set. And then I'll go next and say I want to, uh, uh, I want to aggregate that data again. Oh, so that is done. And then it will show for each neighborhood application for uh, uh, per seat, it will show the average. So basically, there are a number of uh, tools that you can use with uh, Oracle Apex. Uh, because of the short time, I'll ask you to maybe go to the uh, Apex itself, which is apex at oracle.com. Uh, just try to explore these tools that we have for uh, rapid application development. And then uh, you, you should be able to get more on that. Now, to conclude, in terms of uh, the documentation, uh, you can uh, get a number of labs in our Oracle Live Labs page. Uh, that la those Live Lab page, you can be able to create a new account for yourself, uh, to be able to go through certain, uh, uh, be able to go through. Uh, lessons on uh, various aspects of Apex from the most simple to the most uh, complex uh, of uh, to the most complex of the, of use cases you can also reach at us uh, at oracle on socials at uh, oracle apex as well as at oracle database thank you very much asante as, as, as today years old when I discovered that you know, Oracle has um, low-code tools, you know, many times MNCs are known for, for singular sort of proposition. When I say Oracle, what do you think? Database, right? But clearly they've, they've, they've looked at a wider, a wider use case where more and more people are being thrust into these positions where you need to interact with that database in an easy way. And maybe before this platform was out there, you need to be deeply technical to be able to run the SQL queries yourself and really mine that data. And this helps bring more people into that fold of just being a lot more, you know, upskilling, ups, upskilling people in that way. So help me thank Dominic again. And, uh, you know, thank you for, uh, to the Oracle team. <laughs> Moving swiftly, we are going to be looking at the AWS Anomaly Detection Coding Challenge. And I'd like to call on stage Kamau Miner the tech lead at Safaricom and Secatello, the solution architect from AWS, to tell us you know, what this is about. And then we'll pick it, we'll pick it from there. You guys are you're live on mics? Fantastic. Stage is yours. Cool. And to start off. Um, hi everyone. Hi everyone. It's late, ne? It's been a long day. So we're gonna play a little game to get you up and going, right? You're gonna take your hands up in the air, and then we're going to wave them to one side, and then we're going to wave them to one side, and we're gonna wave them to the other side. Easy game, right? But it changes the whole mood of it when the DJ plays my favorite song. <laughs> Hit me. Hit <laughs> him. Let's, let's, get this, let's get this party started, right? <laughs> Kill it. They're enjoying it too much. <laughs> <laughs> 
cool, man. My name is Lotzeka, and uh, I'm from AWS. I'm a solution architect. And um, we've got a challenge that we want to present to you. Uh, it's anomaly detection. So what we've done is we've come up with a big data set that we basically have put up on a location that we're going to disclose. And um, if you've got your laptop with you, bring up your laptop. And I know some of you are going to be like, um, how do we do this? We don't know how to do it. Where do we start? Go over to my stand, ask uh, Rendani to give you an AWS account. You see, I'm very nice. I'm going to give you an AWS account to work in. And uh, let's, let's get to the challenge. So um, the details of the challenge, I'll hand over to my colleague to give you the details. All right. Um, I don't know if it's afternoon or evening. Uh, but thank you for hanging on this long. Uh, we've been seated for quite a while. And, and we've waved our hands around a bit. I would like us to stretch our legs. <laughs> right? Um, a health moment. Let's all just stand up for a few seconds. Get the blood flowing. We don't want anyone uh, getting a bit dizzy. Uh, good. You may have your seats. I just wanted to get your <laughs> blood flowing a bit. Uh, so, we are not doing agriculture yet. Uh, we are doing data. I think through the, through the, the, the two days, We've been discussing a lot of, of software, DevOps, cloud, um, and everyone has mentioned something about data. Um, there are people here who like playing with their machines. So if you're interested in doing some data challenges, um, I would ask you, get your laptop. There are some tables set up on the sides. Uh, sit there. Uh, there's a data set that is provided. The information will pop up. Um, so, there's some data provided, a few challenges um, that have been put into the data, and the idea is to find those problems, all right? Uh, the guys will, will, will um, present the actual information. So, anyone who's interested in this challenge? Is there anyone? All right. We will, we will guide you through it. Right. All right. Um, uh, rise up. There, there are some desks there. Pull out your laptop. Pull out your laptop. Or you can sit where you're seated. I, It'll I take, take us 30 minutes, but we'll, we'll help you along. Yeah. Um, we, we know what the anomalies are, so we might help you a little bit <laughs> more than you need to. <laughs> I, I gave you my different list of anomalies. <laughs> <laughs> then, right. uh, you want to tell them about the price? Yes. So, uh, there seems to be some shyness as to who wants to participate. So, for the first... Three. It's got, gotten very quiet once I've said some, some awards. So, number one, top, top performer will get 5,000 shillings, 50,000 shillings in cash. So it's not in kind or some voucher in cash. Second, second place will get, I believe it's 30,000. Let me confirm so that I don't um, give you the wrong information. Yes. Second place, 30,000 shillings. Third place gets 20,000 shillings. So, here are the rules. Yeah. You do it alone. We, we don't want shared. So, we, we are talking about um, property, uh, intellectual property. This is yours. So, do it alone. Second, we are, we are in partnership with AWS. Uh, as, as Selo has said, if you need an AWS account, please share your email at the AWS stand. You'll be given a free account that you can do all of this work on. All right? For those who use AWS tools, uh, you get a few more points. There are some brownie points for using AWS tools. But if you prefer using your local machine, that's also fine. And then you must have really uh, great confidence in your technical ability to come number one. I applaud you. But all the same, use AWS, use your local machine. It's up to you. Yeah. Um, if you can scroll, uh, scroll uh, up a bit so that they can see the GitHub link. Yes, show us the link. Up. Or okay. if you're a fast it's typer, you can use... Anomaly detection challenge on GitHub. The instructions are there. The location of the file is there. You can take this, write the Python script on your local machine, and find what the anomalies are. Uh, and, and this applies to the guys online as well, all right? If yep. you're online, there should be an email somewhere in our instructions where if you find the anomalies, you can just email the, uh, the, the owner of, of, of this repo. 
Where is it? So the link, that's yeah. the data set. Download it, unzip, do your work. Um, and this should be fast. There are 10 anomalies. I'll give you this. There are 10 anomalies within the data. Do you think you should tell them that? The first one. <laughs> There's something wrong. <laughs> with the data? With the data. Yes. Um, tell us what is wrong with yes. it. Yes. If you get a server error, that's your machine, not the data. Yeah. Um, so there are 10 anomalies. We shall but, be looking for 10 of them. But the problem is not between the keyboard and the chair. It might be. <laughs> but I think that one we can resolve. We can solve us. it. Yeah, we can identify that anomaly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but for the data itself, 10 anomalies. There's something wrong with that data. 10 different things wrong with that data. Yes. Um, and as we are doing that, uh, to get the others engaged, yeah. um, some of the reasons, so we've all talked about software. We've seen a nice demonstration by the Oracle team with, on Apex. And the first thing he did is he went into a database yes. and, and had some data there. Um, all our applications are very well built. Uh, they look nice. We've seen the, the, the DevOps guys. We've seen uh, cloud practitioners building really nice looking uh, applications. applications. Yes. Um, the interesting thing is I didn't see an application that was blank. Yeah. There was some information being shared on the application. Um, the data is the important part in that whole thing. All right? So if, if, we, if you build a brilliant application, very well designed, very nice and pleasing to your eyes, but your data is garbage, it doesn't matter if it's M-Pesa or AWS platforms. Uh, it's of no importance uh, to, to the user. Is that true? Right. So um, I want to see if there are some people on the floor who are already taking a shot at it. I know the Safaricom guys have, have known about this challenge, so. They may have, but yeah. I, I held the data close to my heart. So you're, you're, you're sure they, not, they didn't get a glimpse of it? No. Okay. But whoever curated the data is not even here. Okay. So, so who maybe is someone can, can walk on the floor and find out if, yeah. if someone is, is already attempting to find the anomaly in the data set. Um, who, has, who has already gone to GitHub and opened the link? Who's got the challenge? All right. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Here. Who Looks else like is going point? somewhere? Yeah. Okay. Who has written a Python script? Who else is participating? Hands up. You're participating. It's in your head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see a machine. <laughs> right? It, it needs to be now. Um, it, it's not for later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Yes, we do have people. Yeah, quite so a this number is, there. On this side, it's already like five, right. five, six. You, you get points for just, seven, a for eight, for just nine, attempting. Yeah, at least there's, there's, there's some competition there. Some good numbers. So, Kamal, what, what exactly are we expecting to, to get from, you know, from, from this particular activity? What's the, let's connect it to, you know, they've done it, yes, yeah. someone walks away with 50K. What, what does that help with in an organizational setup? So, the, the, the idea is to show that um, we, are, we have large organizations. Mm -hmm. I'll take Safaricom, for instance. We, yeah. We have a lot of data, um, and we are building a lot of apps, a lot of um, interactions with our customers mm -hmm. that reads from that same data or generates that data. Um, if we do not understand the quality of that data, uh, then whatever we are building uh, will not meet the expectation. As Correct. I mentioned, okay. if we have M-Pesa, we have a brilliant M-Pesa app. Uh, the UI UX guys have done a brilliant job. Uh, the product designers have done a brilliant job. Yes. But if our data is of low quality, if let's say we're assuming we have 40 million customers, yes. but in actuality we have 20 million customers, then your whole business proposition is already, is already flawed. Um, so as our engineers here work on the data, it, it's a realization and focusing on the value of clean data, of high quality data towards business growth, towards application development. Fantastic. Can yep. you do a time check? How much time do we have left for the challenge? We should you know, be... and, and once they figured that they've, that they've gotten it, what, what's, yeah. what's the step? Do they just 
come first, up. First person can put your hand up. Yeah. Um, and but they we, will, come we will collect them and there will be a price giving at the end. Yes. Oh, okay, so it's to collect and then... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's another challenge coming up, uh, just so you are aware. There's another challenge coming up, so if you're really good at coding, uh, we're going to build an API in real time. We will tell you what the API must have, and then you'll have to build it quickly and show it to us. All right? So if you're really good at coding, you might get this anomaly detection challenge and get the API build out and win two prices in one day. Wouldn't that be cool? On a Friday. Yeah. You know? <laughs> On a Friday. That would be nice. Cool. Should I give you a hand? Should I come help you? I'll code with you. If, if, if you're done, please meet us at the side here. There's no price for being the first to finish. <laughs> the price is on the quality of the work done. Exactly. It's, it's, yes. uh, and ask for extra paper. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> you need <laughs> Yeah. OK. So what have you got? Did you get yourself an account? No. Mm -hmm. no. I'm one? using my local book collab. Okay. Anything. Anything. Yes. Did you get the file? Yes. All right. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think guys, guys are more comfortable working from there. Because mm. like George said, kuna pressure. Yeah. Kikuja kwa stage there is pressure. Too much, so. too much. The spotlight is too hot up here. And remember, no collaboration. I'm just seeing guys collaborating. <laughs> They'll share the price. They'll share the price. Yeah. <laughs> hey, very good. You mind if I ask you one question, come on? Yes, I mind. Data, snake oil, olive oil. Sorry? Data, snake oil or olive oil? Laptop. I don't have one. Sorry. <sighs> Is both an option? Both an option. I'll, I'll allow it. I'll allow it if you can walk me through why you think, why you think that. All right, so for... for Myself, I mean, personally, yeah. it's, it's olive oil. Potential. Why? Uh, okay. Yeah. So With the, you don't have to put them on stage for the, the analogy goes, data is the new oil. Yes. Um, I don't price. think you want to consume yeah. crude oil. Big price uh, olive oil is, is possibly the, a better option. A but in, in oil is there to, uh, to make things run better, or to make food taste better, yeah. to make life wow. better. Um, so in my view, yes, data um, ensures that our life is, is, is in order. Uh, our applications are in order. So yes, olive. You understand people who have the point of view, though, that it's snake oil. Do you yes. see where they're coming from? Yes. Um, the, for for every coin, there there are two sides to it. Um, we like seeing the better part of it. Uh, the flip side of it, there was a panel we had here about data security. Yeah? I mean, uh, information no, 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 no. It's, it's not. Um, they're not dependent. Security. All right. Take one uh, column. Major part Run through it. Yeah. That field is the data that we. As organizations hold um, and access to that information that data all of a sudden unlocks a world of heart for very many people all of a sudden the olive oil turns into into snake oil very fast and how would you say you can be ethical with data because you will get it you will collect it but how can you be ethical with your data and ensure that even if it's olive oil to you it's not turning into snake oil for someone else it's very difficult, um, and, and this is a challenge in all IT fields, because you have a lot of privilege, a lot of responsibility. Um, for a data practitioner, uh, and the one thing that I always urge is just integrity, personal integrity. Because for a practitioner, especially in a, a big data space, your, your tools of trade are the actual data. So I cannot limit your access to the data. So I need to understand your um, integrity. Okay. Are you, do you have a high you sense know, of integrity? Integrity is something that's very, it's hard to quantify. <laughs> it's hard to measure. Yeah. Are there ways we can put in actual checks and balances? Because yep. I, I would like to depend on you and say, you know what, I think Kamau has, is, 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 a, is a very honest person. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I, I can't be sure of that. So is there a way we can put in actual checks and balances to ensure that data isn't misused, sold, etc.? That's a benefit of, of working collaboratively yeah. in the IT field. So we have access to the data, but the data sits on some infrastructure somewhere, um, a database. There's a database administrator who will give me the required rights to that data. Um, so the, the, it becomes a network of individuals managing that data set. Um, the cybersecurity guys come in to govern over even the data 
uh, the, the database administrators. So while yes, they have the whole infrastructure, even their access levels are governed by a by cyber someone. So yeah, there's, it is, a, there's yeah. a board of sorts to, yes. to, to oversee the, every, every decision that's made. Yeah, so you have um, to layer it. Yeah. Um, so that yes. You're checking and balancing, like I said exactly. earlier. I've spoken to quite a number of people who are in the audience, and one thing that has, I've, been, I've heard over and over again is, we need more of this. I wish I had this three years ago. I wish, I don't know if that's your experience as well. Um, when was the last time you did an anomaly detection challenge? Like, or, you know, when you were in school, or when you were coming yes. up, yeah? It's, it's, been, it's been a long time. I've, I've matured in my career, so it's been a long time since I coded the Pythons and all of that. But it's always a pleasure getting back to the basics. Yeah. And the idea of the, the Safaricom uh, committees, communities is to avail such organizations, such events, uh, to bring in those who call themselves techies and, and um, the guys who like black screens to actually go back to the basics. Instead of focusing too much on corporate, how much money are we making, uh, how are we impacting our customers, just understanding. But did you, have, did you have access to something similar to this uh, when you were coming up, for example? Unfortunately not. When even my studies had to, I had to delay a bit of it because, yes, data field was, was very new when I was uh, coming up. Um, so I wish I had more opportunities uh, to get into hackathons, particularly on data. Um, many of those are in software engineering, software development. So our view from a Safaricom uh, community especially in the data science or data field, is to avail more avenues and more summits and more um, events where we can get our engineers and our data scientists to explore more in, into the world of data and to sharpen each other. The, the Absolutely. And I hope we do more of these, of course. I can't wait for next year. I hope bigger, better, stronger, all the other things. Um, I'll ask, first of all, what, is, what makes, for example, a good data scientist? You know, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, there's a couple of things that will set you apart from everyone else in the room, especially as interest in the field grows. Yeah. Um, uh, we've heard that there's a lack of talent, but I think that gap is going to be squashed very, very soon. So how do you set yourself up apart in an industry like this one? The, the interesting part of, of the data science field and the data field is that you're not quite IT um, and you're not quite a, a business individual. You sit somewhere, somewhere in, the in the middle. Yeah. So for you to, we find that there are guys with the technical know-how, uh, those we can train, those we can teach. But to set yourself apart is to be able to balance between the two. So do you have, do you understand the business context? Yes, the business context, because it's like a scientist. Um, if you're in the lab just looking at samples of, of things without knowing what exactly it is you're looking for, yeah. Um, yeah, it will be a lot of shooting in the dark. But if you do have a sense of the end goal and you have the technical knowledge of how to get there, then you allow the data uh, to guide your way. All right, um, I'll ask something that's a bit not off-brand, but still a good question. Do, in your personal opinion, do you think that better, data is better analyzed on the cloud or on traditional IT infrastructure? Um, again, it depends. <laughs> or from where you sit. <laughs> where I sit, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you could go to the cloud. The cloud is, has a benefit of availing resources at the drop of a hat. Um, but that comes with a cost. Um, while you can pay one cost for a laptop, and get the work done. Yeah. So it depends on the volume and the use case you're working on. So for we in Safaricom, uh, it doesn't quite make sense doing everything on one machine because you're now working in the big data space. Then the cloud avails the infrastructure to manage and to um, support your working um, needs. Yeah. But if you're a startup, you're at home, you're a student, uh, your data sets are much smaller, Yes, your laptop is sufficient to get most of the work done. Then as you mature and you have some source of income, you can get into the cloud environment where, yes, there's a cost implement to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think environmentalists have this uh, view. You know, we don't even see problems until they arrive. And we moved on. We're like, oh, everything is in the cloud. Everything is in the cloud. But then there's a server somewhere. And now that's an environmental issue. Yeah. I don't know how you think. How do we innovate our way out of this, for lack of a better <laughs> way to put it? There was a brilliant uh, presentation, the OCP. Um, even 
hardware and, and data centers are, are getting greener. Uh, we know in Safaricom uh, we do have greener uh, data centers, or at least that is um, our vision and our strategy. Even our masts are getting greener and uh, employing the, the uh, solar energy, um, and that's where we should get to. Uh, computing power will always be needed, and I know all tech giants are, are committed to moving away from fossil fuels um, and invest more in, in reusable energies. Um, and yeah, it, it's something I, I push for, it's something I, I, I would love to see a lot more. And Safaricom does as well. It would yes, be quite indeed. very ironical, all the green and not green. being actually green. <laughs> yes. But I'm hoping that we innovate around that fast enough um, yeah. and, and we move quickly. I see Salo has joined us on stage back yes. again. How much time do we have left on the challenge, Salo? All right. The team needs it. The team needs it. All right. All right. The, the challenge continues. I'm going to yeah. launch the second Yes, yes, yes. It is. And there are two challenges that uh, are to be done today. So, Salo, I'll let you take it over from there. All right, cool. One more dance, one more challenge, and then I'll go on with the presentation. You'll have two challenges. I've got people on the floor. When you're done with your challenge, just go to my, uh, to my stand, tell them that you've got both solutions, and then we'll put you into, in, into the winners. So, for this one, for this track, okay? Guys, it's a Friday, right? So we have to get the party going, all right? For this one, I want your fist in the air. I want the fist in the air, and I want you to pump it, and pump it, and pump it, and pu hit me, my selector. I want those fists up in the air. Come, come. I want the fists in the air. Come. Here it comes. I think I, I tried to kill this guy. All right, cool. So, for the next challenge, um, is it up? Yes. This is our API challenge. Just scroll up a little bit. Let's show them what they need to build. All right. Uh, API challenge, uh, SAF SC Summit, GitHub. All right. Um, we expect you to, there's a JSON file there, which is a customer. The idea is we want to see how quickly you can build an API that represents a customer. All right. This is, this is bread and butter for people who want to build apps. If you can't build an API, you can't build an app, you can't persist data, all right? So look at the JSON file. Uh, it's got a structure inside. I want your API to be HTOS compliant, therefore it can save the data into some persistent store. Can be a database, might not be. What if it's running in memory? It's all up to you, but I want a working API, HTOS compliant, customer, create a customer, Update the customer, delete the customer, find a customer. Okay? If you've written an API, you know what I'm talking about. It's called a microservice. The challenge. Prize money. DJ, one more time. Did you guys get the URL for the second challenge? It's, it's an API, all right? This one, you don't have to even be on AWS. If you just build an API on your local machine, tell me what it, uh, that it, it follows the instructions. Price money. We're clear. So I'm going to talk to you about um, Digifarm next, all right? As you're coding, as uh, you're trying to find the anomaly, as you're trying to get the price money, I want us to talk about uh, Digifarm, which is a project that is very close to my heart because of the impact it has on the, life of, on the lives of Kenyans. And uh, I will be talking to you about uh, Digifarm from a developer's perspective. Uh, if you can put up my slides. OK, 
okay, I know. I've got you working on the anomaly detection. I've got you working on building an API. And I want to talk to you about Digifarm. I hope you can multitask somewhere in the middle of, of that. But the reason why I wanted to actually come and talk to you about Digifarm is because it's quite an inspirational project, and it's quite one of the latest projects that has come out of the very innovative uh, Safaricom team. And um, it actually will, will show you what is possible with a little bit of imagination. So I want you to stick around because we've been running a hackathon, and later on, some of the people uh, from Safaricom that have been participating in the hackathon will be coming on and showing you how easy it is to innovate with AWS. And solutions like this basically can come out of a hackathon. So um, th this uh, uh, um, Digifarm solution basically is a was a collaboration between, um, between AWS and Safaricom where it's a, um, it's a free uh, service to, to the farmer that allows them to basically uh, sell their produce directly to the buyer and uh, lower their, uh, their costs in terms of getting their produce to the market than uh, be able to focus to on, on, on what they're good at, which is farming. So uh, since uh, launch, the, the platform has, has grown by over 50%. And it, it continues to grow from strength to strength, uh, enabling uh, uh, farmers to basically get their produce to, to market with very little effort. So there, here are some numbers. And I hope we still, Njoki, do we still have water bottles? I hope we still have water bottles uh, because I want, to, I want to play some numbers games with you. In fact, if we don't have water bottles, I'll make sure that we get you one. So, 70% of all arable land in the world is on our continent. All right? That puts us in a very good place because it means we can still do farming. If we up the GDP of Africa uh, by 1%, it reduces the poverty in our continent by 1%. And agriculture can help us to achieve that. In Kenya, the, the farming sector contributes 30% directly and a further 23% indirectly to the GDP. That's more than half of the GDP of this country directly from farming, all right? And 1% uh, of growth on the agriculture, agriculture side almost gets us to 2% growth on the GDP. So there's an exponential, exponential link between the GDP and, uh, and, the, uh, and the farming sector. Now, um, I've got some more data there on 80% of, of the farmers in, in your country being small holdings, which means uh, you know, small farmers, and um, they basically making around one US dollar a day. That's roughly 30 US dollars a month. What impact do you think it would have if we doubled their productivity? It would improve their quality of life. Now, with that said, I want to see who knows their numbers. How many, what is the population of Kenya? What is the population of your country? Roughly. Yes? Can I get a roaming mic for, mic for him? But I think you won a prize already. Did you not win a prize? No. Uh, I think I gave you a t-shirt earlier in the week. <laughs> Check. Okay. Check. Let's get you a roaming mic. Check one. So what is the population of Kenya? Uh, approximately 50 million. Two? 50 million. Oh yeah, roughly. But I you are out no by a couple though. of millions. Maybe 50... What, somebody called a number out here? Well, the last, the last numbers published were between 53 and 56, all right? Now, when you're thinking about a solution like Digifarm, which actually has such a high impact on, 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 on this population, and you're looking at, at Safaricom with, with the cust customer base that it has, it gives you a, a, a platform to in innovate on. And you must solve problems in a way that it impacts the life of your own people. 
those problems are the ones you'll understand the most. And you'll see in the hackathon uh, results later that what we push our hackers to do is to actually think about problems in an African context. All right. When you do that, then you own the problem because it's hard to duplicate an African problem in another part of the world. Do I make sense? So in the same way that Digifarm is solving a, a Kenyan problem. So the vision is to basically level, leverage technology uh, for smallholder farmers, make them more productive, resulting in more uh, uh, sustained food security for Kenya. All right. Uh, so uh, the gentleman who answered me, just remind me to give you a price at my desk when I'm done. So food security is, 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 the, is the main goal of, of, of the platform. Now, the objective was to solve a, 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 and, and build a marketplace where farmers and, uh, and, and their buyers could meet, all right? Then the collaboration was between ourselves as AWS and, uh, and, and Safaricom to build this solution, all right? Using developers just like yourself, and the AWS platform. And the outcome was that we ended up building Digifarm as a cloud native platform running on AWS services in a very short amount of time at a very uh, uh, low cost. And uh, we use serverless. Now, for a water bottle or for a t-shirt, can somebody tell me, what do I mean when I say serverless first? We, we build Digifarm in a serverless first way. What do I, what do I mean by that? Let's give him a mic. Can I have a ro roaming mic for the gentleman here that's about to win himself a t-shirt, hopefully? <laughs> okay, I've got another hand on that side. Where are my microphones? Okay, we're gonna get you a microphone. So, my question is serverless first. Why does it make sense for you as a developer when you're thinking of, of building an application, when you're thinking of building a solution, even the anomaly detection challenge, the API that we gave you, why must you think serverless first? But what is serverless first? I think I can take that. Go ahead. Yeah, so okay. serverless means that you don't need, you don't think uh, you don't need to think about infrastructure. Who's speaking? I'm here. Stand up. Okay, I, I can't see you. Just stand up so we can see you. I, I think uh, serverless means you don't need you don't think to you don't need to think about uh, the infrastructure that you need to provision so that your application can be running. So AWS caters for us. You have serverless uh, instances where you just need to configure the your computer. Exactly. Run on the fry. Yeah. Exactly. So you don't have to think about the infrastructure. You don't have to think about the servers. You don't think, have to think about the containers. All you do is focus on your solution, serverless first. That's, way, that's the way you should approach, approach application development, especially from, from a mobile point of view. Try to make it a Lambda function. If maybe you need a long running process, then come to containers. If you need uh, an EC2 instance because maybe you're writing some proprietary, then you come to, to, to servers and you create your VPCs. If you do serverless first, you're probably going to write a very cost efficient solution uh, as we did with Digifab. I hope it's clear. Uh, catch me when I get off stage. So the bottom line is that um, Digifab was, right, was written in a, in a serverless first approach. So during the, um, the process of uh, uh, designing a Digifarm, we had to get input from the farmers, we had to get input from the buyers, and understand what their pain points are, all right? And this is what they, they, bas they basically told us, that the main decision-making uh, factor in uh, which crops to, uh, to plant is perishability, because if you plant perishable uh, 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 um, vegetables, and you don't have a fridge, they will go to waste, right? So they think, which one is safer to, uh, uh, to, to plant? And um, who, uh, depending on the time of the year, you know, certain goods uh, are, are being required over others. That's how, how farmers uh, basically think. And price, 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 all right? The buyers will down negotiate them and try to get them at the lowest price possible. Uh, they start thinking about, about price 
before pl uh, not they don't think about pricing before planting they plant and only at harvest they start thinking how much can i sell this for whereas it would have been better to actually negotiate your price at planting time so that you can lock in your buyer and lock in your price and plant and harvest knowing that you have a locked in sale um, you know and uh, most buyers actually do not plan as well they just rock up at your farm and they want to give you the money that they have in their hand which actually puts the farmer at a disadvantage so this is the kind of thinking that we applied in, in building the solution in, in terms of understanding what the customer wants so also for yourself when you're building a solution really take the time it's very important take the time to interview your customer and understand what they need very critical so what are the benefits of uh, of of the digifarm uh, e-marketplace it's supply it gives farmers a, a platform where they can put their produces and where buyers can actually uh, connect with them without having the need for a middleman uh, consistency in supply so produces must be available irrespective of the time of the year as, as long as the, 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 there's a definitely a buyer who will buy your goods you should be able to plant for them even if the demand is not high as long as you've got the the purchase locked in uh, price uh, is, is is a big thing in a in a in an un, kind of a free market where people can uh, barter with you but if we can lock in our prices earlier and i can actually set my price and, and find the big uh, the highest bidder it is actually more beneficial to the to the farmer and also by removing um, the um, the supply chain costs it, it actually increases the margin for uh, for the farmers and obviously logistics and tracking there's no use in buying the, the produce if they never arrive at the customer therefore the customer should be able to track their, pro their order as it goes through the different parts uh, until it arrives at the destination so this is a three-step process that we took to build digifarm uh, we started with an envisioning all right a lot of people just start building their solution without doing an envisioning you must envision your uh, your solution think about it and then uh, after we we envisioned it we, we basically built a prototype with a prototyping team at aws after prototyping it then we went into a full build all right it's very critical that you do this even in your own project all right think about it get somebody to to think with you build a prototype all right prove that you can you can do it don't go all in right build one screen of your app try it out see if it works give it to some people to play around with before you go building 15 other screens you understand and uh, then when you feel like you have a, a working product go all in and, uh, and and build it out this is how digifarm was built with aws with the digifarm uh, team now um, as i said serverless was 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 the name of the game um, microservices architecture that's why I've got you guys coding microservices for the challenge. Microservices are the lifeblood of technology right now. If you're building an application and you're not using microservices, you have to tell me what it is that you're using. All right. Um, whatever it is, it will require microservices. You will need some kind of persistence. So um, Digifarm has got uh, microservices as a critical uh, component. Um, we used infrastructure as code. We use the CDK framework. Uh, you can just uh, Google AWS CDK and you'll, uh, you'll see how it can make your life easier in terms of provisioning your environment. CI-CD pipelines for automating the, uh, the, the build and deployment. And uh, currently we've got uh, the next version of, of the marketplace uh, ready to, to go live and we're developing new features. So uh, there's a saying which says uh, an industry that feeds you is worth transforming. I say an industry that feeds you is worth innovating, is worth protecting, and it's worth building, all right? So as you're thinking about how you can uh, innovate for, uh, for fellow Kenyans, uh, take some cues from the Digifarm team. Hope you learned something, thank you. You know, those, we've combined three sessions in one, which is, uh, which, which is great. And not only is this use case available on the website, lots of other use cases and also reference architectures are available there. So make time to go and, um, and actually pull that information. So we've been told data is the new oil, but is it olive oil or is it snake oil? So I'd like you to help me welcome on stage Anthony Nyaga and Bildad Mwangi from the Big Data and CVM team with a demo that will help us figure out 
olive oil or snake oil in the big data conversation. Karibuni. Hi everyone, As my name is Anton Inyaga and it has been a long day. I was almost feeling like I'm getting decoded out there, but now we are here. So I'll let my colleague introduce himself, then we can carry on with the presentation. As you can see on, on, the, on the chart there, it is all about the machine learning engineering. But we, we have had some talks of about the machine learning at Safaricom but we want to talk about on what it takes to get a machine learning into production and what kind of infrastructure do we have in place and how do we scale it. So, we can introduce Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Bildad Mwangi. I don't know if you can hear me. Bildad Mwangi is my name. I work closely with Anthony. Uh, we are machine learning engineers. So, and uh, I think uh, we will engage more as we continue with our presentation. Uh, thank you. So we can go to the first slide, please. Yeah, we call it, there's a branch of machine learning. Machine learning is a hot new thing that is taking the world as a storm, yeah? And basically it's a new evolving field where we have the DevOps, but now we have the MLOps. How do we take a machine learning model and deploy it to production in a scalable manner especially at, at a Safaricom where we are serving 40 million plus customers, yeah? So, uh, so at Safaricom, machine learning is very critical in terms of our products, especially the personalized products, yeah? Whenever you dial the 444, or maybe at, in either of our channels, what happens from a catalog of, of like 100 plus products, we are able to determine a product that's individualized to every given customer, and how we do that is enabled by machine learning engineering part of it. So, and this all comes from our big data platform, where we have an on-prem cluster with, with tens and tens of machines, actually over 50 machines, that work together as a distributed compute engine that is able to deliver and crunch petabytes and petabytes of data using the current technologies like Hadoop. We normally use Hadoop. Anyone who knows Hadoop, I know we are all engineers, I can see some nodes here. We also use another distributed compute framework, which is basically called Spark or Apache Spark. And all this is open source, yeah? If we can go to the next slide very quickly, as I, I talk about the, the architecture and kind of applications that we have deployed. As you can see from the, from the down there, we also use another open source tool to put a machine learning, a machine learning application to production it takes a lot of work, not the traditional scheduling that you're used to, like the cron jobs. We use an open source tool called the Apache Airflow. Apache Airflow, as we'll see in the next slide, it is a scheduling application that you can deploy at a scale, not only for machine learning, but other use cases, yeah? So we also employ that. We also employ the CICD, all these practices that you have heard being talked about from the dev, dev world. We also employ the CICD into the machine learning production framework, and our languages of choice, especially we are dealing with high scalable and terabytes of data, we, we normally employ a lot of Python. So if you are a developer outside there and you, you want to get into machine learning world, Python, Scala, and Java will be very critical. We can go to the next final, and I believe the final slide before we jump into the demo. As you can see, this is the architecture of our machine learning big, big data platform or, that help us deliver customer-centric analytics at scale, yeah? At the end there, at the start there, we see it is a scheduling and orchestration. How do we schedule these applications to be always highly available for real-time batch scoring and data insights, yeah? So uh, below there, we have an engine called Ecosystem AI that we have currently deployed as a real-time engine for our recommender services so that can be able to personalize and individualize offers based on customer behavior that is specific to you as an individual. And remember, this is not a, like a specific use case. This is an in-house framework that you have developed as the machine learning engineering community in Safaricom to help us deliver different machine learning use cases at scale. 
below that I, I, I was spoken, there's a component for the data storage. We have an ETL framework. Most of us know about the Apache Spark. Then below that, the most important thing to deliver the business value, it is the alerting and monitoring to make sure it is aligned with the business KPIs. Yeah? And for that, we, know we employ Grafana. And this, all these are open source tools. Yeah? If you don't mind, I'm going to switch to a quick demo and show you the stack from the code now as my colleague will be closing in terms of explaining how we tie all this together in the business KPIs alignment. As you can see my screen there, I'm sure you have seen a lot of black screens today and I probably this will be la the last one for the day. This you can see the structure of how the a machine learning fra deployment framework look, looks like. If you have ever worked in machine learning or data science environment, there's a kind of a protocol that data scientists usually follow. How many know Jupyter Notebook? Data scientists work with an application called Jupyter Notebooks and build their models and experiment using that. But when it comes to hitting to the production, you can't deploy your application using the Jupyter Notebook, yeah? That's where the both of us comes in and another team behind the scenes working very hard to deliver these kind of frameworks that I are able to take those models and experimentation and deploy them at scale, yeah? This is a structure that is, that is open source and anyone can come and clone it from our GitHub and be able to go and deploy machine learning systems in production at scale. So maybe quickly, quickly, we, I can show you the, the different Airflow pipelines that we have. We normally start with the getting the customer feedback and aligning it with our internal data. Then we do some feature engineering here. Then we go and do the feature store. Feature store is, is, a, mach, is a new class of databases for the machine learning application, yeah? After we have done that, we, we come and build another ML pipeline for training and scheduling the, the, the machine learning models. And, and you can see end to end there, we start by pulling the data validation, which is very critical. Then final one, we build and push to production. The final thing you see here, as I was saying, this is very critical for monitoring and alerting and alignment or, and tracking of the business KPIs. This is where now we come and track all the products that we are serving to the customer in a 360 view and making sure they are aligned with the business KPIs. Yeah. You're done. Yeah, you can go. Okay. So uh, thank you, thank you, Anthony, for that presentation. I don't know if you could take me back to the slide. There's a slide that I want to talk about. So this is what happens behind the scenes, yeah? So, but uh, there has to be a reason why we are doing this. There has to, uh, another slide, go back. Yeah, I want to talk on this. So, before you even think of building any solution or solving any problem, so there has to be an origin for that. Like, the reason why we build solution is solve societal problems that have both business value and also has value for the customer. So in our case, it is to help our customers to present them with offers that are personalized. And these offers are personalized based on the machine learning uh, engine. So I'm going to talk about the model approach and uh, the optimization. So there are two components here. There's the recommendation engine and there's the optimization part. So uh, my colleague talked about the feature store. One of the inputs for our machine learning is the features. So this is an example of this, like the feature, uh, the data, the customer data. That is, for example, the voice, uh, the data, maybe the M-Pesa data, for example, the, the revenues, both data, voice, uh, from uh, our premium services, uh, uh, services, and any kind of revenue data that might be helpful. There also the loyalty data that is historical, uh, like Tunukiwa data, all that is in the feature store and it helps in terms of uh, the predictions. To drive this personalization, a propensity model is used. So what is a propensity model? A propensity model is just a basic application of mathematical modeling to try and predict the probability that a customer will take an action. And in our case, the action is taking up an offer or buying an offer. So we are trying to present our customers with offers that are convenient for them, that is uh, cheaper for them, affordable, yeah? 
So the other bit is the opti optimization uh, component, and uh, there is price calculation. So these recommendations, we have to make sure that they are profitable. And for us to do that, I'm going to take us back to class Kidogo. I know some of us uh, did some uh, commercial arithmetic back in school. You remember that sum you are doing profit is equals to buying price, there's some buying price, there's some selling price there. So in our case, there, ha there is one of the features that we use, it's called the cop cards. The cop cards basically contains information about the customer spend at a given uh, specific time. For example, a customer spend at an, uh, the average spend of a customer in an hour or in a day or in a given just any time. So the profit calculation, uh, we, I give, I'm going to give you two scenarios here. The first scenario, we, we have to, the goal is to uh, present the customers with offers that are not diluting our revenue. By, by not diluting our, our revenue, this is where the profit calculation comes, comes into play so that there's the, the business in whatever we are trying to, to push. So the first scenario, if I imagine this customer X uh, is presented with, a, with an offer that's costing like 100, and then, uh, there's another, and then the, the, you present them with, uh, with that offer, but the average spend for that customer is like 150. So the profit calculation for that will be 100 minus 150. So in that case, the uh, revenue is diluting because we are getting negative 50. But uh, the next scenario, imagine there's another customer, customer Y, who is presented with an offer, but there is something else. This customer, within that hour, he normally probably or she normally uh, tops up. Like, he won't or she won't purchase just once. In an hour, he or she will purchase like twice. So there is an element of frequency. So we'll do a frequency multiplied by the, uh, the cost and then minus the cop car and then uh, you get the profit. Then there's customer segmentation. Uh, customer segmentation, uh, the customers basically are segmented into two uh, groups. The first one is high-valued customers and uh, low-valued customers. And then uh, using the recency, uh, frequency, and also monetary model. Basically, as the word suggests, recency, how recent uh, the customers are generating or transacting. Uh, frequency, how frequent, and also the monetary in terms of the amount. Then there is uh, the offer ranking. So in our model, so the offers are ranked according to some criteria. So based on the group one, so there's some criteria that we, we apply to do that. And uh, I won't talk more on the business part. I will uh, uh, let my colleague to, uh, talk about the business part and see how does this impact uh, the business, what we are trying to do. Uh, I leave it at there. Thank you. And the API uh, challenge in the in, in the Git um, repo, there was an email, dockyard at I think safaricom.co.ke, send your repos to that email. The judges will judge. We will look at what you've done. They'll judge, and uh, if you're lucky or if you are very good at what you do, you shall receive uh, your rewards uh, later today. Uh, but thank you for your time. Thank you guys for those who are into machine learning. I hope we've picked some, some um, pointers. I'll welcome the here. Sana, thank you Tony and Bildad. I already see a direct application of this stuff in public transport. So lazima, lazima tuongei, you know, profit maximization, route optimization, competitorial optimization, those things we need to talk. So now, you may be feeling a bit patched, but we have just one more presentation. There was a group from the, when we were doing the, the engineering culture demonstrations that didn't, that didn't make it on stage. And I'd like to welcome for that final presentation for today before we go into prizes. Dennis Wambua from the Enterprise Solutions team looking at Safaricom Cloud and Data Analytics. Dennis Wambua, stage Yako. Uh, 
hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, like you've heard, I'm Dennis Ombua. Don't worry, we are the last presentation, so we are going to make it uh, short and sweet. Uh, my name is Dennis Ombua, uh, Product Manager, Cloud Computing and uh, Digital Capabilities. Um, so I felt it important to just mention uh, the journey that uh, Safaricom has had as far as cloud computing is concerned, and also uh, mention our strategy moving forward. Um, so our journey started back in uh, 2011, uh, where you know, we built our first data center. And this particular data center was meant to serve enterprise clientele, and we leveraged uh, VMware to set it up. And, and so it was just one active site, one availability zone. And uh, moving on, uh, in 2019, uh, we did an upgrade of that particular environment. And uh, we are also introducing one more availability zone in, uh, at a place called Kiboswa in, in Kisumu. So what this means is that uh, with two availability zones, there will be more use cases. For example, we are now able to offer uh, disaster recovery as a service, uh, which we feel is actually a need in this market, and uh, more so for um, organizations or clientele um, who uh, you know, are mandated to have their data stored locally. Uh, still in 2019, we... Um, also rolled out another environment. Uh, someone had mentioned we have an environment on OpenStack. We rolled out this environment with, uh, with Huawei, and also we partnered with AWS. And, and so that means is that we are AWS partners. We're able to resell AWS solutions. Uh, moving forward, uh, in 2020, we got our first customer on the OpenStack environment and this was uh, Empire Systems. Now, what does the future look like? Um, in our own, uh, what we call the Safaricom Enterprise Cloud, or the cloud built from the ground up by Safaricom, there are still features that exist in the hyperscalers, like AWS and uh, you know, Microsoft Azure, that we've not yet implemented. So what we're saying is that moving forward, we'll have disaster recovery as a service, on a PayGo model, and also we will have uh, self-service automation. Uh, what this means essentially for engineering uh, professionals is that you'll be able now from our own local cloud, you'll be able to provision a compute instance, add your storage, uh, configure your VPC, and you're up and running right from our uh, Safaricom cloud. Um, so this means we are living up to the challenge. We are not only letting foreign entities uh, thrive in this arena, following closely, but still we're in partnership with them. And that brings me to our multi-cloud strategy. Um, so from this screen, you can see we have the Safaricom Enterprise Cloud that runs on both VMware and Huawei, but still we've got AWS and Microsoft Azure. Um, so it might look like we are really competing, but there's actually uh, a, a, you know, a value proposition for each of these environments. And from a strategic standpoint, uh, from a strategic st standpoint, this is, sorry, this is how we envision these relationships will work. Um, so uh, both AWS, Azure, and the enterprise cloud uh, lead with product, right? Uh, but uh, moving up the, you know, the horizontal axis, sorry, the vertical axis, we'll have Safaricom uh, as a tech player providing consulting services. And, and what this means is we'll help clientele navigate the increasingly complex cloud industry. I mean, cloud was supposed to be simple, but with so many vendors and uh, the fast-paced uh, change in terms of technology, um, we feel that businesses will require uh, you know, certified professionals to work with them, the journey to migrating to the cloud. Um, so this is predominantly where Safaricom is going to be playing, even when working with AWS and, uh, and Microsoft Azure. Uh, I think at this point, I would want to welcome my colleagues 
who also have a demo uh, you know from a capability standpoint they would like to demo the capabilities we have on the cloud around data analytics over to you thanks dennis i'm happy to be before you today my name is martin joseph a solutions architect at safaricom so what comes in your mind when you hear about data analytics it's a buzzword depending on the organization that you are in you are able to know that data analytics entails a process of analyzing raw data so that you can form formidable patterns that can serve us actionable insight in the sense that we can predict how our customers are interacting with our platforms, how our customers behave under different scenarios when they interact with our digital platforms. So today we are happy to present to you a purpose-built platform on top of AWS so that you can appreciate the power of analytics being built on top of AWS Cloud and some of the offerings that AWS provide under the books. Welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie. So um, even when we started, um, you've seen a lot of our solutions are being deployed on AWS. Uh, please share my screen. Maybe just bring up. So yeah, um, from the morning, we've seen a lot of uh, the resources and services that um, most of Safaricom staff are using are being deployed in AWS. We saw George in the morning launch an instance. We saw the DevSecOps team um, launching something as well. Mm -hmm. So there are so many people who are launching things on the cloud, and we have to be able to manage the cost. So I'm going to take you through a demo on cost optimization, uh, where we've used AWS um, QuickSight to be able to um, build a dashboard that gives insights to the different teams on the usage of AWS and the different services. Um, I'm going to start with the billing summary. As you can see from my screen, we have um, a previous month by the disclaimer, this is not actual figures. This is not what we spend on AWS. This is just <laughs> um, generated data. So we can see the previous month what we used, the invoice spent, and we can see the decrease from May to June. And the, we, can, we have also integrated ML to a time series forecast using our previous uh, data on our cost to predict for the next month. So you can see the invoice spent forecast, which is going to uh, predict what we are likely going to pay to AWS for the usage that we've had. Um, down here, I'm going to show you as well. Um, we have a, a chart here that just shows us what we've used for the past one year till June 2020. but. Um, the rest of this chart is a forecast for the next one year. So we can predict by next year, December, uh, by next year, January 2023, we'll have used uh, around 246K USD uh, based on the data that we have here. Uh, also analytics, we're using analytics to do a summary of the cost. Allow me to take you through. So you can see the top usage spend, the top spending account, the top service that is being used, uh, you can see is AWS Shield, the most popular region. Um, these services are being deployed in various regions, so you can be able to see which region is the most popular one where resources are being deployed. You have the number of regions, the number of services, um, the decrease average daily run rate decreased by 1.16 in June 22, means that um, the number of services that were deployed the previous month have decreased. We have the top cost movers, um, which is Elasticsearch, RDS, and Kinesis. We also have um, drill down of the top services, as we saw was AWS Shield, the top spending accounts. So we are using analytics to just be able to get insights on uh, the usage spent on the different AWS accounts. Um, to the last one, 
So I'm going to show you the last dashboard and I'm going to focus on cost optimization because a lot of us um, are provision mm -hmm. services that we actually do not use and we have to be able to detect these services that are not being used that are idle or underutilized. So we have also a dashboard for that. Taking some time to load. Binary background. So as it loads, I'm going to focus on Okay, let me just load it again. So we have what we call trusted advisor on AWS that um, helps us see which resources are being over underutilized, which instances are idle, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know why it's not loading. So I'm going to show you the cost optimization tab. So we have different sh dashboards um, focusing on different things, but I've just shown you things that are relevant. So we can see here, maybe for the month of February, there's this Amazon RDS idle DB instance, which cost around 3,000K. So that was idle. We also see some idle load balancers that were provisioned. We also see low utilization in the EC2 instances, uh, some EBS volumes that were underutilized and underutilized Redshift clusters. So when you come and look at a dashboard like this, you're able to have an overview of how the different um, services are being utilized. So things that are underutilized, you can talk to the different um, project owners and be able to cut down on cost. Thank you. Uh, now, if you, if you allow me, I, there's a customer testimonial I would like to run. Um, you know, because of time, we had to skip it, but I think it's important that uh, we get to see it. You know, this, this one is for Alan, eh? Alan, uh... Oh, okay. Um, so this is a success story where we did a migration for AR to AWS, and, and it speaks to our capabilities around consulting. And customers expect it. Gone because of advances in technology are the long and tedious procedures and paperwork it used to take to get services. For AAR insurance customers, they can now see everything from an app on their mobile phones. Everything they need now is at their fingertips because it is all in the cloud. Now to have all the functions, all the services of the company accessed using the mobile. And we want to offer service under an hour. The journey to becoming a fully digital company began three years ago. Sometimes back two, three years ago, we met and discussed and agreed that we need to make uh, available uh, a lot of information online to our members and to our staff to work remotely uh, from home. It accelerated over the past year because of the pandemic and the data center neared the end of its life. So we needed to refresh and we were very clear that there is a chance you might refresh that hardware today and in a few years you need to do another refresh. Everyone was starting to see that the world has changed you need to move to an environment that is agile, gives you what you want, you can decide how much to spend at any point. After intensive research and presentations to the board, the company decided to work with Amazon Web Services with support from Safaricom PLC. The reason why we went for cloud is that uh, cloud uh, infrastructure is very highly reliable and it's very robust 
and it, support, it supports a rapid deployment of technology. There are many tools there that you tap into and that is where Safaricom comes in because uh, you need an expert who knows what is available in those platforms that have expansive resources to be able to make the best decision within a short time. The AAR and Safaricom team took nine months to integrate and migrate 20 AAR applications into Amazon Web Service. The migration took place in three phases, assess, mobilize and modernize and migrate. At the assess phase, the Safaricom team understood the business applications and how they can optimize them. Once you have done an evaluation of the, on, on, of the customer's um, compute infrastructure or the IT infrastructure, so it gives you recommendations. If the same application is to be hosted on AWS Cloud, it can be hosted on an optimized environment, maybe even less um, from a capacity perspective, maybe lower. So you can imagine bottom line, what it means to the business, yeah, even from a cost perspective. So that is within the assess phase. The second phase is mobilize, where data is analyzed to determine the total ownership cost and plan how and which applications will migrate fast depending on the vendors. If air insurance migrates their applications to cloud, then potentially they're going to save maybe 39% of their cost within a period of five years. The third phase is to migrate and modernize. With a team of 10 from AAR and Safaricom, they delivered the project on time and within budget. The AAR migration to AWS is the first of a kind in the country, and the whole process was done remotely. It's actually uh, a unique uh, setup or a unique implementation whereby the entire team was working virtually. So with the cloud technology, all that was possible and the entire project was managed virtually for the entirety of the six to eight months in which we did it. So everyone is at home, but they were logging in online, following the script that had been prepared for us by Safaricom, executing one after the other. So you would see people posting, saying success, five minutes to go, be patient, and it was quite interesting. AAR is fully operating on the Amazon Web Services. AR insurance kind of uh, opens us towards this, for us to be known as one of the partners in Kenya and in the region who can successfully uh, conduct and run and guide a customer in their migration project as far as AWS is concerned. AAR is now a digital insurance company and look forward to coming up with more AI solutions. You'll be able to see new products most people know us for medical, but we also have a, a line that we are growing still around the person for home insurance, professional indemnity. Those are new products that are going to come in supported by this technology. So we want to move the services of the company to the mobile up to 100%. Okay, of course, now we are doing around 60% of the service accessible on the mobile and incrementally we want to reach at 100% by end of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much for your audience. Uh, you know, we know you've had a long day. Um, so that's the end of our pre presentation. Uh, God bless. Fantastic, fantastic. I think that cost of optimization insight would, is, is, would work for anyone, right? It's a skill that you need to have. I have struggled with the same problem. You've seen some of those figures. You've seen, you, you've seen the monthly... That one can't even go on a, on a, on a personal credit card. If you're a founder, I'm on the AWS, so you're on the three tiers. Unaumia kidogo kigonga hundred dollars you've seen. Uh, where if you can manage the sense, then at scale it becomes very, uh, it, it becomes very impactful to the bottom line. Sasa, to memorize the presentations, no one else is coming to give you a demo, and I think that was fantastic. It was one of the best for last. So congrats to that team again. I just have a question. I have, I have a lonely thousand shilling 
airtime voucher here. So, so this team, there was, there was something they did in 2029. At 2029, I'm from the future. Nikuchoka. In 2019, they introduced a new instance somewhere in Kenya in a new region. I need, I need the specific, very specific. Stakia team say me, it's two words. Where was that new region? And I need someone to help me pick. I don't want to look. I don't know who will help me pick. Those hands came up many, and the light is bright. Someone help me pick. Ah, excellent. What was what was the region? Say that again. Fantastic, correct. People are paying attention. Here's your airtime. And now it is time for us to award the winners, Sante. It's time for us to award the winners, and I'd like to call Marco Yer, the HOD IT Infrastructure and Shared Applications, to announce the winners for the Mozilla Hackathon and the AWS IoT Hackathon. Mark, join me on stage, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, good. You're good. All right, I have a... Let, let me hold this for Maybe I could get someone to... And the winner is... Okay. We're going to look so, I think we've had a good day. Today has been uh, quite packed. Uh, we have a lot of young people. Uh, there are some people coding behind there, and there's a reason why because of the gift. <laughs> so. We had two categories. The first category is the Mozilla Challenge. And there are quite some gifts here to give alone. So Mozilla Coding Challenge. The second runners-up is going to get themselves 20,000 Kenya shillings. Uh, I'd like to call upon uh, Alice to come and uh, give uh, their words. Alice, could you kindly join me on stage? Where's Alice? Yeah. <laughs> There's only one Alice from Mozilla. <laughs> All right. So, uh, now that we have Alice here, uh, moving on to the award winners. Uh, is there some dramatic music for the winners? The, the second runners up. Come on, guys. We need some music. The second runners up is uh, Ruth and Ruta. Hey. This is this is one figure. So this is the winner. Yes. All right. Thank you, Ruth. Congratulations. 
Uh, we are going to the first runners-up. The first runners-up is uh, Team Decode, MJ Cherono. Team Decode, MJ Cherono. And I didn't say what this, the first runners-up gets as a prize. The first runners-up gets 30,000 Kenya shillings. Okay, uh, now for the winner of the Mozilla Code Challenge. The winner of the Mozilla Code Challenge gets 50,000 Kenya shillings. <laughs> That's some quite a, You're so generous, Alice. So, the winner is... I have a funny name, eh? <laughs> Team Panda. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, so... I think all the, all, the, all the three winners would come on stage for the photo. So the total, the total contribution from Mozilla is 100,000 for all the winners. Let all the teams come to me. So remember Mozilla has other, other challenges ongoing, so feel free to visit their, visit their booth and also participate even post this particular event. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you Mozilla. Thank you. All right. No, let, let me have this. Thank you. All right. So we go on to the next awards. I know before these awards, there's some cocktails behind here, so I know some guys are quite jittery, yeah? So we are moving on to the AWS IoT challenge. Yeah? So for the AWS IoT challenge, the second runners-up also gets themselves 20,000 Kenya shillings. Now the second runners up for the AWS IoT challenge is Stima Mpesa. They're right behind you. Cello, kindly come on stage. So, I'm going to call on stage Felix Mene. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to call on stage Felix Mene. Actually, I'm told Sima Mpesa, my apologies. You're not the second runners up. <laughs> but stay on stage. Stay on stage. Stay on stage. Don't stay on stage. go away. The second runners up is actually Kinga. Take this. <laughs> Kinga. Where is Kinga?
and I'm joined on stage by AWS representative, so... Kinga. 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 Ah, yeah. <laughs> what's the Ozito on that one? It may not be visible. All right. Ah, what's the... Come, come. It's Kenya shillings, 100,000. Only. So the price has actually been upgraded. It's 100,000 Kenya shillings. Woo! Congratulations, guys. Congrats. All right. Uh, stay on stage. Yeah. So the second runners up is Matri Piri. You only two guys. Where are the ladies? You in this team? Good stuff. So the see? ladies will hold the check. <laughs> okay. The ladies will hold the check. 150,000 only from AWS. Congratulations. 150k, not bad. Congratulations, Matri Piri. And stay on stage, please. Stay on stage. And uh, Matri Piri, is it Piri? Oh, guys, come. Just stay on stage, please. I'd like to invite uh, Duncan Kabira on stage. Uh, we have Felix Mene from Technology. Where's Duncan Kabira? Thank you, Duncan. So uh, I kind of spilled the beans there. <laughs> <laughs> so Duncan Kabira and Felix, together with AWS, are going to help me present the winner of the AWS ALT Challenge, Stima Mpesa. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. And the amount on that is, can you see? 200,000 shillings for the winners. So this team wins themselves 200,000 Kenya shillings. All right, so we can have one group come. We can have one group one AWS winners photo challenge the, the winners. photo. Congratulations to the three teams. What, what's the total? What's the total on stage now? That's 200k plus two 150s. Yeah, hold your checks. You can give your money. Yeah, so I can hear Selo telling them it's not coming by Mpesa, it's by check. <laughs> All right. So kindly clap to all the winners. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for helping us with that session. All right, back to you, India. At least you've seen. Then DJ, DJ, just give me a, a short interlude. Let's get something sorted. Short music interlude. Oh, I need to consult. Yeah.
We're now proceeding to close, to close out what has been a fantastic two days, and I'd like to call on stage uh, George Njogona. George, kindly joining on stage. George, Director, Information Technology at Safaricom, and Juliana Rotich, HOD FinTech Integration Solutions. Kindly join me on stage. I think I, I'm, I'm not direct. I, I lead the IT community. That's what I said. Ah, lead leader of the IT community. community. Fantastic. IT okay. Community. Digital IT community. Hi, Juliana. How are you doing? Juliana, thank you for flying back just for this. Oh, my pleasure. I couldn't miss it. We before. always start things together. I know. And we finish together. Yes, we do. So I was here in spirit, and it was amazing um, just following online. and. Yeah. So Rooney, I don't know, uh, there's a guy on, uh, on Twitter called Rooney. Yeah. He was like, Yo, you're tweeting about this and you ain't here. Yeah, so I don't know if he's here. Now they it's... get to see you. You know, uh, somebody wrote to me on, on LinkedIn, Alvin. Alvin's like, George, I need a pass. I've already booked my train from Mombasa. And luckily I spoke to Edna and Naisenya, and Alvin is here. Oh, wow. I got to meet Alvin today. Alvin. It's, where's Alvin? Give him a Alvin big from Mombasa. Applause. There he is. Just stand up. <laughs> yeah. I think this is about making a difference. And thank you so much, Alvin. You know, so many people don't speak out. And I get probably hundreds of messages on LinkedIn every day. Most of them are people looking for business. But when I hear a story like that, I think that's what we talk about making dreams possible so thank you so much have a seat let's clap for him so juliana you had an announcement to make yes and you're one of our sponsors with sitoyo <laughs> so yes. i think before i do that i'll let you do your big announcement so um as you saw earlier today um um, one of our um, uh, product owners, Eric Nyaga for Daraja, uh, did a really great uh, overview of the APIs and um, he did a, a really great job of sharing what it is we've been working with. So what I wanted to share with you today is that we continue to center uh, developers in how we are looking at growing our business. Um, so the feedback that you gave us during the fintech innovation summit how many of you here were work tuned in for fintech innovation week okay i think there are lots of conversations happening for the people in the room could could we please have your attention for just a few minutes as we close together hello okay all right how many of you were there for fintech innovation week please put up your hand amazing um so uh, it was a very important week for us. I think uh, we got a lot of feedback from the industry, and we also got a lot of feedback uh, from the developers about developer experience. So we are continuing to center developers as part of our business and to improve um, your developer experience. So some of the things may not be apparent right now. However, if you, if you have used the USSD um, API. Um, previously, it used to take about four days, where you used to have a lot of ping pong emails between yourself and uh, someone from API support. If you've used it lately, it is now immediate because of the uh, automation work that was done by uh, Eric and the Daraja team. So um, the announcement here is that um, as we continue to engage with you and to, to work with you directly, we now have a dedicated Telegram channel uh, where you can have, uh, we can have um, uh, bilateral conversations so that you're not having to wait too long to get an answer. And this, the idea around it is for you to be able to support each other, to get support from our team, but also to get support from others in the community. We do know that there are communities out there that um, have been helping out with this, um, and we, we would really like to uh, bring all of us together uh, in one place where we can fully support uh, the developer community. So you can use um, that uh, QR code, join in, and uh, let's build together. Thank you very much, and over to you, George. Good. 
I, I don't know. Um, I'm looking for Naisanya. Do we still have some prizes or we've run out of everything? I want to give out some. We have. I have two questions and uh, if, if I, the first answer I get correct, I'll, I'll make sure I give a prize and I'll probably up it myself now that I have Team M-Pesa with me yeah. and uh, push a few billions a day. So I have a quick question. How many M-Pesa transactions do you think we do per day? Jeez, I'm seeing so many hands up. What do I do? The first hand I saw up was somewhere on the left, not from someone at Safaricom. If you're in Safaricom, don't. Okay. I uh, work. Huh? Per day. I can't hear you. A million. No. You want to answer? Come over here. I saw his hand next. A million. I think we do a million in I don't know how many minutes. Uh, if I had to guess, using the, 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 what, the presentation in the morning, it's close to a billion. Transaction? Not, oh. not a billion, but a hundred million, sorry. A hundred million, okay. Not yet there. I won't say whether you're up or beyond, but next answer. I saw some hands on this side. The gentleman in a hat. Uh, I think it's 50 million. 50 million. All right. Do I take any more answers? I see. I'll take three more, then I'll give whoever's one, two, three, a gentleman in a red uh, hoodie, and then a lady in the back with a jacket, and the gentleman with a shirt, just striped shirt. Around 20 million. 20 million. Okay. Next one. Last three answers, then I'll award. 60 million. Okay, one more. Uh, uh, more than 60 million. <laughs> All right, the winner is a gentleman who said 60 million. We do 60 million transactions on M-Pesa a day. My other question, how many transactions do we do on SMS a day? SMS? Okay, get the hands up. Okay. <laughs> 60 million. 60. Mark you for every Mpesa transaction we do it. Okay. Let me not talk. I'm going to give away the answer. Mm -hmm. It's not 60. Okay. I'll take four more answers. I see the left of the room. I uh, will take here. Who has the mic? We'll do the middle guys and then take three more. A lady in a black uh, sweater and here and then there. Okay. 120 million. 120? Getting, uh, I wouldn't say if it's right. Let me take the answers, then I'll talk. Yes? Him? 200 million. 200 million. Lady over here, and one more lady, then we'll go there. 180 million. 120, okay. You guys, 180? 80. 80. 80. 80, okay. You? 500 million. 500 million? Okay. Kipruto, are you the one standing next to some? I can't accept such an answer. If you're standing next to my team, okay. Last answer? Uh, a billion. A billion, okay. We do 180 million SMSs. So a lady right here has won. Uh, Edna, please get our gift. I think this just shows as much as we're doing all this work in terms of the engineering community and development, uh, the IT community in Safaricom actually runs the most transactions in the region. We run more transactions on M-Pesa than PayPal. PayPal is global, we are local. And then when we put M-Pesa Africa on it, we do a lot more. So you can be very proud to be part of a community that is dead, making a dent not just in Kenya, but globally. Please give them a clap. As we're starting, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Juliana. So um, just a thought, um, as you all know, um, the motivation and the intent around Safaricom is about transforming lives. 
And um, one of the ways that I'm sure some of you saw Florence Mugure and Mweni uh, presenting about mini apps. Um, it's a very big opportunity for you as developers to join us as part of the, developer, uh, the, the development of these mini apps. There are lots of companies out there that are looking for developers who can create mini apps for them. And we've put all of the information on uh, Daraja. So if you go to developer um, at safari, safaricom.co.ke, you not only find information about Daraja APIs, but you also find information about mini app development. Um, it's a very um, great opportunity for you and how it turns into, um, how it feeds into transforming people's lives is that you will have the opportunity to add to your income stream uh, if you can create mini apps for these businesses. So these are some of the ways that we're continuing to provide opportunity for you and for your craft, um, even as we work on um, upskilling and more events um, geared towards developers. Um, and I'll just illustrate a very quick point around why do we do mini apps? So um, I was in Lamu and um, I was talking to this, um, he, he's a Maasai guy who was selling curios. And so I asked him, you know, how does he transact? And he showed me that he was uh, transacting using SDK. So I asked him which apps does he have? And he showed me the apps that he had, but he didn't have the M-Pesa app or the Safaricom app. So I showed him how to download both of them. And then I showed him what the mini apps were. And then when I showed him the book flight mini app, he said, Juliana, thank you for showing me because the last time I was at the airport and I asked for the flight schedules, the lady there was very derogatory and sort of sent him off and didn't give him any information about the flight options. And so now he's able to book flights for himself uh, and his family. And that dignity where, you know, we continue to give dignity to people, even as we, our, as you all know our history, where we made it easier for people to send money to rural areas. So even for the people who have smartphones now, we continue to find ways to transform their lives and give them capacity to do more. And the way we do that is through mini apps and the additional functionality also that's being added to um, my Safaricom app. So I hope you'll join us um, to, to look at ways that you can create capacity for all of our customers. I think we're almost up to 5 million now um, and growing, and we'd like to grow that to over 6 million. So quickly, I don't know if we have a prize for, um, is uh, if uh, to check if anyone ha everybody has the M-Pesa and the My Safari come up. One more, more prize. Is there anyone here who does not have the M-Pesa app? <laughs> How many of you have the M-Pesa app on your phone? Ooh. The gentleman in the front don't have the M-Pesa app. We're okay. hearing Michael doesn't have the M-Pesa app. Do you have it yeah. or you don't? Uh, so we'll do a randomized gift to... Um, how do we do the randomized gift to someone who... To the group that raised their hands? We, uh, we have developers here. Yes. So somebody can just do some random code thing. Kamochu. Kamochu. Help us pick someone randomly. From, from the people who... Uh, do they all have a... Um, they registered with what? An email? Okay. So Kamochu and Naisenya will do it. Yeah. And we'll, get, we'll give a gift. All right. We'll give a gift to uh, at least... The Juliana Rotich it'll be, gift. It, it'll be a surprise to all of you who have the M-Pesa app. So if you do not have the M-Pesa app, please download it. Um, yeah. So let's finish this. Well, I'm told we still have a gift to give. And because Sitoyo and Peter are not here, Juliana, we are giving the AWS winning teams who have won 100,000, and Naisenya will mention, is it teams or names? Yes. Names, wow. Uh, and the winner is taking home 50K. I wouldn't mind having 50K in my pocket right now. So Naisenya, go ahead and mention the names. Can we have Wilson Karuma Karumania Murungi? Wilson? Patrick Karanja. 
Edwin Cherotic. Edwin Cherotic. Edwin, 50,000 bob it up with Edwin, 50,000 Good. I will request the ladies, Naisenia and Juliana, to give them their prize. It's not golf. We'll look for Edwin. Come on, golf in Gaenda. So let's, Juliana and Naisenia. Cameraman. Well done, well done. Really good job. Congratulations. Yeah. So we'll, uh, you have their details? Yeah. Good, good. Uh, good job. Congratulations. So I think as we close this, um, my reflections, and I'll probably have Juliana reflect as well. I think the most memorable uh, engagements that we've had, and uh, Naisanya, I'll still need you to come help me recognize the team and the sponsors i'd probably just get a mic from the back uh, but it's really been the interactions with the developers sure. i've had a lot of people come in today and say george this is wow but i think what has really touched them has been the developers and i think we had alvin and the safaricom communities here and really i just want to thank all of you for finding time uh, to be here and really making this a difference i think in normal day to day Many of us don't interact with you. Uh, Alice here and Michael, we're probably stuck in board meetings and calls and running from here to there. But it's been great to create two days where we could just come and hear from you. And Alice from Mozilla, who was the first sponsor to come on board, I have to appreciate her. Let's clap for Mozilla team. Uh, Alice has committed to be a sponsor at the next event and to also sponsor a hackathon in November and I think it <laughs> and we're just it's the first one we were doing and we didn't know what to expect but I think we were able to tell your story and put a spotlight I think we were trending on Twitter we had Citizen TV here and the other stations they're going to be covering us tonight and this week but we put a spotlight on the software engineering community not just in Safaricom, but in Kenya. And many times when you, when you reflect and you hear what people think about Kenya, uh, I've had so many people, and, and Alice has shared this, we've had teams from South Africa here, from China, from India, and they said, and you heard from the CEO of Huawei, he said this is the best event that he's ever attended. And he said, this is where he wants to be at. These are the type of things. And from all our sponsors and all the senior leaders who came here, you are able to capture our attention, our minds, and most importantly, our hearts and our aspirations. And so thank you so much. You are the true winners of this event. You've made it a success. Please give yourselves a clap. So I know there's a lot of questions as to when we will have the next one. And I will not answer it yet. Yeah. Uh, but I did want to invite on the stage uh, the Digital IT Spirit team uh, that helped to put this event together. Uh, I think, Naisanya, I won't mention the names, but you know them. You can... Uh, I would love to invite Ruben Kihiu, Ayan Kainan, Edna Muihaki, Jude Juma, Joshua Nguku, to come on stage. And from the branding team, Angeline Gunjiri, Susan Mudoka, and Dennis Mbubi. Let's give this team a clap. Ruben and Ayan introduced me to so many new communities. I was a fan of Ruben before he joined Safaricom. And when I saw he joined, I told Naisenya, we need this guy on this didn't i tell you yeah you did i'm the one who pointed you out so just know I'm, i have an eye for talent and you guys have been fantastic liz please join your Jude your Juma family liz. here uh, liz is our digital engineering uh community lead <laughs> liz welcome where's jude 
Jude and Joshua? Probably they're both working uh, somewhere here. And then I, I do have most of the members of the uh, IT leadership team. Please come on stage. I see you are intermingling together. Stop looking at me. If you, if you know that you, you sit on that table, please come on stage. Uh, it's good for the team to know the people who run the country. Janet <laughs> Wafuboa. I can promise you we won't be at home during elections. We'll be making sure that everything is working well. You can communicate, watch. So welcome. Lillian, I also see you here from our service management team, part of the technology leadership. Lillian, welcome on stage. Spread out. So I think this team has worked tirelessly to build communities uh, to make this work. Mitch, I hear guys are saying, where is Mitch? She needs to be here. So this is the team from Safaricom that has worked tirelessly. They came up with Decode. They came up with the sponsors. Please give them a clap. They were tweeting. Excellent. Um, there's one person who is appreciating everyone, but I'd like for us to now appreciate George, my BFF. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you, thank you. For um, being always such a, uh, an ambassador for not only Safaricom, but the possibilities around technology. One of the things that, um, actually, uh, th this is a private conversation, but I don't mind sharing it, is a, a few months ago, he was like, Juliana, you need to be a lot more, you know, you need to be talking a lot more, because I used to do a lot of public speaking, but wasn't doing it as much anymore. And I said, ah, you know, I'm keeping it low. And he's like, no, 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 no. There's a lot of work to be done. So thank you so much for your leadership and inspiration. And could you please give him a big round of applause? Thank you. Oh, Juliana, you, you... No, that conversation came from Juliana shared a picture of her and French President Macron. And I said, Juliana, congratulations, but we need you in Kenya. And, and true enough, since that conversation in, was it in November or December, Naisenia? In November 2021, we've had a lot of Juliana in Kenya. <laughs> and I can tell you, we need more of that. So thank you so much for being with well, Let's give a clap to Juliana yeah. as well. Now, I think we've had a lot of people who've also put together the, 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 the sound, the, the effects, and all that. Maybe I'll just have you, Naisenia, mention the names of the companies uh, that have worked with Angeline on, on putting this together. Where's Angeline? Oh, Ange Angeline can mention them, yeah. All right, special appreciation um, to Stage Pass team, Aigabantu, Sarakasi dancers, uh, True Black, um, our events agency, um, our catering from Tamarind, our security team. Anyone else have forgotten? Thank you. We really appreciate the support in putting this together. And Ujala, of course, from South Africa. Thank you. I forgot to appreciate our MC, Mbogwa. Please come on stage. I feel like we're... <laughs> One day I'll tell the story of how I wanted to be a lawyer, then Bogwa's relative helped me to enter IT, uh, also called Bogwa, uh, but uh, fantastic. Hasn't he been great? I've had the online audience. Kuna MC unaezaleta hapa, ata hajui kod ni nini, but Bogwa is one of us, and uh, thank you so much. And there's, uh, there's, there's Mariam as well, she's been handling the online. Yes, yes, where is she? Online so. So just Mariam Mariam. was the one interviewing people and she, she did introduce me and I, I, to, you know, I got to meet her and she, come here, the lady who made things fantastic online, come on stage. I know some of you said you are not going to come for the event and you saw Mariam and you all wanted to meet her. Um, let me not talk anymore because this is online. <laughs> yeah, but... Yeah. I think we've forgotten the most important person, Ooh. Njoki, who made sure that we had the money for this event. Oh, Njoki. Njoki <laughs> from our... From Safaricom. From our partnership team. Thank you for getting us our sponsors. Don't wave from there. You've been called on stage. And Njoki, you know, we also go way back. 
like Mbogo, so. <laughs> but if I didn't mention you, allow me to say uh, that we do appreciate the devs who are here, the devs who are online, and all the speakers who joined us. You've done an amazing job. And I won't keep this team on stage anymore. But it just goes to underpin what Dr. Ndemo says. I could have decided to probably try and do this myself. I promise you it wouldn't have been a success. But I think when you put a team together and you allow people to operate in their gifting, in their calling, in their passion, they do amazing things. And I had minimal, minimal impact on this event other than to cheer them on and they did a fantastic job. So wherever you are, just resonate with the words of Dr. Bitange that you don't need to sit in your hole or your house or your corner of your campus alone. Whatever you can do alone can always be done better together. So let's build a great community. Thank you so much. Give them a clap as I release them off stage and hand over back to Mbogwa. Thank you. After that short speech, I don't think there's anything more to add. It's been a fantastic two days. It's the first of um, many, clearly, the sponsors have committed. It's been the first of many um, events that we hope will continue, not only growing the community that was launched, but also putting front and center the, the community that is software engineers. I think. In the past, the past two days, you've actually been able to see a lot of what goes on behind the scenes. So for those who are not technically inclined, there's a better appreciation. And even for those who are technically inclined, you've seen that, how do you kill a kitu? You know, sometimes there's a, there's a sense that you feel you know everything. Maybe now you'll reconsider calling yourself full stack. You know, choose a line, stick to it, refine it, and become a ninja at it. Imam, we are full stack to watch it. We need teams. We need people to come together to build stuff. And... I think the biggest thing I can take from today is humility. Humility that you do not know anything. And that, that journey to knowledge is more around community. So for those who might have missed my name, I'm Bogwan Jehia, Bogwan Jehia on Twitter, Bogwan Jehia on LinkedIn. And together with my co-host, Mariam, who's gone back outside to close out with the digital team and the teams from the back, I say a big thank you. And these guys opened the show for us and they'll close it for us. So. Once again, very thankful for your audience, the Saracasi dancers.
demos, from presentations with everyone in the tech industry that you need to be talking to. I've had an amazing time. I hope you feel the same. You've been an amazing, super engaged audience. And like I said, I've got airtime for you. So my passport challenge was really simple. I want to see who's been paying attention. If you collected all three passport stamps that I gave throughout the day, tag me on Twitter at Mariam Bishar. M-A-R-I-A-M-B-I-S-H-A-R and tag the Safaricom PLC page. Tell me the three passport stamps that I gave to you and I will have 500 bob worth of airtime before I close the show. Just before we go though, I have Brian who is the country director for TDG in Kenya for the last fireside chat. We're going to end on a high note, right Brian? Yes, <laughs> you're a maverick so we have to end on a high note. I will begin with an icebreaker because I don't like to dive in, you know, cold starts are hard. <laughs> so I will ask you a few questions um, about yourself just to get me to, so I can get to know you a little bit better. If you had to create a slogan for your life, Brian's life, what would be your slogan? My slogan is nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Do you truly believe that? Or is that like uh, something you put on a fridge magnet? Yes. Oh, it's not on. It's not on. We'll just change his battery real quick. I'm really sorry, but we'll change your battery really quick. But in the meantime, just another reminder, guys. Passport stamp, I've got airtime for you. So just let me know the three stamps that I gave out through the day. If you've been paying attention, easy peasy, no problem. If you lost your way, it's okay. There'll still be other opportunities at other forums for you to win some airtime, maybe a goodie bag. So remember to tag Safaricom PLC, only the verified page, Tafadali, and my Twitter page as well, which is Mariam Bishar. Again, M-A-R-I-A-M. B-I-S-H-A-R. Let me know the three stamps and before I close out the show for the day, I will give you some airtime. We'll go back to Brian now. I think it should be all good now. Am yes. I, am I audible? You're like? Am I audible? Yes, I think you're audible now. He's good? All right. Okay. Yes, you're audible now. Where were we? <laughs> um, we were talking about how everything is possible. Yes, so my mission statement, yeah. if I were to have a motto or, yeah, mission statement. Mm -hmm is the Bible verse John 14 verse 12 where it says you will be able to do even greater things than I did when I was on the earth yes ask anything in my name and I shall do it and that is what I live by okay I like it simple what is your last thing you binge watched binge I binge watched suits Suits, okay. Yes. yes. Recently or a while ago? No, recently. Okay. I must admit, I've, I, I'm, I watched it for the fourth time. Yes. And I binged it. <laughs> okay. I have shows that I do that with as well. <laughs> because I see myself in some of the characters. Okay. Especially the, the Harvey, Harvey Specter. Specter. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, and Mike Ross. Yeah. Mike Ross for his tenacity and his ability to go above and beyond what people expect him. Mm -hmm. Harvey Specter because nothing is impossible for him. Yeah, and he's also very witty. Both of them are. Of I, see, I see where you're going with this. I'll get a bit into um, what TDG does, uh, but before that, I w just want to know what your presence in Kenya looks like and what you do as t at TDG. So, for the purpose of the interview, mm -hmm. I'm Group Corporate Affairs Director or Marketing Exec. Mm -hmm. I'm not so much a title, I'm not so much of a titles person. Yes. I, my title is actually, I get the job done. Mm -hmm. So, and like I said, for the purpose of this interview, they refer to me as the Group Corporate Affairs um, Exec as well as BDM. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm responsible for Technodyne Group across the whole of Africa. Um, on the eastern side, Kenya being our main presence and hub, because Kenya is, of course, um, the, the hub of East Africa's economy, as well as... Um, ECOS, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, COMESA, my apologies. Um, COMESA, yes. Yes, my yes. apologies, COMESA, yeah. ECOS is West. Yes, COMESA. And we are in the business of 
for the layman on the street, we are in the business of improving efficiencies within organizations, within companies, within uh, government departments, corporates, across the board, because uh, in this day and age, data is the new oil. Yeah. And we miners of that oil. And we do it in real time, back-end integration, which is what we do. Um, we, in fact, are enablers, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Uh, our presence is on the growth, especially because we are very much in a... It's a the, the relationship is not a um, B2C mm -hmm. with Safaricom. Yeah. It's more of a partnership. Yeah. Because... More B2B-ish. B2B, yeah. yeah. Because uh, this whole idea of client and service provider in this century and day and age it's outdated mm -hmm. because there's no shared vision in order for that ecosystem of client and service provider to flourish mm -hmm. for both sides yeah you have to have shared vision as we do with safaricom mm -hmm. it's a case of when our when you say you have a sh let me interrupt you a bit when you say you have a shared vision what does that mean what's your shared vision at safaricom the shared vision obviously of safaricom is yeah. look beyond mm -hmm. uh, how do you say it in swahili uh, Twende. To Kyuke. To Kyuke. Yes. Exactly. Yes. See, um, and, and, and true to it, it's about harnessing what Safaricom is mm -hmm. in order for us to be part of the family and know when our family member needs, um, how can I put it, uh, misses their blind spots mm -hmm. and we fill that gap yeah. and improve the efficiency. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great answer. I've had an amazing time at the summit. I hope you have as well. I hope you're back for the next one if we have another one, which we will, you know, inshallah, God willing. Well, to mm -hmm. to round off in conclusion, yes. Uh, it is my aim and I've been mandated mm -hmm. that every month yes. that I come to Kenya to build the relationship we have with Safaricom and other companies across East Africa. Yes. But our harness and our how can I put it? Our CV mm -hmm. is, of course, Safaricom. Yes. And I just want to express my sincere, sincere gratitude mm -hmm. to the entire Safaricom team from George and Juguna, yes. uh, Duncan, Kennedy, the, all of them. They, they are more than clients to us. They're actually like brothers. Yeah. Because we, we believe in the Safaricom dream. Yeah. Look beyond. Absolutely. Um, a shared vision or nothing at all. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for making time for us and for making time for the summit of, of, of course, coming through all the way from thank South you, Africa. Can't wait to see you around Nairobi a bit more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Okay, it's now time to announce winners. Finally, the giveaways you guys have been waiting for before we can call it a day. For my passport stamp winner, I've gotten so many replies so quickly. And again, I appreciate you. You've been an amazing, engaged audience. But the person who got it fast goes by um, Rimwaka P on Twitter. And you say, Nikola Tesla, the Wright brothers, and Joseph Fourier. And you hashtag Safaricom at Decode. Absolutely right. Um, Rimwaka. 500 bob worth of airtime is yours. Just send the DM to the Safaricom PLC page, only the verified one. Send them a DM and we will send you your airtime. Earlier, I had a trivia as well, and we have winners for that. So please, I hope you're around to listen to your name, Victor Kyoko and Venice Mr. Van Ice. That's a very cool handle. Venice Mr. Van Ice and Victor Kyoko. You are our trivia winners from earlier as well. So DM Safaricom page Tafadali, not another one, and you will get your cash money. There's always another opportunity. Safaricom hosts so many forums, so you know, keep it here, keep it Safaricom on all platforms. So next time, it's you going away with that airtime. Thank you so much for engaging with us. It's been a, a wonderful two days of panel discussions, live demos, networking, with, even with a virtual audience. You've been engaged, you've been wonderful. I could not have asked for better people to do this with. Enjoy your weekend, and it's goodbye from us at the Safaricom. Safaricom Engineering Summit. Have a good night.